Test. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I heard two people. Good morning, everyone. Hi. All right. If you have a friend outside who's joining us, you should tell them to come inside. We'd love to have them here inside. We're going to get started in about two to three minutes. I just wanted to say hello. Please tell your lovely friends to come on in. I told them to their face, and they're still drinking coffee. Uh, but we'll get started in two minutes, and we are live streaming this on our uh, National Cannabis Festival YouTube page if anyone's not here and would like to join in. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll be back in two minutes.
All right, folks, um, if you'd like to come on in and take your seats, we're gonna get started here in just a few minutes. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Caroline Phillips, and I'm the founder and executive producer of the National Cannabis Festival and Policy Summit. I'd like to welcome you to the 2024 National Cannabis Policy Summit here at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. I'd like to start this morning with some thank yous. First, of course, to the library for hosting us. I can say that we've been waiting a long time to get into this space, and it feels good to be here. I'd also like to thank Molly Heinzler, who is the coordinator for the summit this year. She has done an incredible job getting all of our speakers taken care of and making sure all of you have the information you need to be here today. I'd like to thank the UFCW's Cannabis Workers Union for making this morning's reception possible. We really appreciate the support, and it's heartening to see labor unions starting to come into the cannabis space to take care of our workers. And, you know, I'd like to also share a couple of special thank yous today. This year's summit is a little bit different from others. For those of you who have joined us in the past before, we've had a tradition of bringing in journalists to moderate our panel discussions because we want to make sure that news about cannabis is getting out far and wide. This year we pivoted a little bit, and we decided that we wanted to have the advocates lead the conversation. So I'd like to give a very special thank you today to the member organizations of the 420 Unity Coalition who are here this week in Washington, D.C., pressing the administration and Congress to deschedule cannabis once and for all. Without the work of these important organizations, and particularly Jason Ortiz, Maritza Perez Medina, Mike Lazuski, Morgan Fox, Amber Center, and Kat Packer, we would not be here today. These are the folks on the front lines fighting for freedom and justice for all Americans. I'd also like to thank an advocate who's not here with us today, but I sure wish he was, Justin Streckel of the Bull Pack. Many of you know that name, and if you've been on Capitol Hill at all in the past five years, you've probably run into Justin. He's done incredible work to support all of our organizations, and we look forward to hopefully seeing him at NCF this weekend. You know, when I heard that we were going to be here at the Martin Luther King Library today, I was struck by the power of having a man of faith who believed so much in justice and believed so much in the rights of all human beings, in a way hosting us today. And our next speaker is another man of faith and another man of justice, Reverend Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock. And so as I was preparing today, I wanted to read a bit back over Dr. King's words, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about Senator Warnock. And I found a little passage that Senator Warnock said not so long ago about Dr. King that seemed especially important to share with all of you today. Reverend Warnock said, Martin Luther King Jr. said to all of us that we need leaders who are not in love with money, but in love with justice not in love with publicity, but in love with humanity. Leaders who can subject their own ego to the pressing issues of the cause of freedom. The United States Senate, the United States Congress could benefit from hearing that message right now. 
centering the people rather than the politicians. The phrase that stands out to me is centering the people and not the politicians. And that's why we're here today, to discuss the human impact of cannabis policy. And as you'll hear today, there is much work left to do, but at the same time, much progress to celebrate. This week, DC is not just home to the National Cannabis Festival and our policy summit. It's also the convening ground for hundreds, maybe thousands, of advocates who are here to demand an end to the unjust war on drugs. It is the spirit of these advocates that have driven this movement forward. The fight for freedom, the fight for justice, and the fight to protect the voiceless and the vulnerable. This week, and at this time in our country and in the world, I feel very grateful for the work of our cannabis policy justice fighters. I'm proud of their boldness, I'm proud of their leadership, and I'm proud of their persistence in pushing the needle forward. As we gather here today surrounded by the collective power of our convening, I find myself thinking of advocates and freedom fighters and human rights defenders in other parts of the world who are struggling right now. Those who are risking their lives to defend the vulnerable without adequate support. Those who have lost their lives defending what is right and those who have no safe harbor to which they can escape. I'd like you to join me in a moment of silence to hold space for these freedom fighters, for the human rights defenders, and for the lives that have been lost. It is my sincere wish that all people can live in a world like the one Dr. King described and Reverend Warnock spoke of, a world with leaders in love with humanity who are willing to subject their own ego to the pressing causes of freedom. And today I feel hopeful that that day will come. I feel hopeful because of the advocates in this room. Before I close, I'd like to mention that we have a few more activities taking place here at the library today. Students for Sensible Drug Policy and Freedom Grow are hosting an expungement resources fair. You can get information in the foyer and they'll take you to where the fair is taking place in this building. The Last Prisoner Project will be hosting a lobbying training at 4 p.m. The Cannabis Regulators of Color are hosting our reception directly after the summit today at 6 p.m. And we also invite you to come back to this room around 6.30 for the Equity Trade Network's documentary, Not Your Token. So there's a lot happening here at the library today. We're so glad to have all of you here. And now, without further ado, I will introduce our opening video, which is from Senator Raphael Warnock. Hello and welcome to the National Cannabis Policy Summit. Every year, this diverse group of activists and leaders from business, healthcare, and civil rights organizations comes together to discuss the most pressing cannabis policy challenges and opportunities. The work many of you have done to break down stigmas and address barbaric criminal penalties while building a diverse culture within the cannabis community cannot be overstated. Addressing the consequences of those who have been impacted by cannabis criminalization is extremely important to my work as a United States Senator. And it is why I have led efforts to truly understand the economic and the human costs of the war on drugs. While there is still a lot more work to be done, we should be proud of the progress made and renew our efforts in this fight. I hope this optimism and commitment to restorative justice, to equity, is evident throughout your discussions today. And I look forward to seeing your continued success. Keep the faith and keep looking up.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. My name is Kat Murthy. I'm Executive Director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. We are the largest nationwide network of young people working to end the war on drugs. And yeah. <laughs> And this year, we're centering cannabis justice because um, we have some unique opportunities to really make change. Uh, we're right in the middle of our 420 week of unity. The, uh, so thank you so much to the National Cannabis Festival and all of the organizations, left, right, and industry that have joined together with us for, to create the largest bipartisan cannabis justice coalition in history to come to DC to demand three specific things this year. Descheduling marijuana, releasing all cannabis prisoners, and clearing cannabis related charges from our records. Yeah. This is our moment. Nine in 10 Americans, left, right, center, agree marijuana should be legalized. Tomorrow we've got a lobby day, we've got a vigil. We're putting together a number of different pal panels throughout the Nan National Cannabis Festival and overdose uh, awareness training. And today, right here on the fourth floor of the library, please come down, we have an expungement resource fair. We're trying to break the paper shackles of cannabis convictions. You may not know you have a charge and you may have something on your record that is holding you back. So please come down, check it out. We're going to have an expungement resource fair all day at the festival on Friday and Saturday because there's a lot of policy change to happen. And we're going to talk about this on the stage now today, but we also need to do the hard work of fixing the wrongs of prohibition. So. Please, I invite you to come down. Let's clear those records and um, yeah, let's let's make some change because, yeah. like, yeah, because, like I said, <laughs> the vast majority of Americans now support marijuana legalization, and if anything, they think that we're already there. The polling is there. This isn't where we were a couple years ago, but. Um, we've got two very capable people on stage today who uh, are polling experts. They're going to be able to talk to us a little bit about where we're at, how we talk to different demographics, and what we need to do to make sure that this is the year we end federal marijuana prohibition. Yeah. Hell yeah. So with that, to uh, my left, your right, I have uh, Daniel Gotoff. He's a partner at Lake Research Partners and he heads the firm's New York office and brings over two decades of experience in political research and consulting. Daniel? And to my right, your left, I have Courtney Collard. She is a research manager at, H at HIT Strategies and she spearheads the firm's electoral and climate research. And in, her, in her polling career, she's worked multiple political races across the country from the county executive level to the US presidency. Thank you, Courtney. So let's talk a little bit about where, where Americans are, because I think this is monumental. In the last few years, really, in the last 10 years, 20 years at most, but really 10 years, we've gone from, yes, people want marijuana legalization, but we're still trying to convince them of why it's important, to now 90% of the country says that they want marijuana legalization in some way. What, what are those numbers? How did this happen? Yeah, so I, uh, it's really impressive how much public opinion has changed so quickly over the last 30, 40 years in America when it comes to marijuana legalization. Um, Gallup, which is a national recognized polling organization, when they first started asking about uh, whether or not marijuana should be legal back in uh, 1960, 
1960s uh, or 1970s, it was it was just 12 percent of Americans who said that they thought that weed should be legal. Um, today, as you mentioned, it's a near you know monumental majority of Americans who say that weed should be legal. Um, and so a, a lot has happened, I think, through legalization at the state level, um, with actual you know Americans seeing um, weed become more legal in their communities, in their states. They are seeing what legal cannabis looks like, how safe it is, um, and the importance of it too uh, for people's lives. So I think that's done a lot um, to change opinion. Um, but we also see a lot of differences among different blocks of the electorate. And importantly, I'd point to uh, race and age. Um, and so I think probably unsurprisingly, young Americans are most favorable towards legalization of cannabis, both for medical and recreational use. Um, we see 71% um, in recent polling, 18 to 29 year olds, saying that they would favor both, uh, that they would favor uh, medical and recreational use uh, nationwide. Um, but when we look at older generations, that support dips closer to the 40s. Um, so there are some clear generational divides, but I think that something important to take away here is that over time, Gen Z millennials will continue making up war larger swaths of the American public of the electorate and we'll have a, a really big voice to say on this issue. Um, so I yeah. think that that's a really important point, right? Because the youth, young people are really disengaged from politics right now. We know that that's the case. And so cannabis could actually be the issue that gets young people to the polls, right? Both major parties really need those young people. And young people on the left and the right agree on this. This is the issue. Do you want to speak to that a little? Sure, yeah. Thank you, Kat. And I, the other thing I would add, I think, it just in terms of the context, is um, you know, uh, prohibition of marijuana or cannabis or drugs in general is not something that goes back to the beginning of uh, you know this country. This is something that happened in the last 50 years, um, and people, I think, uh, have just witnessed the devastation that it's created, uh, and that's been a big part of the call for change. In addition to all the points, Courtney, that you made. Um, yeah, so uh, young voters obviously have been very core to the Democratic coalition. Um, but as you noted, there's, uh, you know, to the extent uh, Republicans are more divided on issues of legalization or more supportive of uh, legalization for medical purposes, more so than recreational, there are real divides within the GOP, the, the GOP block. Um, younger voters in particular. So, yeah, and I, I would say, you know, disengaged, and even more so than disengaged younger voters, I think are really disaffected. Um, not to, you know, quibble over words, but, you know, these are, I think, um, young people who in some ways are very politically engaged, they very just don't active. They feel like voting is the way to make a change. They, well, they've been told to vote harder for election after election, and, um, you know, we have a hard time. Uh, we, <laughs> There's been, this is not what we're talking about here, but there have been plenty of studies uh, for some time now that show that we're not really a functioning democracy in that way. So they're looking for other ways to affect change. Um, and you know, one of those ways is that in where we've seen uh, increases in turnout is when uh, legalization or, uh, has been on the ballot. And in the states, you can see um, it has not been the case in every single one, but more often than not, an increase in youth turnout, youth voter turnout, when they have a chance to, to vote directly on these issues. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit, because I think part of the problem a lot of times is, uh, you know, we get promised that a certain candidate is going to do all of these big things, and then it doesn't necessarily happen, right? Um, so. It, is there a difference here with issue-based campaigns, campaigns specifically around marijuana legalization or decriminalization compared to, um, compared to candidate politics when it comes to this? Are people responding to one more than the other? 
Yeah, I think what is challenging still with the topic of marijuana legalization is that there are a lot of issues today that are preoccupying Americans' minds. Um, inflation is a very big issue for folks, public safety and crime. Um, and so they're weighing a lot of these different topics the same ways that campaigns weigh a lot of different topics. So I think that actually with the issue campaigns, they can do a very important job of centering that issue and making that their number one communication to help amplify policy that candidates might have and might not have the time to, to amplify every single stop uh, on, the, on their leg of the race. And let's talk about how they do that. Is there certain messaging that you find is really resonating and uh, does it resonate differently with, say, young voters versus older voters? Is there, is there one right message? Sure. I think what's what's great is we have a lot of opportunities in how to a message effectively on this issue. Um, one that I think spans generation, uh, spans demographic, is the idea that it helps put money back into people's communities by legalizing cannabis. And so that we see majorities of Americans saying that that is an important um, impact of legalization. Um, another is, of course, medical use. And I think that that's probably top of mind that people, I think, through both... It, mostly, I think, through experience, seeing people in their families, friends, community using cannabis for medical purposes are starting to see that this is not just a recreational drug. This is something that is, you know, very important to people's medical lives. And so I think that has helped a lot. And when we center that messaging, um, it, it helps quite a bit. Um, there's also opportunity in talking about uh, public safety and criminal justice reform. I think that Americans see that there is a clear correlation between legalization and creating a fair criminal justice system in America as well. So let's go back to, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the history mm -hmm. uh, of the polling numbers here, right? Yeah. And I think this is really interesting. Um, you know, when, when California first really started mm -hmm. pushing this off with the dispensaries and things like that, and people started seeing uh, imagery of aid pa AIDS patients, like mm -hmm. end-of-life AIDS patients getting arrested and pulled mm -hmm. out in these raids and things like that. I think that's what really changed the national conversation. Right. And then increasingly, as these laws have been passed, you know, people were saying like, oh, you know, you're going to see people smoking marijuana around you and then you're going to lose support for this. But right. what we've actually seen is the more we legalize, the more support there is for legalization, right? Correct. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and I think uh, Colorado obviously was a, a watershed, um, and you know, for all of these things, it's the the fear mongering is so much of the campaign against, uh, and as you said, there's, um, you know, people are experiencing it, or, you know, they're either visiting it, or they live in these states. I mean, at this point, as you said. It's, it's this not is, this terrifying, horrible it's, thing. It's not terrifying. And it's also not these like stoner jokes that you see in right. like, the 90s movies. Right, exactly. No, I mean, people's grandmas are using cannabis today. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean, you know, we, we did work in, in the, the Colorado campaign, um, you know, and I, I, so the landscape has shifted a lot, but it was important then for some groups of voters who were more on the fence about it. Um, to emphasize, as you said, the, the tax revenue and what that tax revenue can go towards, uh, education in particular for, you know, for moms of school-aged children who were worried about the consequences. So that was important to assuage them. Um, the messengers also, so having, you know, uh, not only law enforcement, but centering law enforcement voices because they do tend to be uh, deferred to a lot on these sorts of matters. Um, can also reassure voters. And then we've been looking at messaging around rescheduling or reclassifying. And um, what's been really strong there is um, emphasizing that, you know, this is the states are going to have different policies, but there ought to be national guardrails that you should not be able to be arrested from walking from one state to the next because of different laws and be locked up uh, for years. So let's talk a little bit about this messaging. Um, is there certain messaging that advocates should avoid because it falls flat? Is there certain messaging that maybe gets certain communities excited but turns off other communities? What, what are sort of some of the pitfalls that we should be looking at when it comes to messaging around this? I mean, 
mean, I think one of the biggest pitfalls is giving, uh, you know, a platform to the opposition's false claims. Um, and it's very rudimentary. It's very outdated claims about marijuana use. Um, and so really... It's going to make holes in your brain, whatever. Exactly. I think it's really important to stay focused on the messaging um, for legalization rather than having to constantly reply to the opposition because we already have, as you've mentioned, a very strong majority support for legalization in this country. And as Daniel said, I think a lot of people just need to better understand what does legalization look like for my community in reality? What are those benefits beyond just use, um, whether that's revenue, whether that's creating safer communities? So I think really emphasizing and staying focused on the benefits is important for messaging. Absolutely. I mean, I think the other potential pitfall, um, although I don't see it as a great one, but especially with regard to reclassifying or rescheduling is just well, two things. One, not everybody, even people who are aware of, of the schedule are not very clear on how it works. And it's easy to get people confused and tripped up on that. Um, it, which is an argument for just not doing the half step, right? Um, and then, uh, so kind of related to that, uh, although it, as soon so, as you well, tell can people- I Can I pause you on that sure, one? Because yeah. I, this is a big one, right? Because it's not that rescheduling to Schedule 3 doesn't have some benefits, but it doesn't have that many benefits. And it's certainly not legalization, which is what people see it as, right? <laughs> So what we're pushing for is full descheduling. What are you seeing in the polling for descheduling? Well, we, we have looked at either legalization or rescheduling. We haven't looked at full descheduling. That would be legalization. And that's the numbers that you said, which are really high and, uh, you know, in, in some ways even higher sometimes than you see. I mean, we haven't seen a lot of public polling, but we've done some internal work on rescheduling and uh, there's minimal opposition. I mean, there's like, you know, almost 60% support, less than 20% oppose, and you don't get more than a third of, of any subgroup in the data who oppose rescheduling. But it, it starts to get more complex for people, you know, as we've been talking about. So there's some people who kind of hang back until they learn more. Uh, nobody thinks that cannabis should be treated the same as heroin or fentanyl or a range of other drugs they see as more serious. So there are ways to, to kind of shortcut the conversation, but um, yeah, I mean, it is, it's a solid majority support, you know, as uh, Courtney said, there's uh, it really cuts across demographic and regional lines. Uh, and it cuts across party lines too. A lot of party right? lines, yeah. Uh, this is something that it's at the, the it's at the center of our 420 week of unity. It's that it's not a left issue, it's not a right issue, it's a freedom issue. And folks on both sides of the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, are advancing legislation. They're interested in this issue. Their supporters want it. Right? Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in the messages or the types of things that they're looking at or that motivates them? Is there a way that? You know, is there stuff that you're seeing in the polling about how we should be talking to these two audiences differently, or are they kind of all want the same thing? Um, I think when we're thinking about messaging towards conservative Americans who are the least likely to support legalization, um, though still, uh, I think, encouraging numbers of them say that they do support, um, I think leaning into the economic revenue is a very uh, easy way to meet them where they're already very focused. Um, and I think also... Um, in talking about um, safety too, making it very clear that legalization is actually helping regulate safe use. I, it helps get over some of that. That's the main talking point for the opposition, that it's just going to lead to widespread drug use in unsafer communities. Right. It's going to bring the cartels out when, of course, we know it's the opposite. Exactly. I think so. So pointing to that, I think, would be effective. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, would, I think that's right. And I would I think there's also a synergy across um, not just this issue, but um, abortion rights and mm -hmm. voting rights. Um, not all of those issues are going to animate the more, not necessarily the conservatives, but kind of the more libertarian folks on the right who I think are, you know, uh, very sanguine about uh, legalization. But, um, but there's a way, I think, to, to bracket some of these issues and talk about the uh, 
attack on freedoms and, and how we can remedy that. So I want to I wanna have time for people in the audience to ask questions. Uh, but first, I'm going to put you on the spot because you brought up something that I am personally very interested in. So um, in Ohio, we had Ohio Measure 2, and at the same time, we had Measure 1, right? And so what was interesting to me is to see this patchwork. So these are the uh, marijuana legalization and also um, abortion um, uh, measures that went to the ballot. And so it was really interesting to see the demographic breakdowns of who was voting for what, right? Mm -hmm. can, can, I, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and I, we did some work on the, the uh, abortion end of that. And, but there was, um, I mean, I think you saw in terms of the, the turnout uh, a real synergy in terms of um, younger voters, women, uh, um, who were coming out and voting yes on both or, or support of, of, of both. Um, one of the, the main um, spokespeople or messengers for the ab abortion rights measure uh, were doctors also. And I think that, you know, I, I don't know for a fact because, again, we are more focused on one than the other uh, and really happy to see the outcome of both. But um, I think having, um, you know, medical professionals being able to speak to this helped reassure some of these folks. I mean, that ties back to what you were saying, Courtney, with, uh, you know, people really focusing on that medical side of things in addition to the safety. Yeah, I will say that in a lot of the research that we do, we find that people trust two types of people often. It's the professionals, so doctors, um, they trust their word greatly. They also trust their community, too. And so hearing people that look like them who come from their community talk about this issue, why it's important, I think is also uh, a really great way for them to kind of better trust and understand legalization, too. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I have a lot of questions for our panelists, and I can keep doing this, but I want to give some space for folks in the audience. Does anyone have any questions that they want to ask here today? I see one right there. Yes. Uh, I think they are going to bring you a stick mic so that the folks watching back home can hear you as well. And please keep it to a question, not a speech. Thank you. Um, we were having a conversation this morning about this, and obviously descheduling is like the ultimate goal. And I kind of pushed back and said, well, can our government really make that big leap? Is it, you know, do they have to maybe take the baby steps into rescheduling? And I just wonder what your thoughts are on like, can we move them straight to descheduling? Do we see a need to go through this process? So. I want to give both my panelists a minute to speak on this, but I have some thoughts, so I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here. Um, so we just had a press conference this morning where we had sitting members of Congress calling in front of the cameras for descheduling. So I think there is some political momentum there, right? Uh, I think also if we move to reschedule to schedule three, it's not a step in, in towards descheduling. That's going to lock in a whole system that is then, that's the new system we're gonna have to push back against. I personally, I think we're gonna be looking at at least 10 years down the line before we're ever gonna be able to bring this up again. So uh, I'm not gonna say rescheduling doesn't have benefits. There are benefits, but it's not enough. Rescheduling is not legalization. We want descheduling. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> It, I think it really depends on whom you talk to. And I think certainly a lot of the people in the White House right now believe that the, the incremental approach is what they are locked into. Um, I don't know that that's universal opinion at all. Um, certainly not my own. Uh, but that seems like where we're going without sufficient pressure. Um, and that's what obviously it, we're here to pressure. Here We're to here to pressure. That. We're going to hit every single office in the House and the Senate tomorrow. So we're here to pressure. More, I guess more power. Support, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions from the audience here? Right there. Well, I'm sorry. Hold on for the stick mic because we want the folks listening to be able to hear you. I'm a veteran, and I go to the mayor's office of Veterans Affairs, and um, 
I was wondering if we might, if you guys would be kind of working with the mayor's office to create a mayor's office of cannabis culture. We're How's that sound? It, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Talk. We'll be in touch. Okay, wonderful. I see another question right back there, black shirt. It's you. You're looking around. I'm talking about you. <laughs> I can't read what it says from here. <laughs> it says cannabis connoisseur. <laughs> um, what's up, everybody? I'm Kai from New Georgia Project. Uh, we work on a civic level around mobilizing voters around topics such as cannabis reform. Coming from a state on the south side that's much behind you know, Washington and other more progressive states, what are some optimistic point of views you all can tell me that I can bring back to my constituents around how we can motivate folks, not even just to vote, but to you know, get other ways of civically engagement on the term of cannabis reform? Because you know we're not even legal. We have about 20 cities out of 500 plus that are just now getting decriminalized. What are some wins that we can motivate folks to get into that November election that we can try to promote uh, before the election? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, no, I, I think that Ohio is actually a great example of a state that is by no means red or blue, it is purple. That could have gone either way. We saw a really great turnout in favor of legalizing cannabis, and I think that that is a great way to apply to other states like Georgia that are those purple states. Um, I think also, um, just building on the community efforts that have been built out through the New Georgia Project and other organizations in Georgia, what you all are doing extremely well um, is building a community network in talking to each other, using real voters, real people as the messenger too. Um, and lastly, the thing that I would, I would say is important is, is talking with people about the progress that actually has been made. Mm -hmm. I think uh, voters, Americans get frustrated because a lot of provinces get made during campaigns. Um, I think it's very important for us to talk about um, President Biden's work to pardon nonviolent federal uh, cannabis convictions. That's a great way to really talk about work that's actually been done at the federal level rather than just talking about wanting to legalize or, or, or help those who have been unfairly convicted too. Yeah, so this is something that, uh, you know, we're we're very excited to see, for the first time, a White House actually doing this. On yeah. the other hand, if we want to talk about campaign promises, we're still not there. Biden went into sure. office saying that we were going to de uh, decriminalize marijuana, let everyone out of prison, zero out their records. Sure. We're not there. This is a step in the right direction. How do we make sure that the American public realizes that, you know, that we don't lose the momentum on this issue, that they know that marijuana is not legal yet, there's still more to do? I mean, I think it's in, in talking about that progress and not letting that fall to the wayside or just being a part of a State of a Union speech, continuing to talk about it and making it very clear to voters because I think what Daniel and I see often in polling these days is that voters don't really think that anything has changed since 2020 and that their lives have not been made better. And so we really need to do a this better job. This is an issue on which it really has gotten better. Exactly, yeah. and this is where we need to do a better job in making it clear to Americans the progress that has been made using that proof of progress as a means to electing uh, leaders like President Biden to continue the work. That this is hard work um, that we need to continue doing. Um, and you know, with the alternative, um, we could backslide on a lot of that progress too if we don't turn out to vote. Wow, that's, that's really inspirational, and I'm really glad we're running out of time here, but I want to ask both of you, yeah. yes, I was going to say, can you leave our folks with like your final thoughts on this? Sure, so um, and just kind of related to what we we're talking about now, I, I think it needs to be uh, both carrot and stick, and at this point, a lot more stick, frankly, mm -hmm. because those promises have not been fulfilled, and a lot of the things right. that have been done are not impacting nearly as many people right. as they should be. So not one single person right. got out from prison as a result of those pardons. So, right. you know, you, being a single issue voter, I feel like if you're, you know, tune in to uh, cable news is like a, a slander. Um, that's bullshit. There, every every person who is funding these campaigns or every corporation who is funding these campaigns are single issue voters. It's their taxes, it's their interests, whatever it is. Uh, and if they don't get what they want, they take their ball and go home. And we need to be more like that. And you know, if, if you're not gonna follow through, you're not gonna get our vote. Um, and this is the window for it. And 
we should remember also that you know, the, the public is ready for this. They're ready for more. There's a uh, mm -hmm. ACLU poll in 2021 that showed nearly two thirds, 65 percent of Americans wanted to end the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. We can be doing more. Yeah, Definitely. we got a lot more to do. Final yeah, my final thought is I think that this is an issue that we should never shy away from, um, especially when we are considering how do we reach those who feel most uh, far from Democrats, and that's young people, and it's also black Americans. And so it's really important, I think, for, for Democratic leaders government leaders overall to actually respond to and represent those um, who, who elect them and put them into office. And I think as Daniel said, unfortunately, if you do not represent, if you do not respond to the priorities of those electorates, um, they will turn out to vote and make decisions that might not put you into office. So it's very important for us to be listening um, and actually taking action on those issues that are most important to these groups that are, are now um, such important swaths of the emerging electorate. Thank you so much. Uh, Y'all heard it from Daniel, you heard it from Courtney. We've got, got a lot of work to do, but we have that support. It's up to us to make sure that we, that the American electorate understands marijuana is not legal. It's not getting legalized unless we push for it. I invite all of you tomorrow night, 7 p.m. in front of the White House. We're gonna have a vigil. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna make sure that President Biden remembers his promise and carries through on it. Tomorrow, we're going to hit every single office in Congress, and we're going to tell them, deschedule cannabis, release all cannabis prisoners, clear cannabis charges from the records. So come on, come join us. If you're here today, please come down to the fourth floor conference center. We've got an expungement resource fair. Come check out your records, see what's on there. Start the process of getting any charges cleared. You may have stuff on there you don't know about. Come find the SSDP booth at NCF will be doing that there on Friday and Saturday. And, you know, we, we are this movement, y'all. Let's, let's get out there and make some change.
can't believe you're staying overnight. That's like so, so not you. All right, well, barring someone telling me not to, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Sarah Gersten. I'm the executive director of The Last Prisoner Project. I am honored to be here with these incredible panelists today, and I will let them introduce themselves in a moment, but we're here today to talk about retroactive relief in the context of cannabis reform. What does that mean? Uh, well, as we have seen monumental progress across states in the legalization of cannabis and structuring regulated markets around cannabis, we also have an opportunity to prospectively eliminate criminal penalties for cannabis, cease arresting and incarcerating individuals for this activity that we are now legalizing and regulating. But that's not the end of the work. We need to also ensure that we're doing what is needed to get people out of prison who had previously gotten sentences prior to these changes in laws, and also ensuring that their records are cleared. And this is such an important topic. I'm so glad that the Policy Summit has, have, is having us here to discuss it because I want to remind folks that even if we see the full legalization of cannabis, even if at the federal and all the state levels, we see that removal of criminal penalties for cannabis moving forward, that doesn't automatically lead to that kind of retroactive relief. So this is a topic that I hope we can keep front of mind in this movement, and I've really been heartened, you know, being in D.C. this week with all these cannabis advocates, other organizations, that this is really an issue that I have found such broad bipartisan support for. And I think that's because there's a fundamental injustice in that we would change these laws but not do the work to provide that relief for those that have suffered in the past. So I'm really excited today to talk about exactly how we can achieve that. Um, and we've got an amazing group of panelists, so I will let them introduce themselves and I will start with my colleague, Dante West. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, my name is Dante West. I uh, was incarcerated for three years, eight months in the state of Kansas. Um, got sentenced to nearly eight years in prison. And, and now I work with the Last Prisoner Project to look for other people that are incarcerated on the state level. Um, super excited just to be with this organization. Um, and it's just an incredible opportunity just to find these different stories of people and they get out and they tell their stories and they inspire these legislators to make change. Uh, super thankful and excited to talk about what we're talking about today. And I'll pass it over to our good friend at NACDL, Liz. Hi, good morning. Hi, my name is Liz Budnitz and I'm an attorney with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, I'm the head of the Cannabis Justice Initiative and um, we file compassionate release motions and clemency petitions on behalf of people who are sentenced to marijuana crimes. I'll talk a little bit about that work later, but I'm so happy to be here and I'm happy to join this panel. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. It is an honor and a pleasure to share the space with you today. My name is Ronald Simpson Bay. I'm the executive vice president of an organization called Just Us, Just Leadership USA, I don't know my organization out of New York City. We are a national criminal justice reform organization committed to improving the conditions of people with lived experience. Uh, we have a leadership development program and we do policy work on a federal and a state level. Um, I served 27 years in the Michigan Department of Correction on a wrongful conviction from 1985 to 2012 when I was released uh, by the federal courts and I've come out to do this work and glad to be part of this panel. Thanks for inviting me.
So Liz, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about the Cannabis Justice Initiative and really kind of underscore what it's like if we took the approach of what we're kind of left with right now, at least at the federal level, of taking on these cases of people who are still incarcerated for cannabis individually via litigation or clemency, kind of what that looks like and the types of cases that you work on. Um, thanks for having me. So as I said, I'm um, counsel for a project called the Cannabis Justice Initiative, and it's a partnership between the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and LPP, our wonderful partners at LPP. So we file compassionate release motions and clemency petitions, and what does that mean? So. Once someone is sentenced and they're incarcerated, they can go back to the federal judge that sentenced them and ask that judge for compassion and mercy to let them out. So we file these motions trying to get these judges to have some kind of compassion and let our clients out and let our constituents out. Um, the other thing we do is we file clemency petitions before President Biden. And we're trying to get Biden to grant clemency to our constituents. We have 50, we have something like 50 petitions before President Biden that he could grant um, immediately tomorrow. So um, each of our clients is um, worthy of clemency, of course, but we would love for President Biden to grant um, a categorical clemency categorical clemency for all folks who are inside for marijuana convictions. Now, Biden has granted about 113 petitions, and Obama granted 1,800. So Biden has a lot of work to do. He has a lot of work to do both now and also hopefully after the election, and we are hoping that he will act and um, grant more clemency petitions. Um, so. Uh, I just wanted to talk about a couple of our clients. So, for example, we have clients who are inside for 10, 15, 24 years, and even a life sentence just for marijuana. Um, I'll give you an example. I, um, we have a constituent who is 63 years old. He's serving a 23-year sentence. He served 12 years. Because he's 63 years old, he has some health issues that have been exacerbated in, in prison, um, his daughter was diagnosed with cancer and is a cancer survivor, and he has children and grandchildren. Um, we filed a compassionate release motion before the court. The court denied that motion. It was the Southern District of Texas. We have a clemency petition for this individual, and it is before President Biden. And so we are really hoping that President Biden will pass that, will grant that petition. Um, I have, we have another constituent who has a 30-year sentence, and they've served 18 years. Over and over again, you can see these, these persons who are incarcerated for 5, 10, 15, 24 years in prison. Um, and so that's what we do. Um, and we can talk more about um, that in a minute. So, yeah. And I think it's so important not just to tell the stories of these excessive sentences, because I think often there's a misconception that if you're getting a sentence for cannabis, um, you know, completely victimless cannabis activity wouldn't be lengthy. But of course, because of things like habitual offender laws and mandatory minimums, um, all of the ways that our sentencing guidelines work to enhance sentences, that's not the case. And we have a number of individuals serving life sentences for cannabis. And to Liz's point, we don't have effective mechanisms for release just trying to do that via litigation. Uh, achieving compassionate release, achieving clemency is exceedingly difficult. Um, but we have two success stories here of individuals who are able to fight their own cases um, and achieve freedom, but that's, again, very, very difficult. Um, and that's why we really need to be working both at the state and federal level to find pieces of legislation that would enact systemic reform that would put the onus on the state to provide opportunities for release or reductions of sentences for those with cannabis offenses. Um, but again, Dante, you are one of these success stories of someone who had the courage to fight their case. Um, and I just think your story is so inspiring, so I won't spoil it, but I would love for you to talk a little bit about uh, how you were able to achieve your freedom. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, back in 2017, uh, like I mentioned before, I got sentenced to 
nearly eight years in prison for a pound of marijuana in the state of Kansas is traveling from California. And uh, ultimately, when I did, you know, kind of just coming in, never traveled outside of California before, and, and I won't say the story too long, but just seeing those troopers and seeing how officers kind of pick and choose on drivers, having out-of-state plays, being people of color, of course. And uh, meanwhile, like I said, man, I got put over having dirt on my license plate, right? Uh, road grind from traveling. Um, it was a crazy story, right? And uh, pulled over, clean, cleaned the license plates off. Um, ended up arriving at a friend's house and he ended up telling on me and said he was gonna buy a pound of marijuana from me. And his testimony alone convicted me. End up going to jury trial, right? Um, and, and, and it's something that we talked about at the press conference that is super important. When they did end up sending me to prison, you know, I had to choose a foster family, you know, for my eight, nine-year-old brother, which were very, very young, right? Um, but then eventually, just going and sitting down prison and, and, and keeping them in the back of my mind uh, really motivated me to kind of just really focus on my case, right? And I would see these lifers, uh, to your point, Sarah, just fighting to go home, right? And they had various charges, and I felt like if I applied that same energy um, with uh, people uh, like myself, I would have an opportunity to go home. I ended up losing um, in direct appeal, um, but eventually, you know, I wrote like 125 state representatives, you know, I wrote 40 senators on the state level, uh, four people actually even wrote me back, right? Coincidentally, um, two Republicans, two senators, which is really remarkable. One actually came and seen me in the middle of COVID. His name was State Rep Willie Dove out of Leavenworth. Um, and he couldn't believe that the laws he was passing uh, were having people serve a significant time for marijuana. Um, and, and just ultimately just having that focus of just reuniting with your family. We talked about it earlier at the press conference, like how important it is, like when people do go to prison, you know, for cannabis or whatever it may be, right? But in particular, cannabis, you're missing your family um, and they're taking you away from it. And that's how recidivism starts, right? When you don't have a parents in the household and different things like that. So just really being focused inside the prison, um, writing that motion. I think I was gonna get this clemency. She was a former Congresswoman, Karen Bass, had heard about my case, really talked to the governor, uh, and I thought I had a great opportunity, especially with the response I got from the legislators, but ultimately, you know, filed a habeas corpus motion. A lawyer came and seen me in 2020, um, and I eventually got my case exonerated and dismissed, you know, um, in 21. So it, it shows that how many more people are like Dante or my, or, or my good friend over here. And I think at the last Prisoner Project, we do a real good uh, point of just finding a story, finding ways we can help, you know, in partnership with NACDO, and just finding ways, whether it be passing a, a legislation through our policy team or finding an individual that we can help uh, is super essential. Thank you for that, Dante. And again, I think that just shows, you know, you can have all of the support in the world, you can have prominent individuals backing you, you can have the best lawyers that money can buy um, if you're that privileged to have that, and that doesn't mean that you're gonna be successful, especially in a clemency. I mean, any kind of post-conviction litigation, um, it's so up to the whims of a judge and they can, or the, an executive officer, uh, and it's just not easy to achieve when you look at the success rates of these kinds of cases, they're exceedingly low. Um, so again, kudos to you for achieving your freedom, um, but that's certainly not the trajectory of most of these cases. And so for lawmakers who say, well, there's already a path to relief via the judicial system, that's not effective and that's not justice. You know, There's a reason why we call it the criminal legal system and not the criminal justice system because justice is so absent from taking a case through trial, through litigation, especially in the post-conviction setting. Um, but something you touched on was how your incarceration impacted not just yourself, but your family. Um, and of course, that's something we hear so frequently from our constituents. Um, and Ronald, of course, something that you can speak to, and there's not only that impact on your family and your community, but there's the lasting consequences of just once you're free, having a conviction on your record. Can you kind of talk about just the burden and you know the effect of that 
on someone who has a conviction? Absolutely, that's, that's a great question. First, I'd like to thank Dante. I mean, congratulate him on his success. Great job, great job. Because getting released on your own and doing a pro, you know, pro se is, is amazing. Uh, you talk about clearance of records and I always call it expungement. And that's is very, very important because the exclusions that will be created by not clearing a person's record will cause many people to be ineligible for basic human needs and necessities, which means the perpetuation of collateral consequences for these individuals, such as divide, I mean, denying them access to housing, access to employment, access to the basic services they need to be successful citizens. And this would create, to me, the increase the likelihood of bad outcomes, including increased recidivism for impacted individuals. Record clearance is a public safety issue, in my opinion, because records keep people from having full access to the opportunities that can make them successful in, uh, in society. And if the goal is public safety, then insurance that previously convict, ensuring that previously convicted people have access to housing, food, assistance, and other basic necessities is essential in making that a reality. Absolutely, and that's why I think we can't lose sight of these two pillars of retroactive relief. A, actually releasing individuals from incarceration, but the work doesn't end there. If you're still on supervision, if, you're still, if you still have a conviction on your record, you're not fully free. That's not true freedom. There are so many barriers that continue to exist. And so when we do this work, it's not enough to just release people from incarceration. We have to do that follow-up work of ending supervision and removing those convictions from records. Um, Currently, we've seen more of a trend in states to provide that kind of systemic relief, um, both in the forms of reduction or elimination of sentences, but also record clearance. And I think particularly that uptick in uh, automatic record clearance for cannabis offenses. And I think that, to me, um, I have a lot of optimism there because we've seen cannabis reform really be the vehicle for broader criminal justice reforms, but the work is certainly not done there. Um, there's a lot of fight left, even in states that have done this, it's often very limited. It's limited to you know, simple possession, um, lower kinds of offenses, and at the federal level, we don't have this. So Liz, could you talk a little bit about beyond litigation at the federal level, what opportunities exist? Um, are there any pieces of legislation that you think are giving you hope um, to kind of provide this systemic reform? Um, so we do have some good news that um, the Cannabis Administrative and Opportunity Act, I know that there are some, uh, Senators Schumer, Wyden, and Booker are now looking for co-sponsors for this law, and it would, um, end cannabis prohibitions by removing cannabis from the Controlled Substance Act, and it would also provide our clients, people like our clients, the opportunity to um, get resentenced by their judge. So um, that's a little, that's a bright spot um, now. And so um, it's in the works. You want to call your Congress people and you want to call your senators and um, ask them to pass the CAOA. Um, it's really important. Um, so the. It, um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, like I said, we need President Biden to step up and grant clemency for all folks who are inside for marijuana. And that's something that we should pressure President Biden to do as well. Um, this is, like I said, there, you know, uh, we, sorry, our client, our constituents deserve this relief themselves because, as individuals, but every person who is in prison deserves clemency, and everyone who's in prison for marijuana deserves clemency. So those are two um, sort of across the board federal actions that could be done in order to, um, to release folks who are inside for cannabis. The last thing to say is that you might have heard about President Biden granting clemency for persons who are convicted of marijuana possession, right? And so the administration is um, talking up the fact that they have granted, um, granted relief for folks who um, 
who have a federal possession um, offense, and let me just tell you that it didn't release anyone from prison, in fact. Um, none of our constituents were actually affected by this law. Um, people are not necessarily prosecuted for marijuana possession anymore, and they don't serve the long sentences. And so when President Biden or VP um, Kamala Harris brag about the thousands of people that they have released from prison, it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's not as far-reaching as we'd like. So again, this is about um, granting clemency to folks who, um, anyone who's incarcerated for, um, for cannabis crimes. And I think highlighting the clemency power is really important because I've said this before, these aren't novel issues. It's not like we, you know, there's a lot about cannabis, cannabis reform um, and how we build an equitable industry that are complex questions. Um, this kind of reform, we have a framework for it. We have models. Presidents in the past have used categorical clemency, and President Biden has used categorical clemency with these pardons. He could easily do the same thing for commutations. He could literally, with the stroke of a pen, provide relief to the over 3,000 individuals still sitting in federal prison for cannabis. Um, so the framework is there, and similarly at the congressional level. The framework is there. We have states that have successfully adopted these models for retroactive relief. The federal government could be the same. Um, so there is hope in some of the bills that we um, have forthcoming, and we just need our elected officials to have the will and the courage to act on them. Um, Dante, I want to turn it back to you. It's just been incredible to see after your release you've come out and really been able to use your story to inspire others. Um, can you talk about the importance of advocacy in this work and education and informing the public on this issue? Yeah, uh, one of the things I experienced once getting released was I had met with the district attorney on my case uh, and he still wanted to give me a felony, right? Um, and I just didn't understand why, because I feel like, I, I, one, I didn't do the crime, but two, um, you know, a felony is something that's, you know, wild, right? Especially watching TV and watching uh, Van Jones, right? He was, t he was explaining how felony affected, uh, affected people of color, um, more importantly. Um, so I met with the district attorney, and you know, my defense lawyer was like, ah, oh, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it. That's kind of, we bridged the gap to that. Uh, but ultimately, I got to spoke with him, and he asked me what I wanted, and I asked him that I wanted to get my case um, into a misdemeanor where I can work it off, right? And he said, why, right? And I explained to him that if I went back to Stockton, California, where I'm from, um, and had to go get my brothers out of foster care, I would have to live in a certain neighborhood. I would have to not be able to vote, you know. Things would be really harder, right? And the kids wouldn't go to a great school, whatever the case may be. Um, and he said, you gave me a lot to think about. You know, eventually he had, uh, he said, I'll call you back next week. I'll call your attorney next week. We'll figure it out. And then he called me 10 minutes later and dismissed my case. And, and he was the most conservative district attorney, you know, in the state, right? Um, and that's how we're going to solve, you know, really the war on drugs. It's not really the people saying, you know, the legislators that already supported us, the people that are saying no. And I noticed that, you know, he told me, you know, after the fact that he was like, I didn't know how much a felony affected black America, right? And he was serious. He wasn't, I don't, I don't believe he was racist or anything, but I, I think he, the education part was so important to the public. And I think it's the stories, right? When we get a constituent out, we got a guy, you know, and Kevin Allen serving life for two grams of marijuana, never committed a violent offense. But when people get out and they hear the stories, they can't believe it, right? And it's like a light, right? You get a person out, they tell their story, and then it shows, right? And it may not be me that inspires somebody, but if I can get someone out and they inspire somebody and then that person does it, it's a domino effect, right? Because if you're not a conversation at the dinner table, when that legislator goes home or that judge goes home, the change is gonna be really, really hard, right? And one thing I will say, uh, the greatest gift you can give somebody is freedom, right? Not money, not anything else. And I think that's really important. The education of the people is really important. 
Absolutely, and I've seen it. I saw it this morning. When you meet with congressional leaders, you share your story, you can see hearts and minds changing, and I've seen the power of telling these stories of unjust incarceration for cannabis really be able to move the needle with lawmakers on all sides of the aisle. Um, and Ronald, I have found such an inspiration in the work at, that you and Just Leadership are doing with this as well. Um, and something that I think is also gives me hope about this industry and legalizing cannabis is that if we do it correctly, um, we can create opportunities for individuals who have been impacted. Do you see that um, with this burgeoning industry that we can find ways beyond um, the retroactive relief that we've talked about to give opportunities to impacted individuals? Oh, for, def for sure. Um, to speak to the storytelling piece you mentioned, you, you were reading my mind by Hearts and Minds, Shane. Uh, part of the work that we do at Just Leadership is leadership development training for people with lived experience. And one of the things we do is teach them how to tell their stories. And because stories is what's going to change the hearts and minds, and if you don't have heart and mind change, reform is not going to be sustainable. So storytelling is very, very important. As far as, you know, the support system, the opportunities for people with lived experience from cannabis convictions, um, she mentioned the uh, Cannabis Administration Opportunity Act earlier. And the act, while it does a number of things in terms of marketplace, the legislation directs funding to reinvest in communities that have been directly impacted um, by cannabis prohibition. And it helps improve the diversity and inclusion among licensed operators and regulated cannabis markets. Community inclusion is important because it allows them to be able to own farms and dispensaries and actually participate in the free economy, the burgeoning economy of the cannabis market. So the CO, the, the Cannabis Administration Act will help open those up to some degree. And also, my good friends, Maritz, I see here in the audience, the, the, the Drug Policy Alliance and the Marijuana Justice Coalition, we're working around to amend the MORE Act and to seek to add additional layer of protector by protection by providing cannabis specific protection for workers. If they're successful in doing so, the industry will add industry specific protections for cannabis workers, will improve economic health and personal safety of cannabis workers through the rapid implementation of industry specific standards from OSHA and will also ban child labor by amending the Fair uh, Labor Sense Standards Act. So there is some work being done, there's some stuff being done and legislated and, and a good people around the country working on these issues and hopefully we can have some positive results. Yeah, and again, I think that piece really does give me so much hope because, again, we've seen cannabis reform be this vehicle for broader criminal justice reform that I hope can be a blueprint for things outside of cannabis offenses, but I see that in the potential of this industry as well. You know, I think we're trying to build a framework for an equitable industry that includes those kinds of protections that empowers impacted workers and owners of these businesses. And so that's hopefully something that, you know, we can model with this industry that will have impacts beyond just cannabis. Um, but I want to thank all of you fantastic panelists for being with us today, um, for talking about your work. The work that you're doing is amazing. And I think we have Two minutes uh, for questions, if anyone has questions. Oh, no, we don't have time. <laughs> if you have questions, uh, get our contact info. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to the Policy Summit for having us. Thank you, guys.
the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Thank you very much for coming to the National Cannabis Policy Summit. Um, our next speaker really needs no introduction. Uh, throughout his career, uh, from the Oregon State Legislature, where he was elected Speaker of the House, to the halls of the U.S. Senate, he has fought for progress and justice on too many issues to count. Uh, but the issue we are here to talk about is cannabis, and few people in Congress have worked as hard to undo our nation's disastrous prohibition policies. Uh, beyond supporting the legalization of cannabis for adult use in his home state, uh, he has fought for veterans to be able to more easily access medical cannabis under the laws of their states. He's the Democratic champion for legislation to help normalize the state legal cannabis industry and improve both public safety and opportunities for small businesses by making it easier for banks to work with licensed cannabis businesses. He has steadfastly worked to include cannabis policy reform language in appropriations legislation when congressional politics and misinformation have often stood in the way of sensible standalone measures. He has stood for restorative justice for the people who have been most harmed by the criminalization of cannabis. And he was one of the first senators to strongly support removing cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. Everyone who cares about sensible cannabis policy reform should be grateful for the work that he has already done. And with his leadership on this issue in the upper chamber, I'm confident that we will continue to see escalating progress in the months and years ahead. Uh, please join me in welcoming Senator Jeff Merkley. Well, greetings, everybody. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come by and, and talk with you all. It's um, in 2016 that I was with one of my constituents, Tyson Highworth, uh, who was CEO of Oregon's Finest, and I was together with the Earl Blumenauer, a congressman who has really been a champion for cannabis on the, on the House side. And um, Tyson proceeded to empty out his backpack onto a table, had $70,000 in it. I then accompanied him. We put the money back in his backpack and, and drove down to Salem from, from Portland. And it was a, a very strange journey. Why are we driving with $70,000 to the state capitol? Well, you all know why, because everything has to be in the cash economy, in the cannabis world. Now, this was happening in a state that in 1973 became the first state to decriminalize cannabis. I was a junior in high school, and I was at a speech tournament where you do impromptu speaking, and they hand you an envelope, and the question in the envelope, and you immediately give a speech, you read it out loud, you give a speech, was, will Oregon become a pot smoker's mecca? And the question, of course, was there because we had just decriminalized uh, uh, cannabis uh, smoking. The problem was I wasn't sure what the reference Mecca meant. And so probably not a, a real terrific first ever uh, uh, showing at an impromptu uh, uh, speech tournament. Uh, but it was the start of my education about Oregon laws and about Oregon's leadership. Oregon became one of the first four states to legalize uh, medical cannabis, one of the first four states to legalize uh, recreational cannabis. And yet, it's still a crime, a federal crime for banks to provide financial services to cannabis businesses, which means no bank accounts, no credit cards, no electronic fund transfers, no business loans, and no home mortgages for employees. Well, Mr. Hayworth couldn't write a check or make a bank transfer because the federal government fears it would encourage, quote, criminal activity when exactly the opposite is true. The cash economy encourages criminal activity. We have the challenge in Oregon of robberies of stores, robberies of employees, and robberies of customers. Bad actors know that someone coming into a cannabis store might have cash in their pocket because they have to have it to make a purchase. Or that an employee leaving might have their payroll in their pocket because they're being paid in cash. And they know that the store might have a big supply of cash because of these cash economy transactions. And just this last week, uh, we had another cannabis uh, store robbed. Check it out, in 2023, 123 robberies of retail cannabis operations in Oregon, 123, one every three days. You know that there are teams out there that are targeting these stores and making it dangerous, and we did have one employee, not last year, but a previous year, who was murdered leaving a cannabis store in Oregon. So, 
an encouragement for violent crime, an encouragement for money laundering, an encouragement for organized crime. Organized crime loves a, a world in which you don't have electronic transactions. So let's fix it. Back in 2015, I was serving on the Appropriations Committee, and I put forward an amendment, and this is the first ever cannabis legislation in the history of the U.S. Senate, an amendment that said no federal funds can be used to enforce this law, thereby creating a, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> And my staff was like, no, no, this is too dangerous of territory. It's a third rail. And I'm like, no, this is absurd. And not only did I put forward that provision in the Appropriations Committee, the Spending Committee of the Senate, but we passed it with the full committee. And we passed it again the next year. And suddenly, people looked around and said, oh, this isn't dangerous political territory, and so we started to build momentum with the rest of the, the Senate. And I introduced a broader bill, uh, now we're 10 years into it, uh, trying what has now evolved into safe banking bill and now the safer uh, banking bill, and yet we still haven't passed this bill. As the number of states that have had a medicinal or recreational cannabis economy have grown, so have the opportunity uh, to have more senators on board. Because a lot of senators, they say states' rights, and meaning each state should be able to do what they want, but then they're like, yeah, but my home state, this is, we haven't passed cannabis laws yet, so, so I'm not, not quite there. So in fact, that has been uh, helpful. So this Cannabis Safer uh, uh, Act, uh, it will enable us to do all the things that we would expect in a normal economy. And second, it will start to address some of the damage done through unequal enforcement of cannabis laws in the past. You know, a white youth and a black and brown youth use cannabis at about the same rates, but way disproportionately black and brown youth were arrested. Way disproportionately they serve sentences. Way disproportionately they have cannabis uh, crimes on their record uh, affecting their, their current opportunities. Uh, so we want to see that, that change. And uh, one of the, the ways we make that change is give grants to states for expungement of these past crimes. So that's in this bill. In this bill is uh, support for the community development financial institutions, or CDFIs, that serve underserved communities, our poor communities, often our inner city communities. And so that would be uh, helpful in changing the economy in those places. Uh, individuals who work for cannabis companies would be able to get federally backed uh, home loans, which they're not able to do now. The legislation includes a study on how to open the cannabis market to more minority-owned, veteran-owned, and women-owned, and small business owners, uh, and that would be healthy for our economy and for the communities as, as well. So I mentioned that we want to proceed to really press for the expungement funds. We are not telling states they have to expunge. That's a political reach beyond which we can do. But we can say, we encourage you to do it. It's the right thing to do. And we'll give you funds to set up the state operations to make it happen, encourage it to happen. And my home state has taken strong steps towards expungement. And a real thank you to Governor Kate Brown, no longer governor, but former Governor Kate Brown, who really worked to make this happen. Finally, this legislation ensures that federal bank regulators don't become the moral police. There was something called Operation Choke Point under President Obama, and a lot of folks became concerned that they were pressing regulators to dump customers who were in businesses that the regulators simply didn't like, even though they were legal. That is something that has helped tie the Democratic and Republican supporters together, and it's an important element of this bill as well. It has been a really tricky piece, though, because the regulators don't want to be told what to do. So really nitty-gritty, like, arguments over every single word in the Safer Banking Act that affects those customers. So long past time, we, we deschedule cannabis. Any supporters of descheduling cannabis here? You know, in 1970, President Nixon, in his war on drugs, signed the Controlled Substances Act and made cannabis a Schedule I narcotic. How bizarre is that? Heroin is a Schedule I narcotic. 
Fentanyl is a Schedule II narcotic, and we know the, the, the series of uh, challenges that fentanyl posed across the country. So, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2023 recommended rescheduling, re, not D, scheduling cannabis down to Schedule III to allow for medical use and research, but rescheduling might be a step in the right direction, but it is not descheduling. Descheduling would allow us to fully address the crime, the harms of criminalization, the prison sentences, the prison records, the fines, the access to public housing, the access to nutrition assistance, the deportations. So 24 states now have legalized recreational cannabis, 38 allow medicinal cannabis, 88% of Americans support legalizing. When do 88% of Americans agree on anything? <laughs> if 88% of Americans agree on something, then we should be able to get it done. So in January this year, a group of us sent a letter to the Attorney General and the DEA uh, encouraging them, urging them, pleading with them uh, to remove cannabis completely from the Controlled Substances Act. Descheduling. When I drove with my constituent to deliver that bag of, of cash, I saw for myself how in inefficient and dangerous this system is. And so we are on the brink of changing that. We have now passed out of the banking committee for the first time ever the Safer Banking Act. We have the support of the majority leader on the Safer Banking Act. We have the support of criminal justice reformers who in the past weren't so supportive, but now are supportive as we've been able to get as many elements into this package as possible for things like descheduling and like expungement. So this is the moment. Let's not let this year pass without getting this bill through the House of Representatives, that is the Safer Banking Bill, through the House of Representatives, through the Senate, and onto the President's desk. We don't know what the next election will bring. We don't know the control how. Let's get it done this year. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, hello, everybody. Sasanya, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Minton, and I'm with the Reason Foundation, a think tank here in DC. And it is my privilege today to lead a conversation with Kat Packer about the economic effects of cannabis reform. Um, Kat is currently the Director of Drug Markets and Legal Regulation at the Drug Policy Alliance. And she, in addition to her work at DPA, she also serves as a, as a distinguished cannabis policy practitioner in residence at the Ohio State University's Moritz College of Law's Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. It's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> and she's also the vice chair of the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition and an advisor to the Parabola Center. 
Uh, Kat also has hands-on experience working as a regulator in the legal cannabis markets. From 2017 until 2022, she served as the first executive director for the city of Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulation. Under her leadership, LA licensed over 1,200 businesses, collected over $320 million in cannabis tax revenue, and became among the first jurisdictions that attempted to redress the harms caused by cannabis prohibition through cannabis equity measures. So today, Kat's here to, join, uh, Kat's here to share her wealth of expertise and insight as we discuss some of the overlooked economic benefits, right? A lot we'd like to talk about the jobs that it creates and the tax revenue that legalizing cannabis produces, and all of that is true. But like the harms of drug prohibition, with its dispersed and sometimes hard to quantify harms, legalization also has hard to quantify or measure benefits. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Kat Packer today. So to start, Kat, I just figured I'd ask you, why don't you tell me what you see? So, so far, you know, we have, I think, about 30 states that have legalized cannabis in D.C., uh, 30 states in D.C. who've legalized cannabis for adult use and more that have legalized medical marijuana. What are you seeing as some of the sort of overlooked benefits of cannabis policy reform? Yeah, so uh, hey everyone, I'm, I'm really excited to be joining you all for this conversation. I know that the topic is uh, premised on the economic case for uh, cannabis, uh, but we were talking backsta backstage and I was like, I'm just gonna escalate this conversation. We're gonna get into uh, all types of uh, conversations. It's like, that's what happens when you give me a mic. You, you kind of never know uh, what you're gonna get. But I think that part of what's been overlooked in, in part of the reason why I think we've been overlooking some of these other concepts is that we, we are often, too often, focused on the economic uh, benefits, or at least how the economic benefits are framed uh, in this commercial uh, licensing system. I think, as a general matter, the biggest benefit that's come from legalization policies and decriminalization policies is the reduction in people who are being arrested, people who are being incarcerated, et cetera, but we don't always consider those to be uh, economic benefits. Sometimes we consider them to be uh, cost-saving measures, but when folks are talking about, particularly states that have moved forward with adult use legalization, when they're talking about the benefits, you often hear them talking about uh, revenue generated as opposed to revenue saved. Uh, and the reality is that cannabis criminalization, criminalization of all drugs, uh, really impacts, adversely impacts all of these different social determinants of health, like housing, education, employment, uh, health care, and these are things that come of huge cost to us uh, as American citizens. Like we pay our tax dollars and we're funding all of these things, uh, but it's these uh, very like social nets that folks don't have in, uh, access to if we're still criminalizing substances. Right, yeah, and there's a real economic benefit to someone not having a conviction, which might then prevent them from getting a job or losing their federal student aid or something like that. So a lot of the states that have uh, legalized cannabis in recent years are including social equity provisions in their regulations. I know that's something you worked on in LA. Uh, I have a two-part question for you on that. One, are we starting to see the results from those provisions and programs sort of trickle into communities to any benefit, whether that's a measurable economic benefit or maybe just participation in, in politics or, or more communication with your lawmakers? Are you starting to see that? And if not, why? Or is there something that state regulators, state lawmakers, or federal lawmakers could do to improve those outcomes from those programs? Yeah, I think we're, we're starting to see those benefits and we're starting to see that progress, but I do think that there is a disconnect sometime that, that happens when uh, we have legislatures who are talking about equity and talking about these equity initiatives, and they think that all of this is going to be uh, solved by a policy or program. Uh, and in reality, we know that that's not going to be the case. Uh, one of my colleagues, Shakia Scott, who's with uh, the city of Boston, she's the senior uh, business, uh, cannabis business manager, um, she always says equity is not a program. Uh, and so I think that if folks were you know, expecting to see 
uh, you know, equities alone through these programs, we're, we're obviously not going to get there. What we need is uh, a real commitment to understand, one, who's impacted by these policies, uh, and to have government at the local, state, and federal level who are willing to uh, address those issues. You know, we can see uh, you know, businesses and people being uh, licensed to, to participate in the industry, but the reality is is that most folks who have been directly impacted by cannabis criminalization aren't going to have an opportunity to participate in the industry, or they don't aren't interested in participating in the industry. And so I think as we're starting to reevaluate these programs and assess um, what has been successful, what the ongoing challenges are, uh, part of what I've learned in my experience is that we've really got to broaden the scope of what we're considering to be uh, the opportunities that are available for folks who have been directly impacted. If you've been directly impacted by cannabis criminalization and you've been harmed, it shouldn't be the case that the only thing that's available to you is a pathway uh, to potential licensure. Uh, we should be connecting folks to economic opportunities across the spectrum. Uh, there should not be a closed door uh, for these communities. And are you seeing a difference in any of this? So like a lot of the states, some of the social equity provisions seem to be a bit tacked on. It's like, look, we're doing this thing rather than a central, you know, driving force behind their total cannabis reform approaches. Are you seeing that breakdown in states? Have some states really taken a comprehensive equity-based approach versus the states that are just sort of tacking on, maybe even later, you know, some of the earlier states that didn't have social equity in the beginning are tacking on it. Are you seeing any effects that differ between these states in terms of that? Is anyone in here from Michigan? Okay, so I can talk shit about Michigan. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I, I'm from Ohio. I went to Ohio State University, so there's this like rivalry that exists between uh, Ohio State and, and Michigan. Um, but Michigan, for example, was one of these jurisdictions that uh, started one of these equity programs, and it really felt like, uh, at least at the beginning, I don't necessarily know what it looks like today, uh, but it felt very performative. And I remember sitting down uh, with folks who were running that regulatory office and being like, stop calling this an equity program. Just like, let's stop calling. And I, I even, you know, there were even conversations that I had in the city of LA where I was just like, we might want to stop calling this an equity program. Uh, because what we're doing right now, um, and, and it was in particular because we were creating different types of classes of licenses. For example, I'll give you another, I'll, I'll talk shit about Ohio for a second really quickly. Ohio, we talked about, it, ju it just became the 24th state uh, to pass adult use legalization. And the initiative that passed uh, created an equity program. Uh, but the equity program that was created in Ohio would have allowed for equity applicants to have a cultivation license that was capped at 5,000 square feet. But the existing medical marijuana dispensaries had a cultivation cap of 100,000 square feet. Does 5,000 and 100,000 sound equitable to you? This is actually an inequity program. Uh, and so I think that we have to be very clear with the language that we're using. Are we talking about equity and licensing? Are we talking about uh, Equ equity and ownership? Are we talking about, uh, what exactly are we talking about here? And I think that if we start to drill down on the details and actually do some uh, evaluation of these programs, they can and will be improved. And, and that'll just be kind of my last point on these efforts. You know, there is a intentional effort all across the country to try and do away with diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And it should be no secret that this effort is directly related to trying to erase the experiences uh, and histories of black and brown communities and marginalized uh, communities. And so we have to be very committed not to the word equity, uh, but what it means and the actual outcomes that we can achieve for our communities. Uh, it's not about the rhetoric. Uh, we need to see a full-scale commitment. I, I want to see the federal government, the state government, and local governments keep the same energy that they had 
for the war on drugs when it's time to legalize cannabis. I'm like, keep that same energy. That's what I want. So now it's my turn to escalate, I suppose. So I want to turn a little bit to public perception about all of this stuff. The, the, as the market is, become, is coming online in a lot of states and jurisdictions, uh, we still see, at least in terms of rhetoric, we see people uh, bringing up the social costs and criminal justice issues from the public safety, law and order side of things. Can you talk a little bit about how advocates, policy, you know, researchers can address some of the, first of all, I mean, I would like to ask you, do you think that those issues are honestly what is motivating this uh, the stalling in Congress and in some states, or even backsliding in some states like you saw in Ohio, where they're allocating funds that voters specifically said they wanted to go to equity programs, they're allocating them to law enforcement programs. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the political landscape, the conversation among the public, right? Because we know the general public, whether left, right, or center, or uh, unaffiliated, generally supports legalization. And I know ACLU did a recent poll, 2022 poll in Maryland, that found support increased for legalization when it was combined with some equity programs. So, you know, speaking of the general public, but then also, you know, right of center, right, far right lawmakers on this issue, what are you seeing in terms of? rhetoric in terms of how we can sell these programs to them in a way that makes sense for them and their voters. Yeah, there's a real disconnect between like the, the rhetoric and the reality. Um, I'll, I'll use Ohio as an example just because there's so much material uh, there to, to work with. Um, but we, we had a situation in Ohio where the voters passed an initiative um, and the entire time, like the legislature could have acted on this for years, they chose not to. Um, they sent out a resolution asking uh, voters in the state of Ohio to uh, not support legalization, and then after it passed, they said that they were gonna try and overturn it. And some of the rhetoric that they were using were like, well, we want to protect the kids. We want to protect youth. We want to make sure um, Ohio is really struggling with this term black market. I, I went to Ohio, and I heard the term black market used so much it uh, continuously made me cringe. Uh, I've been continuing to try and tell folks uh, that that's not a term that we should be using anymore. We shouldn't be uh, equating black with criminal. That's what folks are doing when we're uh, using this messaging. Uh, but in Ohio, I dubbed what the governor and the GOP legislature were doing as the Puff Puff Police campaign, uh, because they were literally trying to utilize cannabis policy reform to create new types of harms. Like, they were trying to create new felonies. They were trying to create new misdemeanors for, for activities like smoking outside, or um, they had one law that was just like, if you're not actively consuming, you need to immediately put it up or you could be arrested. It's like all of these new ways that folks were trying to uh, criminalize policy. And so, for me, this has been a lesson um, that while, you know, being in California, in Los Angeles, alongside jurisdictions like San Francisco and Oakland, that were really leading the work to try and model how, not that like we would, uh, because that requires leadership and action from everyone, uh, but how we could do good with cannabis policy. And I thought, you know, this this is great. We can we can all get behind this. But the reality is, is that. Just as there are folks like us uh, who are organizing and trying to do good and protect community with cannabis policy, there's another room somewhere in the country uh, where folks are organized and are, are literally trying to utilize this policy to harm our communities, to continue to harm communities, to exacerbate uh, existing harms. And so we have to be very mindful and not just continue to receive the rhetoric, but keep our own receipts uh, and, and then uh, be willing to call folks out uh, when, when it just doesn't match. Yeah, so one of the things we talked about backstage was, you know, from my work in alcohol markets and other markets that are emerging out of prohibition is that what we what we often see are the criminalized market is more equitable really in terms of entry, in terms of you know, it's just 
let's say, fair play, whatever, between competitors. Uh, and what we see when things start to become legalized, especially state by state, is that it provides an opportunity for the special interests who have a foot in the door, so to speak, more so than maybe just your general constituents, to put, you know, to weight the regulation in their favor. So what we're seeing in a lot of ways in a, in a lot of states are replication of the harms in, in a way. You know, for example, with New York, when they, you know, legalized cannabis, but they haven't yet opened any retail spaces, they immediately started going after the legacy dealers of the people who had the cannabis trucks who were unlicensed, whereas previously they'd kind of been ignoring them due to public pressure because they didn't want the cops going after that market. Uh, I guess my question here on this, you could say anything you want, I'd love to hear that, but is do you see federal action on cannabis as being a, a benefit in terms of equity in these markets and fair play in these markets and, and easier entry into the markets? Uh, do you see federal action helping that or harming that, depending on what the action is, I suppose? Yeah, and I think what I've learned is that like we can't speak in absolutes. Like uh, It really depends on us. Like if, if we want this cannabis policy to do good, uh, it's, it's up to us. And if we don't, like we can imagine uh, what that will look like. In terms of the enforcement conversation, it's, it's complex and you're absolutely right. The uh, legacy market was a much more equitable market. The issue is that it wasn't uh, enforced in a fair way. And so, you know, we, we can see disparities even in uh, a market that is uh, more set up uh, for, for small people and individuals to be successful. But what I have concern about more generally is that we've got to make sure, we're, we're in this very unique moment of time. Like, there's going to be a point in time where we're not here anymore and folks are going to look back and be like, oh, what were those folks doing back in 2024 when they were, like, stressing about uh, all of these different issues? And what I'm particularly concerned about is that we know that cannabis criminalization uh, was harmful. We know that prohibition was harmful. In some of the elements that I'm seeing with these regulatory programs and commercial markets, um, those harms are absolutely still there. They're being recreated. And we could see a situation where we have <clears throat> We're still doing prohibition and still doing criminalization. It's just got a little asterisk next to it. Uh, so it's, it's still criminalization. It's still uh, prohibition. But there's an exception, because you have a license. And uh, I know I talked about how you know, licenses aren't the most important thing. Uh, but this is part of the reason why when we were fighting uh, early on that we were saying that it's so important for black and brown communities to have access to licensure. Because literally, licensure is the difference between engaging in legal activity and illegal activity. And if our communities don't have access to those licenses, they will necessarily be squeezed out. <clears throat> so when I see situations uh, like New York, like Los Angeles, uh, where we are continuing to see you know, uh, unlicensed activity, unregulated activity, one that tells me that there's still a huge demand and opportunity for there to be growth. But I'm concerned about the rhetoric that I continue to see from commercial and industry participants where they're like, <clears throat> don't start adult use sales until we, uh, or don't decriminalize until we start adult use sales. These are two completely separate conversations. We can have legalization without business interests at all. And I think that the industry needs to be reminded of that. Because this is, and I, I, when I meet with industry folks all the time, I'm like, you all would be doing so much better if y'all could just focus on people uh, as opposed to profit. The industry has been focused on, there'll be a, a panel later, focused on safe banking primarily for the last several years. Um, <clears throat> because they're interested in their bottom line. So we have people who are still in jail right now for the same thing that these people are making billions of dollars of, off of, and their priority is protecting their banks and financial institutions. So when we talk about this, <laughs> this rhetoric or the disconnect, uh, we could be pouring fuel on fire particularly with this rescheduling conversation. 
Because what will happen, and folks have seen it already, even when there was the initial news of the HHS recommendation, what did stocks do? They went up immediately. And you know, it's not the small businesses who are benefiting from those blips uh, in the stock market exchange. So when this rescheduling decision does happen and there's this flood of uh, money that goes into the industry, it's probably going to be going to uh, large interests, large companies. I imagine, uh, I'll say I predict uh, that there will be like large, a, a large catalyst for mergers and acquisitions. And as these businesses get bigger, they're going to get more powerful and they're going to try and figure out how they get more market share. And again, if black and brown communities and communities don't have other ways to access cannabis, this is why you got to be fighting for home grow. This is why we got to be fighting for personal cultivation, for collectives, for cooperatives. Like these are all really important things to make sure that we still have access to cannabis. <clears throat> because I think the industry, and I don't want to say the industry at large because I got some industry friends in here and they're looking at me like, that's not me. Uh, I, know, I know it's not you. Um, but I think that there are some folks who would be happy to continue to profit off of the demise of low-income and marginalized communities. And I don't know about you, but cannabis is also just way too expensive. Uh, and, and why should we be spending, you know, so much of our disposable income on cannabis in the first place? But this is a personal issue that I have. I'm, I'm spending way too much disposable income on, on cannabis, but that's... And I think that that makes a good point is that, you know, in the you know, less regulated market or the unregulated market, illicit market for cannabis, you know, what you had were legacy dealers and producers functionally doing all the R&D for bigger corporations that are going to come in once the market is legal. Right? They found the price points, they found the products, the THC levels, whatever. Um, and we're actually starting to see this continue to happen. This is continuing to happen in that market, right? We've, we've just, I'm sure a lot of you have heard stories about the hemp derivatives market becoming a big thing. And the federal government hasn't, I mean, the federal government kind of created this issue with the way it worded certain statutes that allowed for basically a loophole that people could slip through anything that wasn't Delta 9 THC. And so now we have the states grappling with this problem. I'm not sure how big of a problem it is, but a lot of state lawmakers attest that it's a very big problem. But with the way that they're approaching the hemp derivatives, you know, this new innovation in the market that is frankly responding to regulatory excess or regulatory inefficiency in the Delta 9 cannabis market. Uh, but reg state reg regulators are starting to move on this and they might end up creating those problems down the road that we'll be talking about in 15 years of why did we do this in 2024? Why did we ban everything other than Delta 9? Which, you know, so, um, I would love to hear you comment on who you think is responsible for the, for the hemp derivatives problem, if you think it's a problem, and what could be done at any level of government to kind of try and, because you know, this is a right, it is kind of an innovation. It is the market innovating. So I would just love to hear what you think about that and, and how that fits into this whole conversation. Yeah, this is something that uh, when I sit down with uh, regulators, this is something that constantly is coming up. Uh, industry folks are, are having this conversation as well. And um, there are different camps in this. There are folks who are expressing opinions that we should ban it all. There are folks who are saying that it should be regulated. It should be regulated similar to how uh, cannabis is regulated. I don't think that uh, banning these products are, are going to solve anything. And the reality is that we are talking about the same plant. Uh, I think we've created this uh, false dichotomy between uh, cannabis and, and hemp that's a, a, a legal one, but not necessarily a, uh, a science-based uh, dichotomy. And the kind of irony in the situation that we're in right now, where we have states that are proactively uh, regulating adult use and also you know, increasingly trying to ban or, or find ways to put restrictions on these other products um, is kind of what's happening at the federal level. So I know that there have been uh, different efforts where folks have said, well, why can't the FDA regulate this like a dietary supplement or why can't they uh, regulate it as a different type of food product or other types of products? And what the FDA has said thus far is that they don't have the authority to uh, 
they, they can't regulate it under their existing authority. So they're essentially trying to reach out to Congress to have some type of new authority and legislation that would allow them to address this. What I'm keeping my eye out for is that because these are the exact same plant, it is possible and in my mind likely that we will see the federal government move on establishing regulations for hemp before we see them put things in place for cannabis. And because they're the same plant, I think folks should at least assume that that foundational regulatory framework that they apply for hemp will be a, a good sense of what the cannabis regulation should look like. And so we gotta be mindful, how are unlicensed hemp operators being enforced against? Because if we see some concerns about disparities or practices, they're probably gonna be set on fire uh, when we're dealing with the cannabis space because now it's an intoxicating uh, product or we're, we're dealing with uh, THC, which is villainous uh, in, in, in some of these spaces. So I do think that this hemp conversation is gonna set the stage, potentially, could set the stage, potentially, uh, for what this framework looks like, but I think that's part of the reason why we've, it's, it's been an indication to me, I'm like, all right, well now I gotta get actively involved in this hemp conversation, uh, because I do think that it's going to uh, create a pathway, um, and, and government likes to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to not do new things, and so if they are able to come up with a solution for hemp and then copy and paste it, best believe uh, they will. Yeah, I think a lot of members of Congress like to say, well, we're not doing a new thing. We're just citing legislation that are, you know, just a st existing statute. That's why the, you know, the 0.3% Delta 9 THC, which was arbitrarily set, has just been repeated and repeated and now is trickling down to the state, to state legislation on hemp and cannabis as well. Um, so, uh, I want to take a little turn here and ask you, do you think the economic arguments work when it comes to those who still have, so there's still people who think of the social cost when it comes to cannabis, they still have a lot of stereotypes in their mind about what legalization looks like. Do you think showing people the data about the jobs and the tax revenue and all of the other benefits is the thing that really moves people, especially policymakers, or do you think that there's some a different a different approach we could be taking. I, you know, I'm speaking specifically about the, you know, the not progressive policymakers, people who consider themselves centrist or you know right of center. But you could speak about anybody. Yeah, I, I do think. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that this is a good thing. That this is the thing that's the primary motivator. But I do think that by and large. Uh, policymakers, government, their ears perk up when they hear the cannabis tax revenue. Uh, folks already have a million dollars about, or a, a million ideas about where those dollars should be spent uh, before the dollars even become uh, available. And again, I think my concern is that they hear tax revenue, they don't hear or even understand what the priorities of their voters are, and so they use the money from the voters to fund their own priorities, right? And so you could literally, in Ohio, uh, I'll use this as an example, Ohio is literally trying to use the money that the voters said should go to equity programs to fund the lawmakers' priorities, which is law enforcement. So you had folks literally like a week after the bill passed say the number one priority for cannabis tax revenue in Ohio should be jail construction. Uh, how crazy does that sound? Uh, but that's the type of rhetoric and things that I think are motivating folks. So I don't think that like, there's the saying, it's like when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Um, I don't think that we should expect cannabis to change who these people are and what their priorities are. And so I think if these folks are um, set on uh, prioritizing things that are gonna be the services to communities, like that's what we're gonna do. And that's how we've gotta get these folks out of office and actually elect people who are going to be representative uh, of their communities. Yeah, uh, so we just have a few minutes left. I wanted to touch on it. So I wanted to ask you kind of a personal question because you've been in this space. I mean, you've been at the forefront, really, of setting up 
regulation on legal cannabis markets for about 10 years now. And I wanted to ask you, what, in your opinion, have you seen that surprised you that's changed, whether that's the way policymakers approach things, whether that's the general public or the way that cannabis is reported on? What are the biggest changes, good or bad, that you've seen during your career when it comes to the conversation about cannabis policy reform? Um, I think one of the changes that I've seen that are concerning to me, that this is the concerning things that immediately came to mind. Um, I'm seeing us work against our own interests. Like I see like time and time again, um, it won't, it won't even necessarily be people that we would identify as like the ops that are doing things that I think could be detrimental to our movement. Uh, I, I think we've got to have conversations with folks who are like in our tent already uh, to make sure that they stay there. Because even in this like rescheduling, descheduling uh, conversation, you know, there are all of these different conversations about what the impacts are, et cetera. And I've sat down with many a different stakeholders who will say, you know, I, I recognize that this is the thing that we should be fighting for. I recognize the thing that this is the thing that our communities need. Um, but like, I don't think that we're going to get this. So I think we're just going to support rescheduling so that we can like get a win. And it's like, what what service does that do to your community? Uh, I remember having this conversation uh, with an ED of uh, an advocacy organization who uh, said that they were going to come out and and not support um, descheduling. Um, but they said that they, they anticipated that the move would be to Schedule 3. And I, I sat there and told this person, I said, well, if you expect the move to be to Schedule 3, why can't you ride with your community anyway? Like, if you know that you're going to get it, if you're going to get your thing on the back end anyway, why wouldn't you just stand with community to stand with community? And I feel like there's this question about, like, well, can we get it? Is there any possibility? We're definitely not going to get it if we're acting shaky. Like, if y'all aren't being confident, like, go, go somewhere else, because that's not actually going to help our movement. I think we need to stand with strength and conviction. We are actually on the right side of history. There is no confusion about this whatsoever. Um, so like, say it with your chest. That's, that's, what, that's what I'll leave it with. Say it with your chest. Like, folks should feel confident in our position uh, and not feel as though their position should change because we're dealing with different political times or there are these other challenges. Like, we, we need to be willing to, like, stand on business. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, 100% agree, and I think there's a compelling point to be made here that if you observe the way these half-step measures towards legalization, you know, sometimes like Schedule 3, like we've all been saying today, moving it to Schedule 3 would have some benefits. It wouldn't do what we need it to do. And in the end, there might be other consequences that come from that. If you see what states are doing, half measures have their own harms by not just full-scale decriminalizing and legalizing cannabis. And I think with that, we're out of time. So I want to ask the audience to join me in thanking Kat Packer for sharing the wealth of knowledge. Right, thank you, everybody.
Good afternoon. I'm Karen O'Keefe. I'm the Director of State Policies at the Marijuana Policy Project, and it is so wonderful to be here with all of you amazing cannabis advocates and uh, policymakers. We are here to talk about cannabis and workers' rights. This is both cannabis consumers' ability to work without getting fired for being cannabis consumers, and people that work in the cannabis industry. And I'm so glad to be here with my amazing panelists, and I will let them introduce themselves, starting with you, Luke. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Jones. I'm a resident of Maryland, and I've been a federal government employee for 25 years. I'm happy to be part of the panel. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Ola Oyefeso. I am a vice president with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, and also the director of our Cannabis Workers Rising campaign. We represent and strive to represent all cannabis workers from, st from seed to sta sale, and our efforts are to make sure that the jobs that come up in the cannabis industries are good quality, family raising, able to hold a career jobs. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Blaine Stum. I am a uh, senior policy advisor to DC Council Chairman Phil Mendelson, uh, who is the chairman of the council. Um, I'm originally from Washington State and got my start in cannabis policy working on medical cannabis collective garden legislation in Washington State and then Initiative 502, which legalized recreational cannabis use, possession, and sale within the state of Washington. So happy to be here. Thank you. So we will start off with the issue of cannabis consumers and their right to employment. As most people might know, cannabis metabolites can stay in your system for up to 30 days. And a lot of employers drug test or are able to drug test after there's a cra uh, accident or something like that at work. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act protects people who are medical patients who are disabled from being discriminated against for other prescriptions. But because cannabis is federally illegal, it doesn't apply to medical cannabis. So as a result of this, states are increasingly acting to protect people who are cannabis consumers from being fired for using cannabis either as a medical patient or as an adult use consumer. Nine of the legalization states have protections to some degree. They vary. Some are just for applicants, some are for employees, some have exceptions for safety sensitive positions. But nine have some kind of adult use protections from cannabis consumers being fired from their employer. And about two thirds of the medical cannabis states have some kind of protections too to make sure that people can't be fired for testing positive or for being a medical cannabis patient. Uh, Washington DC was one of the trailblazers when it came to adult use protections, and Blaine was a key part of that, and I'd like you to tell us about what DC is doing to protect its cannabis consumers who are workers. Yeah, great. So in uh, 2022, the DC Council worked on a bill to protect both recreational consumers and medical patients who are using cannabis uh, from employment discrimination. Um, we wanted to do both because even though we do not have a legal recreational market, um, Initiative 71 did legalize personal possession and use of cannabis recreationally. So we wanted to make sure that it covered both medical and recreational use. And what the law does is it prohibits employers from uh, failing to hire people, firing people, or otherwise penalizing employees solely because they are a cannabis user. Um, what that means is that if they find out that somebody's a cannabis user, they couldn't like demote them, they couldn't fire them. Um, additionally, they can't be fired or penalized simply because there are cannabis or cannabinoid metabolites in their bodily fluids if they have to be subject to a drug test unless they're in a safety sensitive position, uh, in which case there can be some of that adverse uh, employment uh, action taken. But otherwise, even with that presence of metabolites, they would have to be able to cite specific instances of impairment in order to penalize an employee or fire them. Um, the protections, as I said, don't apply to safety sensitive. So we tried to craft that pretty narrowly. Some places it 
sort of swallows the bill itself. Uh, ours applies to things like police officers, construction workers, and like people that work in like nursing facilities for elderly residents. Um, and it does not cover federal employees because we do not have jurisdiction over the federal government. Thank you, Blaine. So turning to the issue of workers in the cannabis industry, the UFCW has been in the forefront of organizing cannabis employees and also has been advocating in many states for what's called a labor peace provision. So I'm hoping, Adam Ola, you can tell us more about what is labor peace and what is it that it does for workers. Absolutely. So a labor peace agreement is when an employer and the union that, that wants to represent the workers sign an agreement that says, in the process of organizing the workers, we won't do the, as long as you do not interfere with us having a conversation with the workers about the benefits of joining a union. Um, interfere can range from the traditional captive audience meetings where employers traditionally go to workers and say, oh my God, do you know how bad it is? They're gonna make you pay dues and you're not gonna get anything for it. They leave out the hundreds of things you're gonna get for it. Um, for being a member and the job protections you get for it. And the union agrees not to pick it in front of the employer. So Karen asked me when we were in the back, does that mean you can't strike? And simple answer, no. It means as long as we are both working to wor together to, you know, to allow us to have a relationship with the workers to when we're bargaining and negotiating a contract that the employer is actually truly negotiating that the workers aren't being threatened, everything goes forward. We don't, we don't throw up a sign saying a rat in front of a shop saying so-and-so is a bad employer, so-and-so is trying to steal um, from the workers. We don't do that. But if the employer decides not to follow it, a traditional labor piece can have mechanisms that trigger either arbitration or if they violate it completely, it's out the door. And then we can go back to our standard employer-employee relationship. The reason, so UFCW has been pushing for this in a lot of states, and the reason we are pushing for it is, cannabis is, as we all know, has, was illegal in so many states, and so many people went to jail for small amounts, large amounts. And now we're creating a new industry, like, how, when's the last time this happened that a whole industry is being created? And we have the opportunity to make sure that these are good quality jobs. And so we, want, we go to legislators around the country and say, it's your responsibility to make sure, because you were responsible for all those laws that put people in jail. So now you're responsible for making sure that the same people who were selling the product before and going to jail, when they come out and they want to work in the industry, they can make a living. Because the thing people forget is, and I, I'll start this by saying, I want all the cannabis millionaires out there. I want you all to become a millionaire in cannabis. I want everybody to make their good money off of it. Because I think there's going to be billions of dollars in it. So I want you all to be millionaires. See, I said there's going to be billions because the rest of that needs to go to the workers because most of the workers who went to jail for cannabis will never be the one that owns, you know, 50% of True Leave, 25% of GTA, name whoever the employee. They won't be that. But if they're going to work in a dispensary, they should have affordable health care, they should have a retirement fund, and they should make enough to, you know, for the American dream, 2.5 vacations, raise 2.5 kids, um, have a house, apartment, whatever you want. And that's the reason there needs to be an LPA, because as I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and everyone always said, if you want a good job, go get the good city job, because it's a good union job, you'll have your retirement, you'll have your pension, you'll have your health care. And the LPA provides that same benefit for all for this industry. And you know, I'm gonna. She said I have as much time as I want, so I'm gonna um, pontificate for a second on it and just say, I've run into electeds around the country who are like, oh well, lay unions are bad for people making money in cannabis. And I was like, no, it's not, because when you say that, that means you're saying only one set of people should make money from cannabis. And the LPA is basically trying to change the narrative. It's trying to say everyone should make money off cannabis, not workers only, not employers only, own, owners only. It's the LPA is to say 
everyone should make money off of cannabis. So get as many millionaires as you want in cannabis, no billionaires, and make as many middle class jobs in cannabis as possible at the same time. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, I forgot to mention, we might have a very special guest. We're expecting Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton to come sometime during this panel, at which point we'll pause and we'll resume after we get to hear from her about all of her amazing work for cannabis justice. Next, I want to ask you, Luke, about, Luke is a federal employee, as he mentioned, about your experience and if you can share that with everyone. Thank you. Um, first, uh, I wanted to say that um, I'm very, very proud to be part of a panel addressing the rights of uh, workers. I'm someone who believes very, very strongly that the individual person should own the fruits of their intellectual and physical labor. And it's for that reason uh, that I'm extraordinarily proud to be part of this panel. Um, and it's in the name of James Jackson and uh, my aunt Esther Jackson that uh, I speak on these issues today. <clears throat> uh, taught me a lot about labor rights. Um, so my story starts uh, kind of a, a while ago on April 17th, 1990, uh, which is my sobriety date. <clears throat> and uh, I'll take the applause. <laughs> and uh, today happens to be uh, 34 years of sobriety. And the reason that that's very important uh, in my story is that in 2013, I almost uh, cut my thumb off on my left hand. And I went into a process of some reconstructive surgery. Um, and <clears throat> I was left with some exposed nerve endings here, um, which makes uh, cold temperatures feel like kind of lava on my hand. And I was also getting some dental surgery. And I was being prescribed. Um, opioid-based painkillers, and I was very reluctant to be involved. And so this is when I became aware of alternatives. Uh, and I, um, it was recommended to me to try medical cannabis, which I did. And uh, as a result, a couple of things happened. One is that um, I have been a, a closet cigarette smoker uh, for about 18 years at that point, and um, <clears throat> I immediately stopped smoking. I was able to, I had been, this has been a big issue for me. Um, I also had uh, psoriasis on my right hand to the point where I had cracked skin that bled, and I would go into the office with white gloves on and steroidal creams on my hand. It was very embarrassing, you know, I couldn't extend my hand to shake. Um, <clears throat> All of that went away. I haven't had an outbreak of, of psoriasis uh, since uh, 2014. I also lost 15 pounds. And um, depression that I had been struggling with, uh, I began to have other palliative results that I hadn't expected. And I started to learn a lot more about the cabin, uh, you know, about cannabis. Uh, and it was a pretty, revelatory experience for me, and I sh confided in some coworkers at this time. And the reason that that is important is that <clears throat> uh, subsequently, um, let me just share that uh, public service uh, is really core to my identity. Um, I came to Washington in 1991 in pursuit of a, a public service career, um, and uh, joined federal service in 1999, uh, and I became a, a senior um, part of the executive management team uh, in, in the federal government back in the early, in the mid-2000s, uh, in 2006 to be specific. So I left the collective bargaining agreement uh, as part of the uh, bargaining class and became part of management. Uh, I built a very successful uh, career uh, and had a very uh, positive uh, role to play as part of the management team within, within the agency. <clears throat> what happened was in 2016, one of my coworkers um, reported to the inspector general that I was uh, selling marijuana, class one scheduled drug, to other federal government employees during work hours on government property. 
And those charges naturally open an investigation. And um, the reason I'm sharing this is because of the, the, the consequence. The, re the resulting consequences here were very, very profound for me. Um, and uh, through the course of the investigation, uh, I admitted to being in possession of a small amount of medical cannabis uh, in the presence of some other uh, federal employees. So um, they were interviewing people, and one of the interviewees uh, uh, stated that they had seen me in possession of, of medical cannabis in the past outside of work hours and uh, in a personal context. Uh, and I confessed to that fact. I stipulated to that fact. So to make a long story short, um, uh, I just did a review this morning of the EPA. There's my federal agency. <laughs> uh, but I did a review of the agency's um, inspector general reports. And uh, from 2012 through 2020, um, there were only three mentions of uh, marijuana-related investigation. Two of them, uh, one of them resulted in the person leaving federal service before the case was resolved. Uh, the other individual <coughs> um, was terminated. This is back in uh, 2015. Uh, my report showed up in the 2018, uh, and the first line of the report was none of the charges were substantiated. Um, so I, I feel confident sharing this story because this is all you know experiences that happened to me in the past, but uh, and it's part of the administrative record. And so now moving forward, um, the reason I, I, I find this story to be an important one to tell is that um, I did not ultimately wind up losing my, my job. I wanted to say a couple of quick things about my experience through the investigation and then wrap this up. But um, I found the investigators to be really, really fair-minded uh, and very professional. Um, their interests were in finding the facts, not to make a recommendation on to res you know, a remedy, but to document the facts of the situation. Uh, and the worst thing possible thing to do is to, is to be deceitful. Um, and the interest of the government, and I have a lot of empathy for this, being in management, um, the agencies and employers you know, do have an obligation to uh, protect the interests of the, of the organization and to <clears throat> ensure the efficiency of government operations. Um, and so at a time when these behaviors are illegal, you know, there's a presumption that if somebody's involved in illegal activity, they can be compromised uh, or it may indicate other issues. Uh, and so um, there is a, a certain, you know, understanding of why there was an original, you know, uh, set of policies to do this type of investigation. But the consequences uh, have been very, very profound. Um, I, uh, my relationship within the community of senior executive uh, officials has been permanently changed, obviously. And there are people within the federal family that will you know, never have any association with me as a result of this. Um, there's, of course, another whole cohort that just don't have any problem with it. It's not really that much of an issue. It's part of the zeitgeist within the society. And we are able then to switch to a conversation about performance uh, and to focus on um, maintaining performance of employees and to make sure that people are healthy um, and to you know, support employees. But this issue of just being associated with the issue and being vulnerable to an accusation like the one that I was um, a, a exposed to uh, and the kind of implications that has for my character uh, and my capacity to um, be an honorable member of the public service um, has, has really been uh, a, a significant, significant uh, detriment in many ways. And so um, I wanted to share that story because it's not always about termination. Um, I wound up uh, uh, having a three-day suspension. Um, the minimal recommended uh, disciplinary cause uh, or action 
for being in possession of a Schedule I narcotics would be five-day suspension to dismissal. That would be the range of options standardly available within um, public employment, uh, you know, uh, response. A reasonable response to management might be anywhere from a five-day suspension to um, <clears throat> dismissal. Um, but for me, you know, I, I petitioned as hard as I could for uh, mediation, for some type of alternative dispute resolution to the situation. Uh, where some of the extenuating circumstances would be considered pertaining to the fact this was not a, during work hours, a personal, uh, you know, private situation that came out and um, they declined uh, all, all of those in uh, my efforts to do those alternatives, but what they did was reduce the five-day suspension to a three-day suspension. So that is my story. and why I think it's really critical that employees are protected in their right to uh, engage fully in legal behavior outside of work hours and uh, to not have that be uh, something that can derail someone's career either through those informal social networks or through you know, a more official administrative actions like those that I faced. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, and we're so sorry that you went through that incredibly stressful and harmful experience for, for a plant that has improved your life so much. Uh, thanks for working to change it for other people and advance protections for workers. So on the issue of federal workers, as Blaine mentioned, D.C. has employment protections, but they can't include people that live in D.C. and the federal government as an employer. When Biden first became president, folks may have seen the news that he let go about five people because they had admitted he had previously used cannabis. So many other federal workers are also under this kind of cloud of possible termination for just being, in many cases, DC district or state legal cannabis consumers. So Blaine, if you can tell us what's being done at the federal level to change that. Yeah, so uh, in July, I believe of 2023, representatives Jamie Raskin and Nancy Mace introduced a bill called the Cure Act. Uh, the bill as introduced would essentially prohibit denial of security clearances for folks who have either used cannabis in the past or are currently using cannabis. Um, and it would also make it so they could not um, find somebody unsuitable for federal employment as a result of prior cannabis use or current cannabis use. Um, for those folks who don't know, most government jobs in the federal service sector, the civil service in particular, are covered positions under federal law, which means that agencies have like suitability requirements, some of which are really vague. Um, and often include use of illegal substances such as cannabis, which is illegal federally. Um, they held a markup in September of 2023 of the bill. Unfortunately, uh, James Comer, who's the chair of that committee, I think it's the Oversight and Accountability Committee, uh, scaled back the protections a little bit so it would only protect prior cannabis use, not current which I think is a huge mistake, obviously. Um, additionally, I, w I do want to note that it would not protect folks like Luke in the situations that he experienced, um, where there was no termination, but there was like an administrative penalty for either a false accusation about um, use or possession, or even if the, the accusations were, or allegations were correct that somebody was using, uh, it would not protect them from being suspended or otherwise penalized. Um, but it hasn't moved on to a floor vote yet, is my understanding, and I don't know when that will occur. So for now, unfortunately, federal employees do not have really anything in the way of protections for employment related to cannabis use. Um, they, they should, and I hope that the Congress moves quickly and efficiently before the end of the session to address it, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. So turning to the region, um, as mentioned, D.C. has employment protections. 
Virginia's governor, who had vetoed legal sales of cannabis, just signed a bill. He also vetoed two other good bills. Um, but he did sign a bill to expand a very limited uh, a medical cannabis uh, employment protection. So can you talk a little bit also, Blaine, about what Virginia's law does? Yes. So uh, I believe it was House Bill 149 is the law that the governor just signed into law. Um, it was approved by the assembly uh, this session. And what it does is it protects medical cannabis patients who are using cannabis oils pursuant to a recommendation from a practitioner like a doctor or a physician who is able to prescribe them cannabis for medicinal use. Um, it protects them from being fired or demoted or otherwise discriminated against in employment, but it only applies to that very narrow subset of users, um, which is really unfortunate because Virginia, even though they don't have a legal recreational market, they still do have a law that allows people to use and possess cannabis recreationally, small amounts. So those people are completely unprotected, as well as anybody who's not using cannabis oils, um, who is using it medicinally, but not using the oils. Thank you. Turning to Maryland, where I used to live for a while, um, the other jurisdiction in the region. That's where Luke lives. He's very involved in Maryland Normal. And there were two bills that were introduced to provide some employment protections, because right now it is the only one of DMV that has no employment protections for medical cannabis and no employment protections for adult use consumers. Uh, unfortunately, the bill, which had a, a hearing, about an hour and a half of really powerful testimony and also a lot of opposition, uh, did not even get a vote in committee in either the House or the Senate, which was really disappointing. And Luke, if you can share some of the stories that people shared and, and, and what lawmakers heard who ultimately failed to move on those bills. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interest in... <clears throat> Uh, Maryland about uh, whether or not special protections for uh, individuals who are consumers of cannabis, you know, need need some type of legislation to protect their rights and interests. So uh, <clears throat> it, it, there's a there's a strong debate uh, about uh, what the right next step is and whether or not uh, Maryland. The, the General Assembly is fairly conservative on this point. And so uh, we got a very strong run at passing uh, our leg you know, legislation this past year. I really appreciate uh, Marijuana Policy Project and the National Organization for, for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, both of whom sent um, uh, testimony and speakers from the national offices in, in support of what we were trying to do in Maryland. But you're right, it didn't didn't make it. So um, part of uh, what I wanted to just share is, is uh, wh why that is. Uh, and um, our uh, legislature tends to be very uh, cautious in, in <laughs> moving uh, anything having to do with cannabis. A and um, <clears throat> there was not sufficient arguments presented, I believe, that uh, the mere positive test itself uh, was being used as grounds for a removal. And so there was not adequate legislative attention to the suite of harms uh, that exist not just in terms of a dismissal action. So the question was raised, how many people in Maryland lost their job based on a positive test? And uh, those of us who were in support of this bill did not have a good, strong answer. Um, the testimonies that we heard uh, were very moving, but they were not moving from a, from, you know, from a legislative standpoint. So people were providing testimony about how, uh, somewhat similar to, to, to my own experience, the passion we feel for the chosen professions that we do, uh, whether we're firefighters, first responders, police officers, veterans who are <clears throat> uh, uh, transitioning into the private sector. And uh, all of those uh, uh, employment categories are filled with stories about people who find barriers 
to um, advancing their careers and their chosen path just because of the, the, the threat of this uh, loss of employment if they should get caught up in a test, a, a drug screening test. So um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't have a good uh, uh, answer for a question about um, will we achieve the bill next session, uh, but I do know that um, just sharing our stories uh, has not been enough. Uh, to convince people. Um, the, the legislators are very concerned that they're creating a special protected class of uh, employee that can show up to a, a job site uh, in a state of impairment and the employer won't have the ability to do anything about it. Um, and uh, even though that's not the basis for the legislation. Uh, uh, it's not the basis for the legislation. Um, it certainly uh, was a persuasive argument. Uh, so thanks for asking about it. Thank you for sharing. And now we're gonna take a pause from this panel because we're delighted to be joined by uh, the Congresswoman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're having engaging conversations about policy um, reform. Um, my name is Jessa Royer, and I'm with DC Justice Lab. Um, I'm a legal policy fellow, um, and we at DC Justice Lab, we're a team of policy experts, um, and we're a legal team researching, organizing, and advocating for large-scale changes to DC's criminal code. Um, and we develop smarter safety solutions that are evidence-driven, community-based, and racially just. Um, we also uh, we also aim to fully transform the district's approach to public safety and make it a national leader in, tra in justice reform. So I'm pleased to introduce our Congresswoman, Eleanor Holmes Norton, one of the most powerful women in DC. Um, she's a defender of more equal and racially just policies, a civil rights advocate, and the introducer of the recent Marijuana in Federally Assisted Housing Parity Act. Ms. Holmes Norton has worked tirelessly to safeguard the rights of those across the country who have been excluded or denied federally, uh, federal assistance because of their marijuana usage in jurisdictions where the use is locally legal. Um, Congresswoman, to um, advocate for us, who's continuously fighting for more fair and just laws. So I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak with you today about federal marijuana policies impacting the District of Columbia. While the American people support marijuana legislation and we continue to make progress on marijuana legislation in the states, Congress continues to block progress on marijuana legislation in the District of Columbia and nationally. It is past time for Congress to catch up with the American people and the states on marijuana. In addition, to working to remove the rider that prohibits DC from spending its local funds to commercialize adult use marijuana. I have been working to allow marijuana in public and other federally assisted housing. For several Congresses, I have introduced a bill that would allow marijuana in public and other federally assisted housing in compliance with marijuana laws, where the property is located and the Department of Housing and Urban Development rules on smoking cigarettes. I also previously wrote then HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge urging her to use her executive discretion not to enforce rules against marijuana in federal assistant housing in compliance with the marijuana laws of the state where the property is located. HUD rejected my request saying it did not have this authority. I disagree with HUD's interpretation of the law. Until the District of Columbia has statehood, 
Congress will control DC's local affairs. Since 2014, Congress has used its undemocratic power over DC to block DC from spending its local funds to commercialize adult use marijuana. DC has legalized the possession of adult use marijuana, but Congress has blocked DC from legalizing, taxing, uh, and regulating adult use sales. Congress recently finally finished the fiscal year 2024 appropriation bill. The original sen Senate bill would have allowed DC to commercialize adult use marijuana. However, President Biden and House Republicans opposed allowing DC to do so, and they prevailed in the final bill. I am deeply disappointed that President Biden, who strongly supports DC statehood, which would allow DC to enact its own policies without congressional interference, supports blocking DC from commercializing adult use marijuana. The president's recently released fiscal year 2025 budget would also prohibit DC from spending its local funds to commercialize adult use marijuana. I'm hopeful that Congress will remove uh, the rider that prohibits DC from commercializing adult use marijuana even before DC achieves statehood. But DC is also closer to statehood than ever before. The 690,000 residents of the District of Columbia, the majority of whom are black and brown, have all the obligations of citizenship, including paying t federal taxes, but are denied voting representation in Congress, and Congress has full control over DC's local affairs. DC statehood is my top priority in Congress. In the last two Congresses, we made historic progress on DC statehood. In 2020, the House passed my DC statehood bill, which was the first time in history either chamber of Congress had passed the DC statehood bill. The House passed it again in 2021. When I introduced the bill on the first day bills could be introduced this Congress, I did so with 165 original co-sponsors, which was the most original co-sponsors of any bill introduced that day. Since then, I have added more co-sponsors and we now have 206 co-sponsors. The Senate version of the bill sponsored by Senator Tom uh, Carper, was introduced this Congress with a record number of original co-sponsors, 43. It now has 46 co-sponsors. Instead of abusing its power over the District of Columbia by nullifying legislation enacted by the DC Council and prohibiting DC from commercializing adult use marijuana, Congress should adhere to democratic principles and pass my DC statehood bill. I would like to note a bill I have long introduced to give DC authority to grant clemency for DC crimes, including relating to marijuana. In the same manner, states grant clemency for state crimes. Currently, only the president has the authority to grant clemency for DC crimes. If we continue to fight, I believe full marijuana legalization in DC and at the federal level will in fact happen. Thank you for having me here today. Fortunate to have her address us in championing DC autonomy and DC statehood and cannabis justice. So, turning back to the issue of cannabis workers, uh, I want to talk about people working in the cannabis industry. For the first time in 2022, there was actually what was classified as an occupational death of a woman who had asthma 
um, that they said was related to working in the cannabis, that the attack was exacerbated by ground cannabis. And Adam, I wanted you to talk a bit about the existing laws to protect workers from occupational hazards, which of course don't exist at all in the illicit market, but what if more is needed and what already exists to protect workers? So, <clears throat> gladly, uh, first piece. So the one worker she talked about was in Massachusetts, and that happened. But there have been so many more that don't always rise to the level that people notice. You have workers in Oregon who were locked in to grow by the employer to, to grow cannabis for and help manu and process it. You have a worker in Illinois that also died of having difficulty breathing. You had, in March 27th, right here in DC, a cannabis worker at a dispensary was shot and killed. Like, job safety is something folks don't think about in this industry, but there's cannabis, when it's processed, it's done through chemical work. And the trainings that do not occur in the industry has led to a lot of unsafe conditions. So traditionally, in most jobs, there are OSHA inspections. So what we've worked out with different states, so in California, there's Cal OSHA. We've started trainings where workers have to have, we passed the legislation where people have to have a Cal OSHA certificate, where you have to understand training, how to properly do it. But now you have to make sure employers are living up to it. That's where the, having the union comes in. And we're trying to get OSHA inspections to happen across all of the industry, because OSHA is a federal standard, but cannabis is federally not regulated. So this becomes a game that you play with the employers, where you want, you want to force them to hold up all these standards. But what the union's doing is going around to states to try and pass more protections for workers. But the protections are only one part of it. You know, I'm going to keep harping on the fact that unionization matters, because if you can have all the laws in the world, but workers have to feel comfortable reporting their employers. And that's part of what the unionization is, because in, in some of these work facilities, you know that the dust is being, the cannabis is being ground up and the dust is in the air. And you might think to yourself, hey, the employer should provide us with masks. And the employer knows that they should, but you don't feel comfortable because you know, if I go up and say, hey, you should be providing me with a mask, the next thing you can say, I'm fired. Because I'm a quote unquote troublemaker. And the person gets terminated. And the, protect, the best protection for that is, I can go to you and say, hey, you need to buy a safety protection. You can't tell me because I'm represented by a union, I'm fired. And the union can then take your story and advocate to elected officials that you need to pass these laws. Because for a lot of elected officials, I joke that I'm old, but you know, they make me, they don't understand cannabis. They look at it and say, oh, it's just somebody rolling up a paper. They're not thinking about the work that goes to process it. So when you tell them, hey, someone died because of the dust, they're like, the dust, they don't understand that. So part of our job as a union is to educate everyone in this because for years people don't, you know, cannabis to them is you're rolling up a joint, that's it. They're not thinking about the oils, the tinctures, the gummies, how all of that is made. To them, it's just, at best, it's someone baking some brownies and someone rolling. Those are the two forms that they know it. But these are high industrial processes. And that's the worker's avenue. The thing that we're missing in this is the consumer avenue. If, as a consumer, you want to make sure workers feel comfortable to report unsafe conditions, not just for them, but for you. Because to ex do all these extractions, you're adding different levels of chemicals. And workers might see the wrong mixture happen, but they don't say anything because they don't feel safe. So what we're working around the whole industry is, and I know the industry hates this word, but making sure there are good regulations and that workers feel safe accessing them. I, I want to be clear, good regulation, not burdensome regulations, because there's a difference in both. You can, and we want to make sure that it's easy for workers to follow these regulations, but the regulations also protect workers and consumers. 
Thank you. So speaking of unionization, how prevalent is unionization in the cannabis industry? So UFCW has been organizing, through our Cannabis Workers Rising campaign, been organizing workers since it started almost 20, almost close, close to 20 years ago. Um, and it's prevalent and we are on the uptick. It's a, all the puns in the world, it's a growth industry um, for the industry and for us. Um, but we, most of, in every state where cannabis is legal, UFCW has organized in one. Um, we, you know, 420 is coming up, as we all know, and I can tell you that this week we had six elections around the country, um, and if my team knows not to lie to their boss, we're going to win all six of them. <laughs> uh, and that's in states from non-friendly, non-union friendly states such as Arizona to union friendly states such as um, New York, New Jersey. It's like I can really say, proudly say that we represent workers in every state that has some form of can cannabis and the workers, these groups of workers are different than everyone else. You know, you traditionally get workers who are like, oh, I don't like it, I don't want it. These workers are like, wait, it makes sense. It's like, I don't wanna say it's, it's not easy, but it's workers who when you tell them this is why you need a union, they get it instantly. They understand, hey, this is so that the boss has to pay me. He can't, you know, you, we've run into employers who will tell everyone, oh, we don't need a union, I'll pay you well, I'll take care of you. But these workers are like, yeah, been there, heard, done that before. I, like, this is for me, I'm doing this for me. And that's been the great part of it, that we are just helping guide them and shape, like, shape a contract show them how to do the relationship, but you know, I know, our best organizers in the industry has been workers themselves. They, you know, we, we hire them to help us organize. So if we organize your shop, there could be two people there that we're saying, hey, we want you to come work for us and help us talk to other workers, or we want you to come out. I'm sorry, I'm loving it because it's been so much fun. You know, it's like I'm almost 50 and these workers make me feel good. 50's the new 30 in cannabis. Uh, <laughs> everybody agrees, right? Yeah, I know that. See, yes, everyone with Greg agrees. Um, but no, they made me feel young and because they get it. So much for union organizers where we're always trying to convince people, but in these work, you don't have to convince and that's what's great about it, and that's what makes us want to keep fighting in it. Thank you. Sorry. No, great. Um, so turning back to the issue of cannabis consumers and their rights not to get fired just for testing positive for using cannabis 30 days ago or so, in the Maryland debate, there was a lot of opposition, which is probably why it died from the business community. There was the Chamber of Commerce was opposed, and a lot of folks came up and claimed that there would be issues with we won't be able to get insurance anymore, there will be lawsuits, claiming that there might still be people impaired, even though, of course, testing positive for metabolites in your urine does not in any way mean that you're impaired. So I wanted to ask you, Blaine, because DC you know, protected employees a few years ago. Has the sky fallen? Are employers, are you hearing of all these problems that employers can't get insurance? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, <laughs> haven't heard of any issues, to be frank. Um, we were kind of lucky in how everything played out, in part because we had a chamber of commerce that actually wasn't in opposition and pretty sympathetic. Um, they had some concerns about the safety sensitive job sort of positions and how that would apply to protections in the bill, but overall, like, um, employers were pretty, like, satisfied with how everything shook out, and I haven't heard of any major issues whatsoever about the bill or its implementation or people losing insurance or not being able to find work. So I think so far so good. Obviously, it's only been like a little over a year now since it's actually been implemented. So time will tell if that continues. But um, yeah, I, I haven't heard any major concerns. And I don't know where that stuff come for, comes from, to be frank. Well, that's very reassuring. We'll have to put you in touch with Chair Wilson in Maryland. Happy to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so turning back to uh, Maryland for a minute. 
and the, the debate around some employers claiming that they can't do this because they need to be able to tell if a person's used marijuana so they can fire them because what if there's a crash? Uh, Luke, can you talk about if you're familiar with anything that exists short of actually, you know, testing somebody's urine for cannabis to keep workplaces safe? You know, um, Yes, I, I am very excited. Uh, I've had an opportunity in my work with the Maryland State Chapter of Normal uh, to work with an organization called the Chesapeake Region Sa Regional Safety Council. And the Chesapeake Regional Safety Council um, provides training for uh, various professions in uh, how to perform safely. And one of the uh, trainings they provide we, is called the Green Labs, and this is in uh, cannabis impairment detection. And so <clears throat> for a number of years, the Chesapeake Region Safety Council has been running these Green Labs to train drug impairment uh, detection uh, professionals for the, for the police department, but in the past couple of years, uh, we've started working directly with employers, a lot more um, uh, directly uh, trying to uh, imbue a recognition that cannabis consumption does not equal impairment, that it may have different effects for different people. And <clears throat> uh, cannabis consumption alone is not uh, going to be sustainable, you know, ultimately as grounds for dismissal unless it's uh, documented uh, uh, issues regarding performance and impairment. So there are quite a number of non, uh, um, you know, of, of tests that are getting to issues of impairment that are not based on a drug screening, uh, urinalysis, or some type of uh, bio, you know, bio, uh, biomarker. Uh, and so we heard a lot of evidence pre uh, presented in our General Assembly uh, during the bill hearings this year. And uh, the, the, the fact is, is that the evidence of uh, alternative ways for employers to identify uh, <clears throat> concerns with an employee's, potential concerns with an employee's performance, it just was not persuasive legislatively. Uh, and so they're still, uh, habitually looking for a, if I'm an employer, what's the evidence I can use to fire somebody? Uh, and Maryland is one of these um, sort of at-will employment states. And so I would turn to some of our other uh, employment law uh, people here to talk about what that exactly means. But um, thanks for asking the question, because I think that, uh, you know, some of the issues here is that the employing, the employer community really does require a lot of education. Uh, and to get away from sort of a standard approach that we use with alcohol, which is very scientifically supportable that certain blood levels correlate with impairment, uh, those correlations don't exist with cannabis, and it's very cognitively difficult for people to make that switch, to move away from just consumption observations and move on to impairment observations and how to document those well. So um, that's what I would uh, offer up with that. There is a lot of work being done, and hopefully our legislators will listen. Thank you, Luke. So I want to open it up for any audience questions. Um, I have somebody who wants to, well, just raise your hand if you have a question, and I'm not sure if there's somebody that can carry a mic to you. If not, maybe I'll do it myself. Go ahead. Um, I'm not a okay. I lived in California. I was a, I'm from here, but I moved out of California. I was a medical marijuana patient. Um, came back to D.C., and then I became a medical marijuana patient here for the first time. But when I was there, living in Palm Springs, I realized how conservative, Southern, I guess Southern California, at least where I was, was about cannabis consumption. And I did not expect that. Um, there was such a stigma at the, at the hospital, <laughs> at the hospital where I worked, where we were trying to figure out, you know, treat people um, for wellness in Palm Springs. Um, and there was such a stigma around cannabis. Um, so I wanted to know from you all, anybody, um, what's the highest, no point that you've seen of 
fight against uh, someone being fired or not considered, taken out of consideration. Uh, as we see here in DC, you have to get a conditional offer now and then they test you. What's the highest uh, protest that you've seen um, against any type of uh, either firing or not no longer being considered for position? Anybody? You know, I don't have a great answer. It's a great question. For those who might not have heard, the question pertains to uh, cases where employees have challenged their dismissal. And are there any cases that have garnered a lot of attention, visibility, and uh, risen to a significant level of attention and impact? Um, <clears throat> I don't have a good answer for that question, but I do know that uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, attention being paid to the hiring and onboarding of personnel under the Biden-Harris administration. And uh, many uh, very well-qualified uh, professionals uh, felt that they were denied employment opportunities in the Biden-Harris administration because they had uh, admitted on their applications that, that they had consumed cannabis in the past. So um, I do know that that was a very high level uh, awareness and point of uh, uh, discussion. I'll, even though I'm a moderator, I'll go ahead and chime in a little bit too. Um, we've certainly seen litigation in some cases, mostly in the context of medical cannabis. There was somebody who was fired in California who was a medical cannabis patient who sued, I think it went to the state Supreme Court maybe about a decade ago, and they lost and said the legislature could provide protections if they wanted to, but existing law doesn't provide for those. However, in the last two years, the California legislature actually did pass employment protections, and it's broader than some of the states. It I believe you can't be fired for things like admitting to prior use. Um, it also includes that you can't be fired for non-psychoactive metabolites, so like the urine test, but if they actually had, they have a breath test for active THC, it wouldn't necessarily apply to that. But it's one of the broader employment protections. There is an exception for a couple of specific, like in DC, uh, types of jobs, and I believe construction workers is one of those exceptions. But there have definitely been lawsuits, most of the cases with lawsuits, um, it used to be that most of them had failed, they're mostly in the context of medical cannabis, but there have been a couple of states recently where the legislature didn't write in cannabis-specific medical ca cannabis protections. However, an existing like state counterpart to the ADA, a fair housing law, was interpreted as including people with disabilities not being able to be fired for medical cannabis. So Massachusetts is one of those states. So definitely litigation is a possibility in trying to just change the law in general too. Um, do you mind giving her your mic? Do we have a mic carrier? Okay, we have a mic coming to you. I'm gonna preface my question by saying that um, Suing and litigation is absolutely a very emotional journey to go down. Um, in the cannabis industry, it's even more traumatic. Uh, my name is Mary Jane Oatman, and I serve as the executive director of the indigenous cannabis industry. In 2017, myself and a collective group of female bud tenders in the Washington I-502 industry found ourselves in the height of the Me Too era. Um, I found myself in a whistleblower situation, um, terminated for disclosing and standing up for my fellow colleagues. And the hardest part was finding an attorney that would take a case. I looked high and low. Um, the judge that was overseeing our case actually was dismissed uh, for sexual battery himself in his county. The question that I have because, uh, because of the journey is I just went to the um, uh, Washington Employment Lawyers uh, website and was just trying to find a benevolent lawyer that would take my case pro bono. Or uh, uh, I guess what I want to know is around data. Are there any state-by-state -state efforts to collect the data that is um, needed on specific areas of litigation in, in regards to uh, worker safety. I, like I said, whistleblower situation around worker safety, worker protections, and I got my right to sue letter from the Washington Department of Labor and Safety, I believe, 
um, but it was actually a discrimination case. It was a funky case, and like I said, I would I would not do it all over again, even though I successfully um, uh, su successfully mediated a near six-figure settlement. That's how egregious these guys were. And so definitely hitting them in the pocketbook is a form of action. But are there is there any data being collected on the number of cases that this is happening to? Because like I said, me and six other women in one store. So um, simple sad answer is no. And part of that is because cannabis is still federally legal. Like there isn't even wage data. There's no real, there's no central repository of any data because of the federal limitations on it. Because usually the federal government starts it out in collecting a lot of data, BLS, all these other, and then people build on it from there. But without that, I'm sorry, there, like there really isn't. So incidents like yours where it's normally categorized in other industries doesn't exist because the feds haven't started the groundwork for other people to build on. Orchid, Orchid has some strong language. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah different states have their own specific laws of where they collect it, but even in, in cannabis, they have to write it specifically for that as they do it. Uh, thank you for that great question. Um, <clears throat> I spent thousands of dollars on an attorney through my, uh, in, you know, interviews and the stuff that happened. And I think that quantifying these costs, the irony and the last thing I wanted to share is that the, the goals of the government, that, you know, here are like the efficiency of government. That's the language that's used and that's what we say the interests of the government are. And when I think about the loss of efficiency, in the operation as a result of some of these things, where people who are fully capable of making contributions are not able to, uh, or they're ostracized somehow and therefore not able to make the full contribution. There's a lot of inefficiencies that happen, and uh, thank you for the work you guys are doing to change it. Well, unfortunately, we're about at time, but thank you so much to the panelists for sharing for all of your work for workers and for cannabis justice. Um, some of this is a reminder that we need descheduling, we need federal legalization. Some of this discrimination would be fixed by it being legal, at least for medical patients. Others wouldn't, even with legalization. We still need to do things like make sure that employees can't be fired for testing positive. Things like the congressman was talking about to make sure people can't be kicked out of HUD housing for using cannabis, to make sure people's children aren't taken away for cannabis. There are so many other areas of cannabis justice that the fight continues even in legalization states and even after federal legalization. So thank you all for being here. Um, next on the schedule, there's a little bit of a break before the next panel. Thank you all.
2024 National Cannabis Policy Summit. I'm sure sorry I can't be with you in person, but with the Senate's busy schedule, but I am sure with you in spirit. And thanks to your wonderful founder and executive producer, Caroline Phillips, for bringing everyone together today. And thanks to all of you, the advocates, for helping inform our work in Congress and move our country closer to federal legalization. I was honored to receive the Changemaker Award during last year's summit, and I'm here to say that my commitment to ending federal prohibition on cannabis remains as strong as ever. I'm proud to be the first Senate Majority Leader ever to call for the legalization of cannabis across the country. And as many of you know, cannabis reform is an issue I've cared about and have been working hard on for years. And as many of you know, momentum is now in our favor. Today, hundreds of millions of Americans live in states red and blue where cannabis has been legalized in some way. New surveys show 70% of Americans support legalization, 70%, that's just about everybody. And people in states like Ohio, a conservative red state, voted in favor of legalization last November. So now is the time to make cannabis reform a law and bring justice to Americans who lives, whose lives were ruined by the war on drugs. Here in Congress, we're making some good progress. Last year, we reported the Safer Banking Act, and out of committee, it came out of committee with strong bipartisan support. The bill will help cannabis businesses operate more efficiently, more safely, and more transparently. And I remain committed to including the HOPE Act in this bill to expunge the records for cannabis offenses, something I've advocated for years. We see so many young people because of the overcriminalization of marijuana who have long criminal records and they have trouble reestablishing their jobs. Expungement's going to go a long way to rectifying that injustice. I want you to know I'll keep working with my colleagues to get Safer Banking and the HOPE Act over the finish line. And of course, that's not all. I have more exciting news to share. This month, along with Senators Booker and Wyden, and my colleagues, we will be introducing the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act, which fully deschedules cannabis at the federal level. Cannabis legalization has proven successful at the state level. It's high time that Congress catches up with the rest of the country. Of course, we know none of this is easy, especially in divided government. We need all of you to continue reaching out to members, especially Republican members, so we can make cannabis reform a reality. So thanks again, and I look forward to working with you all to bring federal cannabis policy into the 21st century. Alrighty. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for spending this time with us. And today we're going to be talking about cannabis and immigration reform. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart as I am an immigrant of this country where I originally hail from Ecuador. I gained my citizenship status when I was eight years old, and that is one of the reasons why I can sit here holding this microphone today. So. I would like each of the panelists to give a brief introduction about themselves before we begin, and we're gonna start with Jasmine. Hi everybody, I'm Jasmine Tyler. I am the Executive Director of the Justice Policy Institute, and it is my pleasure to be here with you all because I have been working on the liberalization of marijuana laws for almost two decades now. Um, my, thank you very much. My work around um, the cannabis movement really started and grew out of my work to end the crack uh, sentencing disparity, which you all may know, um, used to uh, schedule, uh, sentence individuals 100 times more harshly for crack cocaine than powder cocaine. And after we were successful in eliminating the first mandatory minimum at the federal level for simple possession and significantly reforming that law, I shifted my focus onto the uh, racially disparate impact of marijuana and 
enforcement on black and brown communities. So I have helped to usher in, really, um, the racial justice and social justice imperative that many of you are here representing now. I'm so excited to see how the movement has grown and shifted and diversified um, because back when I started doing this work, the, the movement was very white and um, the imperative was really a libertarian imperative um, just to reduce the role of government interference in our lives. But for many of us from communities who have been directly impacted by the war on drugs, um, you know, I knew firsthand that um, our community members were suffering the brunt of marijuana enforcement and the long-term consequences of even just a simple marijuana arrest. So that's how I come to be here. Um, I feel like an OG, but I'm really just a mid-G. John and I are mid-Gs. We're not OGs. We know the OGs. We're mid-Gs. Um, but it's great to see so many folks here, um, to know people are paying attention also from um, their screens, um, wherever they may be, and also that folks will be here having a, um, an impactful lobby day to um, really try to move and shift Congress to pass some of the most progressive bills we've ever seen. I, I can tell you that I never thought I would hear Chuck Schumer give the message that he just gave, and I'm so enthusiastic about having him join us in this fight. Hi, everyone. My name's Marie Mark. I'm the executive director of the Immigrant Defense Project. Um, I have, as an immigration attorney, represented immigrants convicted of crimes related to marijuana activity. I've represented those people in deportation proceedings and seen the way in which this intersection, the criminalization aspect of this for immigrants has an outsized impact. The Immigrant Defense Project works at this intersection of the criminal law and immigration law, and we work to try and make those immigration laws more fair and more just for immigrants and try and and the criminalization of immigrants that happens related to marijuana prohibition, related to all kinds of drug offenses, and beyond drugs. Thanks, good afternoon everyone. My name is John Welsh. I'm the Director for Drug Policy in the Andes at the Washington Office on Latin America, WOLA. We're a nonprofit uh, research and advocacy group focused on human rights and social justice towards Latin America especially with respect to U.S. policy. And the war on drugs has been a staple of U.S. policy, especially towards Latin America for decades. We've been pushing back, um, fighting against prohibition, fighting against the drug war, which has stigmatized, criminalized vast swaths of Latin America, but also been a true war um, with conflict, violence, bloodshed, and untold number of deaths. The U.S. has encouraged and supported a lot of that. The U.S. is also in a very changing space, primarily and especially because of cannabis reform. So I see some big opportunities for the United States to play a positive rather than a negative role, um, in, especially because of the cannabis space. So I'm delighted to be here today. Yeah, so I think the, th the sh kind of short answer is that as long as marijuana remains a federally controlled substance, it will have negative impacts on immigrants, right? And that's because immigration law is federal, right? And regardless of what the states do, the 
federal government uses the fact that marijuana is prohibited to punish immigrants doubly after they are caught up in state criminalized schemes. Um, sometimes people kind of like balk when I talk about exactly what those immigration impacts are because they are shockingly harsh. Offenses such as possession can result in deportation, loss of any kind of status. They can make someone unable to regularize their status, so that's unable to get residency, unable to become a US citizen. And marijuana-related crimes can be, regardless of how they're actually classified at the state level, can be considered what are under immigration law called aggravated felonies. It's a little bit of a misnomer. It includes misdemeanors. It can include things that are even less than misdemeanors under federal law. There is no requirement that there is any aggravating circumstances to those offenses. However, if an offense is deemed an aggravated felony, it means that that person will be subject to mandatory deportation, mandatory immigration detention while their case is pending and they're awaiting being physically removed from the country. And even if they are able to prove a persecution-based claim, like asylum, they will be ineligible to remain in the United States or ever return, right? And so those are extremely, extremely harsh consequences for things that right now we're seeing people make money off of, right? We're seeing that this has, is not only a medical market, it's a recreational market, but at the same time, families are being torn apart. People are being ripped from communities that they've been part of for years. Um, and I think one of the things that we have to remember when we think about this um, intersection is that, and I'll talk about it because I think I'm going to get the questions, is that in many ways, what states do can only solve part of the problem there. Thank you, and thank you for shedding light on a lot of these harsh penalties because perhaps a lot of folks you know, in the crowd, and I know even myself, did not even understand the extent to which they can be criminalized, deported, held in detention, et cetera. And so what does it mean, though, for immigrants and non-citizens who reside in states where cannabis is legal, and if they wanted to participate, can they or can they not? Yeah, so that second question is a very difficult question, so I'll start with the first one. What does this mean for immigrants who reside in legalized states? Um, the number one impact that legalization has had is in cutting off the pipeline between people getting arrested for a marijuana-related activity and ending up in a deportation proceeding. Right? And because of the way immigration law works, those arrests don't necessarily have to result in convictions to push someone into the deportation system. The fact of an arrest alone for people who are undocumented in many parts of the country results in them being also arrested by ICE, detained, and face deportation. Right? And so legalization, because it creates legal activity that police should not and are not supposed to be stopping people and arresting people for, helps to cut that pipeline that's so damaging, right? But um, I think most legalization uh, schemes don't fix the whole problem, right? Because just because my conviction for marijuana-related activity is no longer a crime in my state doesn't mean that the fact of that conviction can't still be used to deport me. I don't have a defense when I go into immigration court, oh, that, that activity is legal in my state now, right? That's not a defense. And even more than that, in many states that have expunged convictions, the expungement is not a defense to deportation, right? And so legalization by itself doesn't protect many people who have prior contacts. In addition, the second question around kind of what's, what's okay for an immigrant to do, right? It's a really complicated question. Um, for for most people, the thing that they're concerned about are the convictions, right? And so legalization fixes that. 
But under the immigration law, there are also conduct-based bars for immigrants that don't require a conviction, right? Individuals who work in a legalized market can face a, face a conduct-based bar. We've seen people who are not even licensees who provide services to marijuana businesses face conduct-based bars. Individuals who have um, evidence on their social media of marijuana use face conduct-based bars. And for people who, um, even people who have, they've gone through this whole system, there is a question on almost every single immigration application. Have you ever committed a crime for which you were not arrested? That question ends up tripping people, right? Because as we said, marijuana is still considered a crime at the federal level. And so really we see that even people in legalized, in states with legalized markets are at risk of deportation, detention, exile because of federal uh, prohibition. And that's really important to highlight because I know a lot of times as advocates, we are encouraging everybody to come out, advocate, get out from behind the shadows, come protest with us, get on your social media, come rah, 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 you know, with us. But perhaps without taking into consideration the implications of asking the immigrant community to do so, which can also lead, it seems, to a bit of inclusion of them from the conversation because of the fear of all of these repercussions that they could face. So that's something I think we must all be mindful of is when we are speaking, that perhaps it's not a matter of they didn't want to show up, but perhaps that could implicate their ability to reside in this country. Interesting. And people come and they migrate for various reasons to the United States, right? And so, Jasmine, this question's for you. So what is the relationship between drug prohibition and the war on drugs and migration patterns to the US that we should all know? Wow, I mean, um, I, I think I'm gonna start with the title of this panel, right? Which was called Gateway Drug, I think, Immigration and Marijuana. And, uh, you know, I really wanna make sure, hi, Keith. <laughs> Um, I just want to have everybody understand, right, that we have for so long had indoctrinated in us that marijuana is the gateway drug, right? And the reality is that marijuana is the gateway to the criminal legal system or to deportation um, related to your immigration status. And that is the real gateway component of marijuana. And even one of our other longtime champions on marijuana policy uh, and, and drug policy, uh, Congressman Bobby Scott, has said, you know, more people started on milk that have gone on to use other drugs, right, than maybe on marijuana. And so we don't see a war on milk, right? But w when we think about the consequences or the cascade of impact and um, uh, negative consequences that marijuana policy has, it really is this, right? It's this gateway into othering and into being locked out of mainstream American American society, which of course incorporates um, extreme racial capitalism and um, you know a purported democratic process, and people are literally cleaved out of participation in these things just by, again, as Marie said, the arrest. In so many other issues of crime or convictions, we're talking about just that, the conviction, right? Um, a, a legal system and a set of fact finders doing just that, deciding on the outcome of some, some facts before them. But in an arrest, we know that it's just that law officer's efforts. And we know that law enforcement isn't always um, 
acting with the community's best interests. Um, and that's a very nice way of saying it, right? Especially when we talk about drug law enforcement in the last 50 years. Um, m many of us would conclude that it's a legal lynching program. But um, the fact that law enforcement could, before the stop and frisk law in New York was repealed, could stop and frisk and arrest more people than seats in Yankee Stadium every year, despite marijuana being decriminalized in that state, tells you all you need to know about the way we believe marijuana can purge people of color from the country, from their democratic processes. Um, and it's important, I think, to get back to, to some of your question, too, to think about how these migration patterns have been created or how we've driven individuals. And I'm definitely going to let John come in because he has the expertise in um, South and Central America in terms of US foreign policy. but. It's just that, the same um, war on black communities, anti-war movement communities, women's liberation communities that we have experienced in the United States since the 70s, right, is the same undermining that's been going on in our foreign policy, undermining sovereign nations, people from determining their own political fates, right? And going after the dreaded C word, right? Communism and socialism in other countries. And so um, the destabilization that we wrought abroad is very much what is contributing to individuals' need to migrate to the United States now, because in those countries, Governance has been eroded, public safety has been eroded, and there is a sense of economic challenge for individuals as well to live the normal lives that they would want to live in their home countries. And I think it's important for all of us to also understand the extreme conditions that it takes for individuals to flee, right? We see this around the globe, but yet somehow we want to discredit what happens at our southern border from being just that, human rights rights crises um, and migratory crises. And that actually leads me perfectly into the next question as to how the drug war has influenced border politics at the southern border. And question for both you and John. Sure, I'll just kick it off and then I'll hand it over because, you know, I think one of the remaining um, tools in the 21st century of like colorblindness or, you know, the move forward in social justice um, has been to still use drugs and the pretense of drugs as a scapegoat for both parties to um, harken back to knee jerk, draconian, uh, you know, uh, excessive punishment structures, and that is, you know, whether it's for marijuana or whether it's for fentanyl, right? And again, if we had a more comprehensive drug policy regime that looked at use in the United States driving the manufacture around the globe, then we would be able to better calibrate to our own individual citizens' needs. But because we use it as an othering tool, we are able to live in states like Texas, where Governor Abbott has used migration as um, a scapegoat for continued narco-trafficking or, or drug terrorism, and that, again, is just not the case. And so you have not just, though, these states who are acting um, in, in Republican states, red states, but it's also the federal government, right? I mean, in Texas, you might be aware of the buoys in the water um, where, and there have been lawsuits about those and injunctions, and you might have heard about the excessive penalties that were passed during last special session in um, December that would have created a mandatory minimum of 10 years uh, for driving in a car with mixed status people, for instance. But 
It's also the federal government that's there, and it is the Biden administration's enforcement of immigration and the detention of migrants that is to blame as well. The administration has been saying for a long time they wanted to be different, they wanted to be better on immigration, they promised to reduce the use of private prisons, and they've done that in the criminal justice context, but not for immigration detention. And they had been calling for less money, but in a turn of events have just recently signed 3.4 billion, with a B, for immigration just detention. And we're holding a, just over 4,100 people, 41,000, I'm sorry, people a year in immigrant detention in the United States. I mean, a day, any day. Let me get this right. You got it? You good with me, in, in, interpreter? Okay. <laughs> 41,000 a day on average. Okay, we're good. Because these are big numbers and we've got to change how we're doing it. And it's incumbent on both parties to come to the table. But I'm going to let John cook now. <laughs> Jasmine is a tough act to follow. Um, i just make a couple of points in this respect. One, um, if you think about Texas and putting razor wire and buoys in, in the water, um, and then think about what people are fleeing from, what they're trying to leave behind is to save their lives. They're not gonna be deterred by that last bump in the road, given all that they've already put themselves through, all the hazards that they faced. And I think it's important to understand then, one of the big reasons for that is, I don't wanna overgeneralize, but within Latin America, insecurity and the feeling of insecurity is on the rise in large part because of the dynamics put in play by drug prohibition and the enormous revenues that prohibition for s something that's a relatively easy and straightforward business brings to those who are willing to operate outside the law, right? And operating outside the law, using your vast resources to ensure that you have a lot of weapons and are able to intimidate, corrupt, and infiltrate government agencies and institutions leaves, as Jasmine said, governance fragile and eroding and unclear who, if anyone, people at risk can turn to. The police? Maybe not. The military? Maybe not. So there's a good reasons to why people want to flee and it's hard to imagine an obstacle at the very end deterring them from doing that. So people are going to continue to come. And I think we need to recognize, and this goes beyond cannabis, the role of prohibition. We, we often talk about the fight, we fight drug trafficking. The reality is that prohibition is constant nourishment for drug trafficking networks, constant and continuous and lucrative. And at best, enforcement picks off one or the other. Um, but certainly our underlying policy encourages drug trafficking. And in the sense of in, enforcement against that spreads it around more and more in the region, bringing insecurity, violence, and fear. And I think that's something that we need to understand from the United States, and this is why moving in the direction of ca cannabis legalization and regulation is so important, because it breaks that mold. It introduces a new conversation about drug prohibition overall, which has really been a catastrophe, not just for the United States, but for the world, and in particular for Latin America. So then when we, when we take that view, and then we see what some of the proposals are in the United States that are melding immigration and how that is presented as a threat, and drug smuggling, that Texas is actually claiming that drug smuggling and immigration constitute an invasion into the United States, which should enable Texas or any other state to take proper measures means, well, we're gonna invade Mexico. So it sounds ludicrous because it is, but there are proposals already being made that we should fire missiles, we should send special forces, we should do what we need to do to dismantle the cartels. Beyond launching an un unprovoked attack against our largest trading partner, which seems silly, <laughs> it would do nothing actually worse than nothing in terms of preventing what the, the 
the people who are making these proposals want, which is to stop fentanyl from crossing our borders. All right? It would make cooperation more difficult, if not impossible, and it would probably proliferate access and, and smuggling of drugs like fentanyl. So we need to start connecting these dots and push back against those draconian proposals because depending on who's in office, um, they might be taken up. Thank you for that. And so we've now discussed you know, a few reasons why folks would migrate to the United States, the risks that they put on their lives, the lives of their children to get here just so at the finish line they don't have the understanding that the U.S. has just invested $3.4 billion with a B yep. to ensure that they do not come into this country, right? And so with all of that being said, Marie, this question's to you then. Two questions, actually. Will the rescheduling of cannabis change the predicament of immigrants to get involved in the cannabis industry? And if not rescheduling, will descheduling help them? So the very simple answer is rescheduling, as I said to one of my colleagues the other day, for immigrants is garbage. It doesn't help. Um, it has very few, if any, impacts on the criminalization. It does not change any of those consequences that I talked about, deportation, detention, exile, right? Um, descheduling, completely taking marijuana off of the schedules, does have some impacts that are similar to the um, impacts of just legalizing marijuana at the state level. It helps us break that chain, right? But it doesn't actually go far enough to correct the harms that we are hearing have been time and time again visited upon black and brown immigrants in this country, right? So even descheduling doesn't help people who have prior convictions. Right? It doesn't, um, it, it, sorry, it doesn't help people who are in states where marijuana is still criminalized, right? And that those convictions can still carry immigration consequences that are apart from the uh, connection of federal uh, prohibition. Um, and I think. The, one, the other thing I want to just say is that um, it's all a choice, right? The president, President Biden has said, okay, I, wa I want to fix this. I've done these pardons. But when we look at the impact on immigrants, he's done very little to nothing, right? And the choice to say, I, I'm proposing rescheduling and you should be happy with that is an insult. You know... I just, yes. I think it's important to just call it what it is. It's like the Biden administration is really doing the least that they can um, and trying to get the most traction out of it as possible, right? And it, it just doesn't make sense. Like the math ain't mathin because we know right, the, even Chuck Schumer told us, right, 70% of voters are, are there. They're, they're ready to do these things. There, there are no backlash. In fact, there's only sort of benefit to come with um, further thinking through what kind of equitable taxing and, um, uh, you know, systems, opportunities there are for infrastructure and, and jobs. Um, and, and it's important to remember that just tinkering with the schedule is really just that. It's just tinkering. It doesn't provide any significant relief to black or brown community members, whether they have citizenship or have a different, um, you know, status, thank you. And it is these other consequences of marijuana prohibition that exist around employment, in housing, in legal statuses that will remain in place even with just descheduling. And descheduling, please understand, is really the best approach to 
solving the question at the federal level, but it still means that the Department of Homeland Security has to change policies and practices within. There are administrative remedies that will still have to, have to be promulgated in order to alleviate these barriers or these automatic um, push out immigration, immigration consequences that um, trigger deportation. That's what I was trying to say, automatic deportations, right? And so um, it, if not descheduling, Schedule 3 really does nothing. It doesn't do anything for the immigrant community. It really doesn't do much for the black community either. Yeah, so we're in the thick of that conversation right now, right? The rescheduling versus descheduling. But let's take this a bit on a more macro level jaunt. So I'm gonna preface this with, I recently moved back to my native country, Ecuador, to get back to my native roots and see what's going on over there. And I've been living there for three months and I've been meeting with a lot of different cannabis advocates who have been in part of this movement now for 14 years in Ecuador. Um, and I don't know if you guys all know, but Ecuador is going through a bit of a, a tough time right now. And the conversations that I have with them when they talk to me about the US, as they say, you did this, you guys did this, you guys set the blueprint, you were the architect behind this, our country adopted similar policing, similar militarization, the US has aided in more policing, aided in bringing more military here, and now we are in the middle of a crazy narco drug war, and cannabis is at the center of it. So John, how has the US and prohibition and its stance on it really have influenced a lot of the drug policy conversations in these countries. And the reason why this question is important is because immigration is not going to stop. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so as the US continues to criminalize this plant, its impact is felt globally. And as those global citizens move to the US, they are now at even more of a risk in the US. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, big question, um, and, and, a, and a good one. I think you know, the US basically used its post-World War II superpower status to design a prohibitionist drug control regime that most countries got behind, whether they agreed with it or whether they knew that they needed to get in line. Um, and that had an enormous consensus to do what was billed as creating a drug-free world, literally to eradicate cannabis, coca, opium poppy from the face of the earth other than for medical and scientific uses. So that's the key, the key difference. Um, the US, because it was a superpower and because it made it clear that this was a priority, also made it clear that if you don't toe the line, we will use our power to come down on you. We will coerce you with politics, we will coerce you with sanctions. And as the, as the drug war grew and as prohibition created larger markets, the United States funneled military aid and police aid to countries to combat the drug, drug cultivation and production, which spread the problem even further. Uh, the US defined success in a perverse way of Interdiction, seizures, labs destroyed, arrests made, and other countries took that up. So you had a whole perverse process of adding up metrics as success that only pointed to how the drug trade was growing, not how we were controlling it. So in all of those spheres, the United States insisted and then grew a prohibition system that thrived on fear and continues today to thrive on fear and the perverse reality that as prohibition is enforced, it actually perpetuates itself through more fear. And the drugs do become riskier, both for users and the drug trafficking networks do become more powerful and more harmful to, to their communities and to entire countries. I think that's what we're seeing in Ecuador today and it goes well beyond cannabis to other prohibited substances such as cocaine, um, especially the case for, for Ecuador today, but for the Andean region. So I think 
we need to recognize in the United States the role that our country has played and understand that what we do now, beginning with cannabis, in terms of reforming our own approach and policies, is going to have major impacts on the rest of the world. And that our solidarity needs to extend beyond our borders and beyond the shore to make sure that we take care to repair the harms or begin to repair the harms that the US-led drug war has done over decades, not just in Latin America, but around the world. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the point that you made about this being a global issue, right, and having these global conversations are incredibly important because sometimes we're so siloed off, right, into we focus very much on our own city, on our own state, on our own country, without really recognizing that all around the world these problems are happening different flavors, but the problems are happening, you know, really nonetheless. So in the last few minutes that we have, I'd like to end on a solution-oriented note. So I'm gonna start first at the macro level and then we'll go into the micro. So at the macro, so John, as more states start moving towards, you know, legalization, what role can the US play in leading this global policy cannabis conversation, but in a, more positive, more progressive, more inclusive way? Yeah, I think first is to, to be aware that as the U.S. moves because of our influence and our power, it opens political space for other countries that have been anxious but reluctant because they didn't want the United States to come after them. Um, small Caribbean island states where ganja is a real culture but they've been reluctant even to go as far as sacramental uses because they know the United States and the treaty bodies are gonna come after them. So to recognize that the United States has this really important role and that while it's often, if not in the drug sphere, almost always been highly negative, the US, because of its influence, can play a positive role. And that's something that we need to envision. What is a positive role? One, one way would be that as US federal legalization approaches, we need to be honest about what it means for these treaties that we've constructed and enforced over the decades. Adult use or recreational cannabis legalization or any other drug under these treaties is not permitted by the treaties. That doesn't mean we don't do it, it just means we be honest. This is a nonsensical obligation for us. We cannot keep it. That doesn't mean that Absolutely, and in terms of you know those pushes, like I was getting messages from advocates that I've been in touch with now in different South American countries being like, what is this national cannabis summit that you're at and this press conference that you're in front of the Capitol? And so it's really beautiful to see how advocates from different parts of the country or different parts of the world are looking at the type of work that we are doing. And they are inspired by it because a lot of times in their countries, this isn't really a possibility to even be on this stage having a conversation just like this for fear of retaliation from police and military. And that's what I've been hearing you know, from a few of my friends. So I think that what we're doing in this space is incredibly important and understanding that we are on a global stage, the United States. So now we're taking it back to the United States. So what legislative, administrative policies, changes do you want to see in the future that can help both the immigrant community but also the community at large? Question for both of you. Sure, I mean, despite, you remember I said I was a mid-G, not an OG, but a mid-G. So despite having helped um, author, uh, then Senator, now Vice President Harris's Moore Act, um, I am now in full favor of the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act because it does go further and I think um, we are learning a lot more about how to um, include reparative types of components and provisions in our legislation um, as we are uh, evolving um, our policies and practices. 
again, the legislative remedy is not the only one though, right? Like these are, um, again, as John, to use a word John said, pernicious systems and we need to fight at all the fronts. So I'll hand it over to Marie to talk about some other things too. Yeah, I mean, I think that when I said that the, um, the idea of rescheduling is an insult, it is partially because there is so much that can be done. So much that can be done that will actually help people. Just on an administrative level from the president, the president has prosecutorial discretion about how to enforce immigration laws. The Supreme Court just upheld that, right? The president can decide, I will stop deporting people for marijuana-related offenses. That is within his discretion. The president can also decide, I will stop deporting people for offenses that have been expunged or overturned. That is within his discretion, right? And so without even an act of Congress, we can reverse the harms that have been done. But I also want an act of Congress. <laughs> And uh, you know the the bills that Jasmine mentioned both include um, provisions that will help immigrants, that will help immigrants who have convictions. Um, and I think the one additional bill that I'll raise is the New Way Forward Act, which repeals many of these immigration-related um, bars related to drug activity generally, but including marijuana. Um, and I think. At the state level, there is also the opportunity to craft bills that open up doors for immigrants. That was done in New York, where the marijuana bill includes a, pa a special path for immigrants to ask the courts to reconsider their convictions to ensure that they don't have those immigration consequences. And so there really is a lot of room for movement and a lot of ways that we can stop this really, really destructive pipeline that hurts vast, vast majority black and brown immigrants. Well, thank you so much. And what I gathered from this conversation is how we say in Spanish, yes, we can, si se puede. Yes, thank you so much. Everybody. My name is Michelle Rutter Freeberg, and I am the Director of Government Relations for the National Cannabis Industry Association. We are the oldest and largest trade association representing the legal cannabis industry, and we represent primarily small businesses. So I'm excited to be here today with our panelists, Shanae Bullock and Jeffrey Lawrence. So before we get started, Shanae, Jeff, we would love to hear a little bit about yourselves, who you work for, and how or why you got involved in the cannabis space. Yes, akwe nadasawisa kampanayu mashuna tuyusqua 
Natchashiawank, Shinnecock, Natchapiawank, Montauk. My given name is Eileen Canoe, I'm Butterfly Woman, and I would like to also um, give acknowledgement to the Piscataway people, the Piscataway people, the Powhatan Confederation of these lands. Um, how I got into cannabis. Uh, so a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm the founder of Moxquitu Consulting. Moxquitu in my language means medicine. It's been established for about five years. I'm the CEO of that. And we focus on cultural and heritage preservation. Um, prior to this year, over the last three years, I was able to help my tribe open up a cannabis dispensary. And we cut the ribbon in November, so. <laughs> Yeah. No small feet. So, Jeff, how are you going to follow that? Well, I can't. Um, oh. He's not. That's the end. <laughs> I can't do quite as an artistic as a, of an introduction. But uh, my name is Jeff Lawrence. I'm research director at the Reason Foundation, which is a nationwide libertarian think tank. Uh, we focus on a wide range of issues from, you know, pension sus uh, sustainability to drug reform. Um, and the reason that we are so interested in ending the drug war is because uh, it is one of the most systemic uh, mechanisms for infringing upon the civil liberties of all Americans. Uh, so if we can end the drug war, uh, then we can really rein in the police state and give people more freedom. So, Jeff, you really teed that up for me. You know, you've written extensively about the interstate commerce clause. Uh, currently, states are engaging in intrastate commerce. Um, why isn't there interstate commerce? And can you tell everybody here a little bit about the commerce clause, what that is, and why and how it's impacting the cannabis industry and their businesses? Right. So, uh, going back to the Philadelphia Convention, uh, where the Constitution was written, uh, the reason people convened there is because the states, well, one of the primary reasons, uh, is because the states had erected all of these barriers to trade. So uh, if you were in Virginia, you couldn't buy tobacco products from North Carolina because you had to buy Virginia tobacco products. And people just started to say, you know, this is insane. Uh, so let's, uh, let's create an open market among the states. Uh, and the Constitution was a vehicle for that. Uh, of course, it enshrined the new federal government with the power in Article 1, Section 8 to regulate interstate commerce, commerce between the states. Um, what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, the courts have elucidated that over the last couple centuries. Um, and they have interpreted the interstate commerce clause as an exclusive jurisdiction granted to the Congress to regulate this commerce between the states. The corollary to that is that states cannot take action on their own. Uh, to regulate commerce or to impede commerce between the states. Uh, so even in a case like cannabis, where Congress has not chosen to establish a regulatory structure, Congress's power is still exclusive and remains dormant. So states are impeded from taking action. This is where the phrase dormant commerce clause comes from. The powers of Congress remain dormant, but states cannot usurp those powers. Um, so what we see in cannabis markets today, uh, we have these state regulated cannabis markets that all, every one of them has a ban on the import of marijuana products from other states. Some of them also have uh, limitations on investment that can come from people who are non-residents or licensees. You can't give a license to someone who hasn't lived in your state for a certain amount of time. Um, these are all facial violations of the, uh, of the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, constitutional law. And what this, in Dormant Commerce Clause cases throughout history, the Supreme Court has said that um, provisions, whether it's a licensing provision or regulation that a state creates, uh, that creates, uh, that treats out of state economic interests differently than in state economic interests, is almost per se invalid. Um, so, you know, courts, federal courts are just now starting to hear some cannabis cases, and we can talk about those. Um, but this is the framework that we're heading toward, where there is a clear, uh, there's a clear conflict between state regulatory structures and the federal concept of how we regulate interstate commerce. 
Thanks for that, Jeff. And, you know, Shanae, we're talking a lot about interstate commerce, uh, states regulating products, uh, you know, within or, you know, their own borders. But talking about borders can be complex when we're thinking about history and indigenous peoples. Can you set the stage a little bit for us and educate us on that a little bit? Yes, I can. Um, well, I would say that we never put borders between our homelands. Um, one of the community, a lot of the communities that quote unquote live on the border of the United States and Canada are a great example. Uh, for example, our relatives, the Mohawk. Uh, the Mohawk have tribal members that live in New York and then they have tribal members that live in Canada. Um, but they are, they have their own governance system. So if the St. Regis Mohawk decides to, or Aquasasini, and they have enter in the cannabis industry and regulate that with on their own, then who is the government to intervene with their own governmental laws? Uh, the way that comes up in the Commerce Clause is you see the Indian Commerce Clause um, specifically goes all the way back to the 1823 um, Supreme Court ruling with Johnson versus McIntosh. Um, that's a precedent case uh, that took place when you're dealing with land and jurisdiction. And so in there, the only way that uh, tribes can either sell land uh, is usually through an act of Congress. And so like you, I like how you said uh, lays dormant because a lot of times com the Congress doesn't necessarily step in, um, but they do have within those clauses uh, autonomy to do so inside of the tribal uh, jurisdictions. Um, and that's really something that we are advocating for uh, to educate as many people as possible in uh, because nobody should have jurisdiction or any autonomy to operate our government. And that's where you hear a lot of the terms of self-determination when it comes to tribes. Um, and so self-determination with the example of Mohawk uh, they have the right to enter in cannabis or whatever kind of trade. I'm right now adorned in what's called wampum. Uh, wampum is known to be America's first currency. Uh, these shells grow on our homelands of the Stony Shore people. Uh, these shells have been used as trade uh, for a very, very long time when the colonists came here, so much so that they understood the value of it and they utilized it against us. And so this is what we had to pay tribute to. It was never, it was never considered currency, but because of the value of that, they recognized that the tribes on the Atlantic Ocean versus the tribes upstate were trading between shells and fur. And so when they intercepted that, they created inter interstate commerce. They created that, we never did. We were always able to do that. And so what our tribes uh, always point back to is our traditional trade routes. Um, how we've been able to do that. And as water people, we have the right to fish and trade as far as the right whale swims. That is in the 1664 treaty, the Fort Albany, Albany Treaty in New York, and Shinnecock is a part of that, still living on the ocean. So cannabis seed, cannabis is just another trade item. Um, and so that's something that I know the tribes in New York um, and other tribes in different states are always advocating for, but it usually, we have to break down the education of it. Thanks, Shanae. And Jeff, you talked a little bit, uh, obviously, about the Commerce Clause and, and about the difference between interstate and intrastate markets. What happened there that, you know, clearly, I think it's, you know, pretty clearly or somewhat clearly defined, uh, you know, and there's precedent, but what made these states decide that they should have purely intrastate markets? Right. Uh, so uh, back in 2013, uh, James Cole, as uh, Deputy Attorney General, circulated the Cole Memo. Uh, which I think uh, promoted a misunderstanding of the law among state regulators. Uh, and that is, he said, uh, Justice Department will agree to leave states alone uh, if they implement a well-regulated marijuana marketplace that doesn't implement eight different priorities, one of which uh, was that uh, no marijuana inventory would move across state lines. All right, so he enshrined this um, concept that federal jurisdiction is limited to commerce of items that actually cross state lines. Uh, but the prevailing case law 
doesn't support that position. Uh, and this goes back to, uh, in the 1930s, there was a farmer in Ohio living on family farms, his name was uh, Roscoe Filburn, um, and he, uh, uh, at that time, the Agriculture, uh, Agricultural Adjustment Act was in place, uh, so the federal government was paying farmers not to grow crops in order to uh, keep the scarcity up and keep the prices high. Uh, so he had accepted a payment uh, not to grow wheat on his farm, but uh, he had a lot of animals on the farm, he wanted to feed the animals, so on one little corner he grew wheat to feed his pigs. Uh, he was fined as a result of doing that, and uh, his lawyer said, well, I don't even think the government has the authority to do that uh, because this is not interstate commerce. It didn't even, it was never bought or sold. It didn't cross the state boundary. Uh, it literally was taken out of your field there and given to your pigs right there uh, on the same property, right? Uh, so the court, which at the time was under some pressure from uh, the Roosevelt administration uh, with court packing threats to justify some of these New Deal programs, they came up with their rationale where they said, well, Roscoe, um, because you grew wheat to feed your pigs on your farm, that prevented you from buying wheat from someone else. And as a result, that affected the interstate demand for wheat and affected the overall wheat prices. Therefore, Congress and, and the executive branch has the authority to regulate you and to assess this fine. Um, fast forward 60 years, Angel Rach is a uh, terminal brain cancer patient in California and uh, has a lot of pain she's dealing with, uses medical marijuana in her California's uh, program. She's a registered patient, uh, grows marijuana in her own home. She's raided by the DEA, she's fined, thrown in prison. Uh, they take her plants, they destroy them. And she makes the same argument, basically, that you know, there's no interstate commerce here. I grew this in my living room. I rolled joints on my coffee table. Uh, it never went anywhere else. And uh, the court said, well, according to this Filburn decision, um, that, by definition, we consider interstate commerce because by growing this ca cannabis, you didn't buy it. Um, so everything is technically, even if uh, all of the you know, cannabis commerce that occurs in a state license system never leaves the state, whether it's in California or Massachusetts or wherever it is, we think that it's interstate, but it's, uh, according to federal case law, it's all interstate. There's no distinction. Um, and this is not some like weird theory that I'm making up. Uh, this is what, how courts have actually ruled very recently. Uh, there have been a number of recent cases where courts have issued injunctions against licensing. Uh, New York's a good example where you know, retail licenses were held up for a couple of years uh, because of this issue where the court said, uh, well, this interstate commerce is interstate commerce, Therefore, Congress has jurisdiction, and we find that, um, as a federal court, we find that your requirements that require, you know, for the licensee to be a resident of the state are facially violative of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Therefore, you can't do this. Um, as those cases, there have been at least three major cases now in federal courts that have decided that, including at the appeals court level. Uh, so as these continue to accumulate, uh, it's pretty clear in my mind that uh, courts will strike down these state barriers to interstate commerce. You know, Shanae, many people may not know that there's a difference between tribal businesses and native businesses. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between those two and what challenges each of them respectively face? And I would also love if you could talk a little bit about the intersectionality there between either both of those businesses, either, and the Commerce Clause here and the conundrum that we're experiencing. Great. Um, so. What was interesting is I got to actually sit in the seat of both as CEO. So I have my business, right, Moxkitu Consulting, which is a Native American-owned business, LLC, through whatever state that I'm going to have it in, right? Well, that's a Native American-owned. Why? Because I'm Native American. A tribally-owned business is different because it is owned by the entire tribe. And even just the process in getting your 
um, your LLC. Uh, what our tribe did was through the secretary of the Shinnecock Nation, that's who issued the charter for the LLC. So the tribe actually, instead of having to go through with whatever state to get your, your business incorporated, the tribe incorporates that business through their own government versus whatever state. Um, even just to get the EIN number is a whole separate process. Um, the time that I was working on getting the EIN number for our tribe's business, which was about two years ago, come to find out I wasn't the only person as a CEO of a tribally owned business uh, that was having this issue. Typically, you go online, right, nowadays, you go online, you fill out the information, you classify what your business is, and you are popped out with the EIN number. Tribes can't do that. They have to essentially go through the IRS, and there's usually a person that is in charge of uh, tribal governmental affairs who doesn't really have an official position uh, as a tribal governmental affairs person, but any kind of thing that comes through that way, it becomes, it's a part of their desk. So we had to pay attorneys to actually kind of go through that process, come to find out there were a lot of tribes that could not get their EIN number because it was just getting held up in that one person's office. We see a lot of tribes that are you know, looking to enterprise, and what that is is the money that's generated, that is what helps to operate the entire nation, just like a government. Um, you know, and so the, there's a difference in how you register, how you classify. Um, tribes also are tax exempt. Tribal businesses are tax exempt. Uh, so they don't have to pay the taxes versus a tribal, uh, a Native American business does. Um, through the SBA, you have women-owned um, programs, economically disadvantaged-owned programs, minority, black, Latino, all of the different amazing programs, veterans, right? They have a Native, there's a, there's a link to a website for a Native American-owned business but again, it really doesn't exist. The program doesn't exist. Uh, however, Native American owned businesses outside of cannabis, just it doesn't even matter. I'm in the environmental uh, space. Um, there are more set aside federal dollars for Native American businesses. So if you're contracting with the federal government, I think the, right now it's $84.9 billion that are set aside for Native American owned businesses, but yet you don't have help with the programming to really even begin to access all of that like the other ones do. Um, so there's just some really interesting things that are set up for both, but it's hard. And what we found in the cannabis side of things, um, for example, New York, when they made this huge announcement to have social equity programs, right? You would think that tribal businesses were included in that social equity when they were gonna give the social equity uh, you know, funding from the taxes that are made from the state. Tribes were absolutely not included in any of that. Like, not at all. They said that they would be there for the Native American businesses, but again, there's no programs to help those Native American small businesses to also be able to obtain those. Um, so they exist, they're very different, um, but they are there. And how does that work? You talked a little bit about the SBA, the Small Business Administration, because the Small Business Administration is a federal program. Cannabis is federally illegal. So if you are, you know, if you've gotten SBA money, how does how does that work or play out there when you kind of, you know, like I said, intersect those two? Well, you shouldn't. Uh, we'll say that <laughs> uh, with, at all. You know, I was just talking about the SBA program in general and how, you know, there are Native American owned businesses that are supposed to have the access to very similar programs, but those programs do not exist. There's just a website, again, for it. Uh, we see at the Reservation Economic Conference, uh, which is called RES, it's one of the largest economic uh, conferences uh, for Indian country, we do see that those agencies do come, and they hold clinics and things of that nature, but usually the lines are out the door to talk to that particular program for that agency. Uh, Jeff, a couple of states in the, in, over the past, you know, I've, I've been in the space for a decade, so we'll go with a decade. A couple of states over the last decade have attempted to make interstate commerce pacts within themselves. What are those? Have they worked? What's, what's the deal there? Right. Um, so this is primarily the West Coast. Uh, Oregon, Washington, California have all passed laws 
authorizing the governor of those states uh, to enter into uh, an interstate compact that would allow cannabis, uh, transfers of cannabis inventory across state lines. Uh, but there are some conditions on when those governors are allowed to do it. Uh, usually it's, uh, they get a letter from the Federal Department of Justice saying that it's acceptable or there's an act of Congress uh, legalizing cannabis. Um, so they, they can't just go out and do it on their own. Uh, at this point, those, uh, law, those state laws are mostly symbolic because none of the triggering events have happened. Um, however, uh, my reading of case law on interstate commerce uh, indicates that, well, the Supreme Court has kind of frowned upon interstate commerce when it comes to, or uh, interstate compacts when it comes to trade in the past. Uh, they've said that basically this undermines the entire purpose of the Constitution, uh, that we shouldn't have to have these regional trade pacts because uh, the Constitution guarantees basically free trade among all the states. Right. Uh, the difference in this particular area is that we think it should be treated differently because the underlying activity is criminal. Right. Um, that, uh, but the, you know, the courts uh, up until this point, there have been multiple rulings uh, in the last couple of years, uh, have said that even though Congress has treated this product as criminal, that doesn't give states the ability to violate other aspects of the Constitution, uh, such as the Dormant Commerce Clause, right? So, uh, and, and the First Circuit Court, which has ruled on this, uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, has said that the, um, both, uh, despite federal illegality, both the, uh, both the legislative and executive branches have expressly acknowledged that there remains an interstate market in cannabis uh, because Congress passed the uh, Rohrabacher Farr Amendment and uh, James Cole circulated a memo within the executive branch. Uh, so we recognize that you know, the po official policy of Congress is that this product is illegal, but also we recognize that there is a market for it, and therefore states cannot intervene in this market is where the cards would fall. Well, and it's interesting you bring up Rohrabacher Farr, which is still in law, right? But that applies only to medical cannabis, you know, programs, businesses, consumers, et cetera. And the Cole Memo has since been rescinded as well back in, I think it was 2018. So I think that that's also interesting as well as we talk about this, that we're also talking about, you know, and, and you know, half and half in this case, something that only applies to medical, not all businesses or all programs. And again, something that doesn't even, isn't even codified anymore. But again, you talked about Rohrabacher Farr, so looking at federal policy, Shanae, what policies, if any, have the federal government um, passed to aid Native participation in the cannabis industry? Have they? Yes, actually. Um, it's interesting. That's good news. <laughs> yeah. Glad, glad to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's always still a work in progress, and there's always something that you can build from. You know, here we are in 2024, but go back to 400 years ago. You know, so, I mean, you've had different people that were speaking up for all different kinds of things. Cannabis is just one of them, you know? Um, but what we've been able to see, interesting that you say 2018, because in 2018, there were about 63 provisions that were beneficial and very positive for Indian country. Um, and so now we're at a place that we should be able to just and that, build that was upon. in the farm bill, correct? Yes, no. in the farm bill. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Just want to make sure I'm we like, know yeah, I are. think everybody knows what I'm talking about all the time, right? No. Um, <laughs> you guys should know what I'm thinking. No. <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> but yeah, in the farm bill, you know, and so I think um, it's it's really important for people to really just kind of see what and what those positive things are and communicate with the uh, tribes about that and see how can they build upon them. Because when you have unification, because what benefits tribes can also benefit other people too. Jeff, what are some of the possible pathways or options for interstate commerce? Is this is something that can be done, you know, in a, in a federal prohibition world? Is this a post-prohibition conversation? Maybe break those down a little bit, but, but what are some of the pathways forward? That might be a, a loaded question. Right. So, um, I think that we are basically one case away, one well-designed case, uh, from getting federal courts to strike down state barriers to interstate commerce. Um, and you know, I have a paper where I kind of lay out what that, how that case should be designed uh, based on the existing precedent. Um, 
But in the event that, I, I think that that can happen even in the current context of federal illegality. Uh, because as I said, states can't violate the Commerce Clause even though the product is illegal, uh, is the way the courts have basically ruled. Um, but if we were to succeed in getting that ruling that says um, all, all of these states have to strike down uh, your barriers, so uh, if you're in New Jersey, a dispensary can freely order from a grow house in Oregon and vice versa. Um, that is the catalyst that I think is most likely to incentivize Congress to say, okay, now we're going to expressly regulate. We're going to legalize and have a regulatory structure to govern these interstate shipments that we can no longer stop. You know, and Shanae, earlier you talked about a case where I believe you said the Mohawk people, where their their land is both in New York and Canada, right? And I'm assuming, and please correct me, that there are or could be some cases, right, where tribal land maybe cross or it, you know covers two states. How does interstate commerce work in cases like that? Well, um, or does it? It doesn't really. Uh, you know, this is something that tribes, I think, collectively are able to come to an agreement on um, because we know our history, we know what those ancient trade routes are, we know what those laws are, and I think um, what's happening now is you're seeing tribes within each state be able to kind of come together and have their own new treaties, right? Um, or even sort of bring back the old treaties and bring that to the forefront of whatever government, uh, whatever state that they are, you know, communicating with. Um, and I think, again, it's just more so the education, because you're going to know our governments predate the doctrine of discovery, our tribes, right? So they predate the state, they predate the United States. And so when you have new people that are elected into office, uh, it's a whole re-education or educating them on what those old trade routes are, whether they recognize them or not. Uh, we haven't let up on still being able to utilize those trade routes. Uh, we've just become criminals for doing so. We just have a couple minutes left here. Shade, I want to ask you a closing question. How can those of us who are in this space, how can we aid the inclusion of tribes and native people in the cannabis industry? We always talk about barriers to entry, you know, in this space. And after listening to you talk, it sounds like there's a whole other layer of that. So what can we here in this space do to help? Yeah, well, I think really, um, you know, when we talk black and brown people, we use the word BIPOC, we use all these terms, but actually get the relationship with those tribes. You know, uh, don't just utilize that as something and just, and it sounds good because it's including people. And I'm also talking to people that look just like me too. You know, um, know what those tribes are, know what those issues are, know what those provisional, what those provisional languages are, get with the right people that are putting these white papers together, include that language within that, because that's all, that's inclusion. Um, and I can also just do, uh, just say that ICIA, um, if you don't know, um, they are, you know, Okay, sorry. Uh, well, we have Mary Jane here in the audience. She's the executive director of ICIA, and they're an indigenous organization that focuses on, you know, a lot of the things that are happening around policy and just really working with all of the tribes to have that. But you're starting to see them show up in those spaces. So it's very important to know what that, what those languages are, what those needs are, because it's very beneficial to to everyone, not just you know indigenous people. I know that we have a time, but it's very important for me to say this, but indigenous people hold the vast amount of tenure over the global biodiversity. So whatever dollars that we're getting in our community, it's going towards clean water, fighting for water rights, fighting for air, and fighting for the, the, the land. And so when we're left out of that, that is actually harmful to all humankind. And so that's a big, part of the language that should be included is our seat at the table and the policy decision making at that point. Yes, I think that deserves a round of applause on its own. All right, Jeff, last closing question for you. Considerations for small businesses uh, in this interstate commerce conundrum, any final closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that uh, what we've seen in particularly limited licensed states is they tend to be dominated by the companies that have the resources to do significant lobbying um, and secure 
some share of those limited licenses and then have the capital to stand up their facilities very quickly uh, and establish market share before any, uh, any small businesses who happen to get licensed uh, are able to do so. Um, so uh, in our view, the state silos coupled with limited availability of licenses uh, is, uh, is, gives the advantage to these uh, corporatist kind of cronyist uh, organizations. Um, we think that the best way to allow a native kind of homegrown small business to flourish is to give them a, a broad audience that they can market their products to, right? So if you got something really unique, uh, you might find a limited market in Vermont, if that's where you're based. But there might be a huge demand for your product in Florida, California. Um, and so the best way to be able to grow for tr those truly innovative upstart businesses, which a lot of great businesses start out that way. Amazon, largest business in the world, started out as this really small online bookstore. Um, that's, that's kind of the dynamic world that we hope will emerge in cannabis. Uh, through really homegrown entrepreneurship. Well, if you guys are interested, you can check out the Reason Foundation for uh, and more writing on uh, the Interstate Commerce Clause. Jeff has written extensively on it. And of course, as Shanae mentioned, make sure you check out the Indigenous Cannabis Industry Association. Thank you both so much for your time today.
All right. Um, good afternoon. Everybody settle down. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, can we um, take our seats, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Rafi Crockett, and I am excited to be here at National Cannabis Policy Summit, uh, joined by um, some wonderful folks, and we are going to be discussing uh, access to capital, financial services, and uh, safe, safe, safer banking. Um, so, Dashida and uh, Anthony, I'll just allow you all to introduce yourselves briefly, please. Hi, good afternoon. It doesn't sound like it is. All right, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, my name is Dashita Dawson and I am the founding director for Cannabis NYC where I oversee the development of the legal cannabis industry for the city of New York. I'm also the founding chair of Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition, uh, which, woo woo, <laughs> Shout out to the CRCC. We will be hosting a meet and greet um, directly after all of the panels finish at 6 p.m. here in the reception. You can uh, meet other regulators from across the country uh, who are really uh, leading the uh, fight for cannabis equity and reform um, on a national level. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Anthony Lamarena, I'm with the R Street Institute. Uh, we're a free market center right leading think tank and we have a bunch of different issue areas um, but I cover our financial services uh, along with our criminal justice portfolio with the overlaps with a lot of our cannabis reform work. So prior to our street, um, I worked at the Hawaii State Capitol uh, and the Guam legislature. So I have a lot of my, a lot of background in state politics, but also uh, as of recently on the federal level as well. Well, thank you both. So let's just kind of jump right in. Let's let's talk about safe and safer. So Anthony, can you please? You know, give us an overview of what is this legislation um, that has been on everybody's radar for the last five, ten years at this point, um, and it, it keeps us all up at night, and some of us are just kind of tired of it as well. Um, so, what is the legislation? There's, you know, we went from safe to safer. Uh, what was the difference? How did we get from safe to safer? What are those changes, and what does it do, what, or what does it purport to do? Yeah, you know, I mean, the bill aims to allow cannabis uh, entrepreneurs and businesses and consumers to have the same, you know, essentially financial services rights and access that, you know, every other legal industry has uh, in this country. And so, you know, the Safe Banking Act aimed to do that. With Safer, you know, there was a lot of, you know, politics going on with just one piece of the bill, really, which was uh, Section 10. Uh, and, you know, a lot of you know, Democratic senators were willing to tank, um, you know, safe banking because they didn't, they thought Section 10 went a little bit too far. Um, and Republican senators along with Democrat senators came together and created safer banking. And what did safer banking do? It allowed basically that, uh, it basically says and kind of in better terms specifies that the federal banking agencies can't request to require the closure of any customer accounts if reputation risk is the controlling factor for that closure. But rather, accounts can only be closed if the bank is engaged in financially risk behavior that could result in the closure of the bank or violates the law. And so the initial bill, and this is kind of getting wonky, I'm sorry, I hate to bore people too much. I know safe banking doesn't exactly get everyone off, off you know, their feet. <laughs> okay. But we're gonna make we're it fun. <laughs> And, you know, those are kind of like the, nut, the nuts and bolts of why, you know, things were really getting held up. But, you know, us at R Street, we're happy to see that there was a good bipartisan compromise with Senator Steve Daines, um, along with Senator Lummis, and, and, you know, on the Democratic side with Senator Merkley, uh, and, uh, and I guess independent Senator Cinema that helped hash all of that out, which, you know, now the bill has 60 uh, co-sponsors, and, you know, we're, we're hopeful for some floor movement um, this Congress. So that's what SAFER is supposed to do. And you, know, you talk about these kind of bipartisan efforts. However, you know, the House GOP Policy Committee has, has issued guidance to its members saying that this will just allow uh, banks to knowingly accept drug money and have you know, told their caucus to vote against this. So Dashida, now that we know what SAFER is supposed to do, can you tell us what SAFER does not do? 
<laughs> loaded question. I'm very excited to talk about SAFER and just how good a government is at um, rebranding concepts for us to think that they're actually new. Um, so that's what I'm most excited about. Uh, so the SAFER adds an R um, uh, for uh, basically regulatory. Um, and it, both you know, bills, I think you say that it helps entrepreneurs. And I think the number one thing we should just take away is that it actually helps banks and institutions. Um, there are benefits as a result of helping banks and institutions kind of sort through um, the federal illegality and maneuvering with cannabis, there are benefits that do transition to the operators, um, but by and large, <clears throat> safer and, and or safe still leaves out a lot of the really inequities that currently exist in banking and financing that would happen regardless of cannabis. Um, and there's also still a lot of um, you know, uh, lack of accountability on being able to provide data and make changes as we move forward. Um, so what's the reporting look like? Um, how are we treating hemp businesses versus um, marijuana derived, uh, which we call cannabis, it's all cannabis by the way, so that makes it even more confusing. But how are we treating them differently? They're not getting treated with parity. Um, and then, yeah, I think at the end of the day, we're. Uh, seeing this marketed like it's supposed to make it easier for um, black, indigenous, and Latin, um, and small business owned, uh, you know, entities to get uh, better financing. It, it will, um, but it also helps Goliath get better financing, and it also encourages really big companies to now take their big capital uh, and transition in. And the fear really is that the bill doesn't account for it in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't even mention it as a risk. Um, and the reporting doesn't track whether or not we're preventing that from happening. Thank you. So, Anthony, you had mentioned something um, about, you know, safer is meant to prevent banks from, you know, closing accounts strictly due to reputational risk. Um, be and but, however, it doesn't it doesn't go far enough, in in my opinion, because all banks have a risk appetite, and. Right now, there are banks and other financial institutions that will not take on a gambling business. They will not bank casinos. They will not bank sports uh, wagering. They will not bank um, uh, money service businesses. And that's well within their right to do so, and it, they can do so legally. And so why would cannabis be any different? And we're having this conversation about descheduling versus rescheduling, and cannabis remains illegal under safer and safe, how is this going to actually make a change? Yeah, you know, and uh, to that point about, um, you know, the House Republican Study Committee coming out that memo, you know, I would say you should, they should read the actual bill, uh, because nowhere in the bill does uh, it condone, advocate, or promote the usage of cannabis. Um, so I would just say read the damn bill <laughs> before you write these things. Um, but I would, you know, to that, but to your point and to your question, you know, the, the main, you know, reasoning that, you know, safe banking in its past has had Section 10, you know, is to, Republicans really wanted this piece because of, in 2014, the Department of Justice had Operation Choke Point, which targeted a bunch of Certain, I guess certain industries that are, I would say, Republican friendly, like gun uh, manufacturers, and essentially uh, closed, uh, tried to close a bunch of accounts. And so Republicans are trying to set, try and stop that. And that's why they added Section 10, which originally was a standalone bill um, from Congressman Luke DeMeyer in the House. And you know, through that you know component, it's been able to garner a lot of bipartisan support. Um, you know, that's why SAFE, one of the reasons why SAFE has been able to garner a lot of bipartisan support amongst Republicans. Um, but, you know, so that's why I feel like th that component I needed a lot of clarity just because, you know, certain Democrats were getting a little bit fearful. But I think, but to your point, you know, or to your question, I think any, any business kind of operates based upon risk. Right. 
And so I think it's fair for banks to you know, operate, or financial institutions, I should say, to operate based on risk when it comes to lending. But, you know, because every other business would do that, but rather Operation Choke Point doesn't allow the government to come in and say, well, you know, reputation risk, we're gonna close down certain accounts just because you work in this, you know, in this industry or not. And I think what's scary is, is that, you know, if we don't have these kind of provisions in place, you know, and the, a new administration could come in and then, you know, take away, close accounts uh, with, with, with great legal cannabis businesses because they view it as, you know, quote, reputational risk. And so I think it works both ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so we always believe that trying to take, you know, take away those kinds of authorities away from the federal government um, is, is helpful for businesses, uh, but also the consumers as well in the overall picture. And as we've seen, you know, the rhetoric, the rhetoric around this bill um, is much different than the reality of this bill. And Dashita, you started kind of touching on this a little bit, and I would like you to, you know, delve deeper. Um, a lot of the rhetoric we hear is that this is going to be a win for small business owners, for black and brown entrepreneurs in the cannabis space. Um, so can you, can you kind of talk about that in the reality versus the rhetoric? And then also, you know, as the uh, founding director of Cannabis NYC, you know, your main goal is to help overcome this obstacle so that small business owners, black and brown entrepreneurs, have access to capital and financial services. Um, so can you talk about the work that you're doing in that space, please? Sure. Um, well, the first thing that I wanted to just reiterate is that SAFE doesn't change the stigma around cannabis, and it doesn't deschedule cannabis. And um, there are many of us here this week uh, really uh, focused on descheduling because then we don't have to have a SAFE banking act. We don't have to have a SAFER banking act. Um, and that in and of itself makes a playing field that we still don't believe to be leveled. Um, and so uh, the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition, members, leaders of the coalition, uh, worked together to publish uh, Not a Safe Bet, which is a paper that really took a deeper dive into what safe, um, which is still the heart of the same for safer act, um, you know, did not necessarily address um, in a, in a, a way that makes sense for um, really calling it a bill for you know people of color um, who are entrepreneurs in the space, or even making those people the face of the bill. Um, and so the you know again when we talk about some of the things that are facing individuals when they're opening an account, even having a past criminal um, uh, record with cannabis, which in New York you know our legislation and our efforts are historic in that we're starting with those who have a previous arrest that could preclude you from having access to a, you know a bank account, uh, and nothing in Safe really addresses that. Although we you know see in Safer that you now we have sort of the federal government pulling back on saying automatically this is bad. Um, I think there has to be, uh, and we all agree, I think, with CRCC that more clear directives around um, how we are addressing, it, it, you know, it, some of these issues that exist already as people are really truly going into uh, a bank to get account. Um, but I think the other real issue is that there are no guardrails on what we unleash. Um, we may have increased increased access to, you know, financing. Um, that absolutely, I think, will be an outcome, but increased access is not the same as equitable access. Um, and that's something that we really uh, put a, a, a flag in the ground on um, with the research that we did um, around the Safe Banking um, Act. Nothing in the bill prevents Goliath, and in this case, I don't really think we're talking about big cannabis, so it's not, you know, Cure Leaf or Cresco or any big company. We're talking about Amazon, who just four years ago started publicly saying that they are uh, lobbying in support of cannabis legalization. Uh, over $400 billion a year company, um, where we're, you know, just at a, a billion in the cannabis space for big cannabis. That's an overwhelming amount of access to capital, um, and in in many ways starts to uh, create more division between the haves and the have-nots. Um, and uh, that's 
the opposite of the work that we're trying to do across the country and um, in uh, states like California and Massachusetts and New York. Um, and we think that it would uh, behoove us to try to create, again, some guardrails in the bill um, to ensure that we're studying it. We're also addressing the fact that, again, safe from this, we have Federal Reserve reports as you know, recent as 21 and 22 that show we still have inequities in terms of black and Hispanic um, lending for just small business owners in general, not cannabis. So that layered on top of the realities of cannabis, the realities of potentially having a past criminal um, record, um, doesn't bode well for the way SAFE is laid out. It's still largely up to the discretion of the banks, which they've shown that they, even with laws in place, still are very biased, um, it, there's, there's no reason for us to hope that this is going to be uh, uh, you know, some magic uh, equity uh, adjuster uh, because we have more access. If you have $10, this may maybe give you access to 100, but if you have $10 billion, right, then it's giving you access to uh, you know, a, a whole different order. Um, and that access, I think, ultimately dictates in quotes, success um, and and dominance in the legal cannabis industry. Thank you. So one of the things that we constantly grapple with is, in fact, access to capital, access to lending for small businesses, for uh, black and brown businesses, and that is, you know, that's your that's your task at Cannabis NYC, or one of many of them. So can you talk about? you know, how states um, can help to combat these obstacles uh, for small businesses and black and brown businesses. What are you doing in New York City and what do you see or have ideas for other states uh, to do in that space as well? Well, we're the city advocate on behalf of constituents um, in New York City, and we're working a lot with uh, banking and financing professionals to at least align on um, w what we know is going into the bill um, so that it supports um, at a baseline some of what our constituents are hearing about the bill. Um, but we also uh, have a quarterly roundtable with local CDFIs, um, and one of the you know uh, amendments that we worked on with CRC, CRCC was ensuring that we were explicitly calling that out. And when we uh, talked to the CDFIs in New York City, at least, they were thrilled to hear that because they're usually the least likely to take that type of risk. And knowing that they are explicitly um, uh, covered under the safe harbor, again, as an institution, um, and they are aligned with our equity goals, uh, gives them more reason to lobby for something like that or to support it. Um, and so we've been meeting with them quarterly to update them on what's happening within the industry, uh, clarifying a lot of misinformation. Um, New York is confusing, and the media is not helping, and neither are the internet lawyers. Um, <laughs> We are challenged with just hearing all sorts of craziness. Um, and even like just coming into today, the last two days have been insane in terms of just what's happening with the governor's budget, our need for enforcement. But um, you know, our job also is to close the gaps for the licensees. We're excited to work with our Economic Development Corporation and launch our first Cannabis NYC loan fund. It has not been without its challenges. From the door, the law department said, hey, this is federally illegal, so everything that the risk department in a bank would, you know, highlight, our law department was highlighting. It took us nearly um, a year just to get to the point where we could confirm that we were going to use city funds to start that fund um, because of the risks to city money, uh, because of the um, potential federal enforcement, which our paper showed there's been no federal enforcement in nearly 30 years of industry existing since 1996 when California legalized. And so we're doing a lot of work to take this first move, um, but we're also following along some of the footsteps of 
what's happened in Massachusetts and in Boston, looking at technical assistance in a different way. Shout out to the efforts to try to provide uh, not a one-size-fits-all technical assistance and you must do it to get a loan, but what are the key projects that an entrepreneur needs to really get off the ground and giving them access to project-based uh, support uh, through our funding. And so we're just working quickly, but through a bureaucratic slug. I mean, I'm 90 miles an hour and the government will slow you down to 25 real quick. It was like, flag on the plate, you got a ticket, you're moving too fast, you just jumped over this person. And so um, uh, we, we, we are still working pretty fast though, all things considering. Normally it would take about four to five years to get a fund up and we, we hope to launch it uh, this July. Um, I, I haven't actually really announced it officially, but that's the goal and we're definitely trying to do, yay, yes, <laughs> technical assistance to go alongside it, but it's, it's never ending um, and these types of bills, they can be helpful in that it gets people excited and something to rally around, something to educate, even banking institutions who want to partner with us as we think about the fund, but it also is confusing the conversation as well because it's perceived as a you know, fix-all um, that it's gonna open this floodgate. And one thing it won't do is still prevent our law department from saying, uh, guess what, it's still federally illegal and we still have the same risk profile going forward. Great. So Dashita has outlined some of the things that her, her city is doing, some of the other states are doing to provide you know, access to capital, loans, and things like that. Um, to ease some of the financial burdens for cannabis entrepreneurs. Um, Anthony, can you just talk about some of the things that can be done at the federal level, perhaps absent, um, you know, safer, outside of safer, looking at, you know, 280E and uh, FinCEN reporting requirements, other things that might be addressed at the federal level that we don't necessarily need this bill for? Yeah, you know, I think there are opportunities with, you know, as you said, with the FinCEN, um, you know, reporting requirements and, you know, having some support, some sort of proposed rule that then would allow for more transparency, which is another thing that they say safe, you know, safer banking would lend to. And so I think more transparency is probably key. You know, 280E is, you know, any tax thing in, in this Congress seems to, I mean, the biggest tax bill I think that we've passed recently were the... Um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in the previous administration and then this current tax package now has just seemed to have stalled so much where I, I feel like that would be so hard to uh, tack onto. I think there are opportunities potentially with something like the Farm Bill when it comes to some cannabis um, reporting requirements, especially when it comes to things like um, SNAP that also fall under, um, you know, that, that piece of legislation. And so I think there's opportunities out there. It's just, I think there, I'm not too sure if there's enough political will at times. Um, but also, I mean, as you said, with like some of the incremental things, it's like, you know, I think the administration seems so focused on rescheduling right now that I don't think they're lending any other kind of bandwidth to any other opportunities besides rescheduling and then safe banking with the opportunity of maybe the HOPE Act, which is the expungement provision, um, and uh, the Graham Act, which is the gun cannabis provision. To your point, um, so yeah, I think this year it's you know rescheduling, descheduling, kind of sucking all of the air out of the room. Uh, prior to that, it was in fact uh, safe. Um, can either one of you maybe talk about the intersection of descheduling and safe banking? Well, she said it, we wouldn't need safe banking if we just descheduled <laughs> it. That's the first part. <laughs> Definitely. That's a fact. Um, it's, it's definitely confusing. I go back to, again, clever marketing on the part of government. I mean, deschedule and reschedule are uh, like a word, two words that you could confuse quite easily and are used interchangeably, right? It's like strain and strand, right? It depends on which area of America you're in as to what you're talking about, but not really. In federal law, it means very different things. And so um, I've been really uh, focused on ensuring that communities of color, especially um, uh, entrepreneurs of color, women, uh, they're not uh, you know, necessarily pushing reschedule inadvertently, thinking that it is going to benefit them. Um, in the same way, sometimes you're pushing safe, thinking that it's going to benefit them. But here's the, 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 the gag, y'all. The, the Safe Banking Act at least has benefits for the institutions that can do the trickle-down effect like Ronald Reagan. So you might get a little bit of benefit. I can 
at least attest to some of those things. Um, you might not pay an astronomical amount for a monthly, you know, checking account fee. Uh, but in terms of reschedule, uh, for us in New York and a lot of other states that have established programs already, if you're licensed, there's no trickle down effect on the benefit. It is literally like a monopoly saying, um, mm, do not collect $200, go back to go, because you have to start over now with the DEA under new rules based on the rescheduling in terms of licensing. And guess what? The Drug Enforcement Agency is rarely going to license someone with a previous drug charge. So that, to me alone, if I'm a licensee, that that's my background, and in New York, that's, again, a significant number, then I'm definitely not supporting reschedule. Versus deschedule is removing it completely from the Controlled Substance Act, and thereby making it no longer federally illegal, which means the banking conversation becomes different. It's no different than buying and selling sugar, which, by the way, is worse than cannabis. So, I mean... <laughs> I think there's a lot of intersection. It's just, it's marketing, it's us knowing the difference, and, and again, fighting for what we know is right, even though we might only get an incremental win. Um, I think rescheduling is that type of win that will stall us for another 50 years um, on our movement, because all of the big money would have been able to be put into that type of transition. They can afford, like, pharmaceutical company budgets to do all of the FDA approvals, to move through to get um, their products to market. And in the meantime, um, the small businesses that craft cannabis, all of that, uh, no longer uh, exists. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of just echoed some of the main points that she mentioned. I don't have much to, to shed. Um, okay, great. So I want to go back to some of the other rhetoric that's been around safe, safer, and um, that is that, you know, its passage is going to uh, reduce the reliance on cash, it's going to, you know, uh, thereby reduce robberies and things like that. Um, that's, you know, some, a lot of the rhetoric that they use to push, this is why this is good, this is why this is good for small businesses, this is why it's good for black businesses and things like that. Um, and so this argument garners a lot of support from different sections, and it makes really strange bedfellows um, who support SAFE because they're getting behind the kind of anti-violent crime rhetoric that they've pushed behind it. So what, if any, impact do you think this will, in fact, have on, on retailers? Um, Anthony, if you can speak to that? Yeah, I mean, we, we work closely with law enforcement organizations across the country, and, you know, that's one of the things that actually makes them, you know, some of them are, I would say, individual law enforcement officers are supportive of, you know, things like safer, safer banking because of that aspect. Um, you know, thankfully, you know, national organizations have somewhat remained neutral, which is, you know, we're, we'll take it. Um, but, you know, I think it's resonated a lot, and you're right, it has made strange bedfellows be, but, you know, I mean, the stories I hear from law enforcement and sheriffs and chiefs from across the country is that they actually do, you know, they, you know, when, you know, their assessment in their jurisdictions is that it would. And so, you know, I would take, you know, I, I, I take them at their word at that. I feel like it's kind of really big for them to say that they support any, you know, sort of cannabis reform, just with uh, law enforcement not being very risk averse as well um, in its culture uh, and not really big on change. Um, but those are the stories we're hearing. I think it, it is a, a benefit. You know, Senator Daines was able to get, I think, a decent amount of the sheriffs in his state of Montana um, to support safer banking and come out publicly uh, in support of cannabis banking. So I think it is a strange bedfellows issue. But I mean, I think that's the benefit of like, I think cannabis reform has such a strong ability to build strong coalitions across so many different segments of people, whether they be on the left, right, or center. And I think that's why, you know, SAFE is showing that this is a good example of multiple different people from very different backgrounds, um, at least in, on Capitol Hill, coming together in support of something. And so it's very rare that happens. Uh, I think it's very rare that you know, any bill in the United States Senate gets 60 co-sponsors. Um, but you know, we were, you know, the sponsors were able to do that because they came together and they were able to you know, talk to people in their districts and their states and you know, the law enforcement and public safety aspect, uh, com you know, uh, line and has really been effective at getting more and more folks on board. 
Tashida, do you have maybe a point from, not from law enforcement, but from retailers, from licensees, uh, from community? From regulators, yes. Um, yes. I mean, you know, the, when we have strange bed, bedfellows in uh, government, you have to ask who's the beneficiary ultimately and what does that look like? So it's always the, what are we doing to follow the money? But I don't know what's happening in Montana um, and some of the places where the sheriffs are, but there are states like Massachusetts, and Shalene Title actually tells her story way better, um, where they plan for the, like, so much cash, right? Like in such a big way. Um, and they did so with creating like these vaults and how they were gonna handle all the cash handling because it's all cash, cash, cash. And you know, from very early into the, her stint as the commissioner and the launch of the um, Massachusetts program, they realized that that was uh, something that was more of a stereotype of what was happening in the markets, but not the reality. Because in fact, that is not um, what's happening in the markets. Um, um, when I was in the city of Portland, there wasn't this tremendous, as the regulator overseeing that uh, jurisdiction, there are, my licensees didn't have a tremendous amount of cash on hand. They were still able to uh, you know, bank and probably utilizing um, systems for POS that um, you know, I would say maybe a little questionable. That is what I do think SAFE will help with um, because there are some challenges with Visa and MasterCard and what their position is. But the fact of the matter is that I don't know if the public safety um, story, at least in you know some really big states that have a lot of licensees, um, is is true. You know, I think it is a good story, and I think it makes it easier to get strange bedfellows around the concept, so you get support of a bill to go over. That's lobbying strategy 101, um, but I also think that we, we, we do have a couple of um, really tragic things that have happened in the cannabis space, and they're in like the single digits and like any other um, industry you have tragedies, but like for example in California, we were seeing an increase in robberies um, for Apple stores as well, right? Like it's about the merchandise being valuable more so than the cash um, post-COVID. So where we were seeing the uptick even in Portland, um, we were seeing it in other high, uh, highly valued merchandise um, categories of retail as well. Uh, so I don't know, again, about public safety. There's no right now, you know, huge amounts of cash on site um, at the legal stores in New York, but occasionally the uh, system goes down and it's like a, becomes a cash-only environment. That's happened a lot, and I definitely think that, um, you know, we want to make sure our store owners are are safe, so I don't want to, uh, you know, pretend that that's not uh, a, a priority. But it happens through regulatory um, compliance and other ways, the security setup and all that. The banking system itself, or, or the lack thereof, isn't what's preventing uh, public safety. Great. So we're going to pause briefly. Uh, there is a special guest who has arrived and is going to take the stage now. Thank you, everybody. Uh, happy uh, four minutes past 420. Yes. 
Uh, my name is Amber Center, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Supernova Women. Supernova is a nonprofit organization working to empower black and brown people to become self-sufficient shareholders in the cannabis industry since 2015. We work together with the city of Oakland to develop the first and best social equity program in the country. Oakland has been leading the way in cannabis advocacy and cannabis justice for years, and we couldn't have done it without the work of our Congresswoman, Barbara Lee, leading the way. A fierce advocate for justice and a champion for equity. Being an example of courage and taking a stand for what is right, even if it means standing alone. We thank you so much for your decades of service and for your dedication to the cause and for creating opportunities for so many black and brown women in cannabis and beyond. Barbara Lee will always speak for me. On behalf of Supernova Women, the National Cannabis Policy Summit, and advocates across the country, it's my pleasure to present you with the Supernova Women Cannabis Champion Lifetime Achievement Award. Woo. I think I'm a supernova woman. <laughs> and I want to thank you so much. Thank you for making me very proud. Uh, and Amber, and to all of you, uh, how, you don't know how much I appreciate this and how wonderful it is to be off of the hill for just a minute <laughs> to see and th say thank you. Uh, you know, I always say that my uh, congressional district is the most enlightened, it's the most diverse, and it's the most active congressional district in the country. And I think this is a testament to that, Amber. And yes, you know, we've been on the cutting edge of so many issues. Uh, there's so many layers in terms of uh, cannabis justice, uh, and you all know the issues, but we've been working day and night on legalization, not rescheduling. Uh, also, uh, you know, I introduced the very first Marijuana Justice Act. And when I first introduced it, <laughs> everyone <laughs> it was like, why are you doing this? It's politically uh, not cool. I said, what are you talking about? This is a criminal justice issue. It's a racial justice issue. It's an issue of equity. It's a medical issue. It's a veterans issue. It's an issue of, of economic security. Uh, it, it has many, many layers. And finally, we convinced members of Congress that yes, this was what we needed to do. And so now we have a long way to go, but because of you, we've come so far. I mean, safe banking, we have to make sure that uh, the cannabis industry is, is viewed by everyone, especially our federal government, as a legitimate business. <laughs> legitimate, which deserves every single aspect of financial services that any legitimate business uh, deserves and, and has access to, that uh, the equity issues, those have been most impacted by this horrible war on drugs, become first in line for the businesses and for the jobs and for the economic opportunities that the cannabis industry provides. So we have a long way to go, but because of you, we've come a long way. So thank you all again so much for this. I am so proud of it. And you know, my mother, I always have to tell this story about my mother, but my mother uh, had a knee replacement at age 86. She needed another one and she was about 89 years old. The doctor, her knee was bothering her, her, her left knee. And her doctor said, oh, I'm not sure, so sure because you have uh, COPD and it might be a little uh, difficult for you now. But she had a lot of pain in her knee and she was out in Eastmont Mall. She had a little walker getting her walker repaired. And she was complaining about her knee. And so this um, older woman said, here, honey, try some of this. Okay, my mother tried some of that. It was uh, cannabis lotion. Yeah. 
and my mother called me up and she said don't she said you better do everything you can do to make sure that you tell your colleagues that they better fight for legalization of cannabis she said not just you you better tell everybody to and then when I call her and ask her uh, from Washington about how she was feeling how her knee was she would always say to me my knee is drunk it feels <laughs> fine so I do this and accept this in her memory and in her honor and I want to thank you so much Mil Mildred Parish Massey. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Really appreciate it. just going to wrap this panel up. I want to um, allow Dashida and Anthony both to give any, you know, closing remarks. We've talked about kind of the intent. We've talked about the rhetoric. We've talked about what this is actually going to do, what we don't think it's going to do. Um, even CEOs of the largest banks in the United States um, did not raise their hand when Senator Warnock asked them if they supported SAFER. Only the CEO of Bank of America raised his hand to say that he supported it, while the other CEOs kind of looked around to see well, who's going to raise their hand. So there's a lot of talk about this. The um, audience that it's meant to um, impact the most, banks, aren't necessarily uh, supporting this, um, yet we are sucking all of the wind out of rooms, having conversations uh, to protect people who apparently don't necessarily know that they want to be protected by this particular mm -hmm. bill. So any closing remarks from the, from the both of you, please? Um, I think we have to remain steadfast. If anything, we're, you know, as we uh, just heard from Representative Barbara Lee um, and uh, soon Representative Blumenauer, this is a long game, but we can make up some considerable yardage if we continue to lean in um, at the right time and use our resources to do so. Uh, so again, we are dying on the hill of incrementalism. Believe in the fact that we need to make those strides, but um, we don't want to lose momentum altogether. And so I would say keep leaning in. Yeah, you know, I would say at the end of the day, this is a good bill. You know, we can't always let the perfect get in the way of the good. Um, you know, I think this will, as you know, we all said, is an incremental step towards what we are, what our eventual goal is. Um, and you know, I think it, it helps people. I think it brings together the strange bedfellows I mentioned with law enforcement. We also work with credit unions, and they help many under you know not financially literate people all across this country become financially literate, open up a, a, you know accounts that they're able to then get a mortgage, a car loan, and a business loan from. And they're strong supporters of this bill, even though the banks may not be strong supporters with it. Our community lenders that are actually helping small people and small businesses are strong supporters of this bill. And so, you know, this is our chance for, you know, this incremental step. You know, as you said, it was five or 10 years in the making, but, you know, we'll take it when we can. And then, you know, once we get this done, we're, we'll, we'll all come back together and we'll, we'll, we're on to the next step. Um, and so I say, keep going and let's stay steadfast and let's keep doing this. Thank you all.
senior since her and her boy. She's doing a great job. I don't know if they're supposed to use this uh, podium. I'm going to use the podium. Yeah. Someone introducing Keith, or does he just wing it? Are we ready? <laughs> He's going to introduce you and uh, the award at the end of the keynote, and then. Uh, okay. Okay. We're ready to go. Testing. One, two, three, four. Folks, it's a uh, a true honor and a privilege for me to present a special award to Earl Blumenauer. Uh, Earl and I first met way back in 1973 in Oregon, and Earl was a young state legislator in his first term. I think he served three terms altogether at that point. Um, and he was a co-sponsor of the first bill in the country to decriminalize small amounts of marijuana. You, you may recall the Schaefer Commission or the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse. They had recommended that we decriminalize marijuana and a whole lot of states started introducing bills, but of course there was a lot of reticence, there was a lot of fear, there was a sense that, my goodness, if you eliminate criminal penalties, the sky will fall, all the kids are gonna be stoned all day long, some of the same arguments we hear today. Earl and his colleagues in the Oregon legislature had the courage to move forward with that, and it was an incredibly important first phase. Now, he says that he learned then that it wasn't just decriminalization we needed, but it was full legalization. And although he ended up spending, I think, eight years on the Multnomah County Commissioner, and then he served a 10 years on the Portland City Council, in 1996, he was first elected to Congress, and since that time, he has literally been our most important and most influential advocate. He's played an enormously powerful role. Um, for example, he along with uh, Jared Polis and a couple of other people first started, I think they call it the Marijuana Working Group at first, but then in uh, 97, or, or ni um, I'm sorry, 2017, uh, it became the Cannabis Caucus, something which you would have never been allowed to even say out loud a few years earlier. I, th I think that must have taken great courage to do, and I think it was a terribly important step politically. So in recognizing the enormous contribution that Earl Blumenauer has made over five decades, Normal established a new award called the 2024 inaugural Earl Blumen, Blumenauer Trailblazer Award presented for the first time to its name, Earl Blumenauer. <laughs> in, in recognition of pioneering lawmakers who make a path toward cannabis legalization for other legislators to follow. Mr. Blumenauer. Welcome to the celebration of 420. Yeah. Although it's 417. We talked about that this morning when we gathered on the Capitol grounds for this recognition. And I made the point that it is 417 when we're celebrating 420, but I think our challenge 
this year is to celebrate 420 every day. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all next week, all next month. <laughs> Keith kind of outed me. I, I've been doing this longer than most of you have been alive. And it's been one of the most rewarding aspects of the things I've been able to do in public service. I mean, transportation, bicycles, food. I mean, there are a whole host of these things that matter to me where the public is starting to catch up with us. But nothing, nothing compares to the revolution that is taking place with cannabis. 97% of the American public have access to some form of legalized cannabis. Dozens of states have legalized m medical marijuana. There are little tailored, you know, Charlotte's Law. I mean, this has this been ubiquitous. There's almost a half million people who work in state legal cannabis businesses. Think about it. It's an Im important part of our economy. And think of how much more a part of our economy will be when it is fully legal. Yeah. I'm tired of the profits going to cheaters, people cutting corners or cartels or whatever the hell. That's not right. Not right. I'm the first to admit I don't want kids using cannabis. You all know that that can be devastating on young, developing minds. But how are we going to stop it? There isn't any corner drug dealer on a school ground that checks ID. They don't have a license to lose. They're competing against the people who are playing by the rules, many of whom have been empowered by legislation to promote racial equity, and economic justice. And we're cutting the ground out from underneath them, allowing a black market to flourish. That's one of the most important reasons that we need to fully legalize cannabis. It's, it's to stop the cheaters, the people who are threatening our children, who are polluting, who are colluding with cartels, and the federal government is AWOL. After spending hundreds of billions of dollars on a failed war on drugs, they're not here now when they could do a service. But this is the year that we're going to change that. I'm wearing my gold goat bow tie. We're going for the gold. I'm only going to be in Congress seven and a half more months. I want us to cross this finish line. Right. We have legislation in Congress that can pass. We've got powerful allies in the Senate. The Senate used to be the place where good House legislation went to die in Mitch McConnell's cannabis hospice. Not anymore. We've got Chuck Schumer. Oregon's Ron Wyden, Cory Booker. These guys are leading the charge in the Congress so that the Senate is a full partner with us. And you know, it's somewhat ironic that we're having to uh, challenge this, but we have the pieces in place to move forward. The Safe Banking Act. And I know there's some people that, you know, they have different priorities. For me, safe banking is the ultimate whip count. Because we'll find out where people really stand. And I think when we vote on it, and I hope that's soon in the Senate, it's going to show that there's 60, 65, 70 senators that'll come out of the closet and make a stand on this critical item. It gives us a whip list to work with. But you know, 
as encouraged as I am about the prospect of getting it passed in the Senate, you know how it's really going to get across the finish line, I think, is when the federal government finally flexes its muscle in favor of descheduling and legalization. I take every chance I get to nudge my friends in the Biden administration. Joe Biden has come a long way on this. At one point, he was kind of an apologist for the failed war on drugs. And he's reluctantly, haltingly, made some adjustments. He has pardoned thousands of people. He an called for an initiation of rescheduling. This is great, but it's not enough. If I'm advising Joe Biden, and I have tried to do that, by the way, with anybody who's involved with the political organization there, I make the point, the quickest way to engage young people, minority voters, to break the mold is to come out four square for legalization, for compassion for people who have been caught up in the legal morass of the failed war on drugs, and make a cream blake of it. This can be done. You know, I think one of the reasons, I, I have no doubt about the sincerity of Leader Schumer, Senator Wyden, Senator Booker, but you know, they wouldn't be Chairman Wyden, Chairman Booker, Leader Schumer, if it weren't for cannabis. I've worked with John Fetterman for years. He came out early for full legalization. And if he hadn't done that, he wouldn't have won that close race in Pennsylvania for the U.S. Senate. They'd still be in the minority. But he took a firm stand. And that was part of what was the momentum that got us the majority. It's part of the momentum that made Joe Biden win in Arizona. You know that we wouldn't have won Arizona for Joe Biden if it weren't for legal cannabis on the ballot that passed 60-40 and pulled young voters to the polls and being sympathetic to this. This is political reality. I have been working on this for over 50 years. I think I've been involved with every state legal initiative. I've traveled, I've lobbied. There is nobody, I will declare unequivocally, there's nobody in America who was punished for being supportive of legalized cannabis. Nobody. In fact, the contrary. It is something that has helped Democrats across the country. It's something that has helped people of color, young candidates. And it's time to unlock the full power of legalization being straight with the American public and making sure that we m mobilize the pro-cannabis electorate, because we need it. You know, democracy is on the line this election. We have an opportunity to take over the House of Representatives, taking it away from, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of a polite way to describe the chaos that is the House Republican leadership, and crazy members. There's no other way about it. These people are unhinged, and they are dangerous. And we can throw them out of office. At least they won't be in the majority. And so, you know, I, th I thank you for the award. I thank you for the partnership. Some of you, like Keith, I've been working with for over 50 years. We're watching this come to fruition. I have done this all my adult life and before. I could not be more excited about where we are now. The coalition is growing. We are being able to engage every part of this vast coalition, young people people of color, people who have been victimized by this failed war on drugs. It's also a key to the economy. 
I mean, already we have uh, almost a half million people who work in the legal cannabis business. And once we legalize and pull in people on the periphery, it'll be a million folks. It'll go from, pick a number, uh, 40 billion to 200 billion. And it's not just the economy. It speaks to the power of cannabis for healthcare, for research, for individual liberties. It's time for us to realize the promise of 420 and get this job done. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Testing. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We're supposed to be doing what they were calling a fireside chat. I'm never quite sure what that means, but I think it means that we're supposed to relax and have a conversation. So uh, let me start off with the first question, Earl. You and I were both there when Oregon became the first state to decriminalize small amounts of marijuana in 1973. You as a member of the state legislature and a sponsor of the bill, me as a normal lobbyist. Were you aware at the time of the significance of what was happening? Let me get flip it on. Um, yes and no. I mean, I had a sense that it was important. I had a sense that we were making history. I didn't realize the full impact and I didn't realize that it would sort of take over my life. <laughs> but I have no complaints. It's the right thing to do. We have seen amazing progress. I didn't think it would take so long to get to this point. But I'm excited that 70% of the American people now fully support legalization. A majority of Republicans support full legalization. And I think those dominoes are going to fall pretty quickly. I think of what happened with marriage equality. Not too long ago, people couldn't envision marriage equality. And then the first start moved it down. In fact, uh, Joe Biden did part of that by speaking out of turn, maybe embarrassed uh, uh, President Obama for a moment. And then in, overnight, people can't imagine a different world. I think the same is going to, I think the same is happening with cannabis. By the way, Earl mentioned the 70% support now. Back in 73, when Oregon first passed that bill, I think only 12% of the country favored legalizing marijuana. 88% were opposed to what we were trying to do. We've, yes. We've come a long way. Yes, but that 80% comprised about 70% who didn't know the facts. And when we started making clear what the stakes were, what the facts were, that helped shift. It took a while. Uh, but that latent support was there, and it is still there. All right, um, second question here, said second discussion point. Decades after the first victory in Oregon, more than half of Americans live in states where cannabis is legal and public support for legalization is at record levels. But Congress has been slow to act. There have been a lot of legislative progress, thanks largely to your efforts, 
Can you tell us about how you went about directing and gathering support for cannabis policy reform bills, particularly the Moore Act, the first and only descheduling legislation to ever be approved by either Chamber of Congress? Twice. <laughs> You know, there's no substitute for being able to just deal with people and the facts. The more that we were able to work with folks, the more, frankly, that advocates, people in the industry, people who are fighting for justice reform, what we saw with people of color, speaking out, being involved, law enforcement, the, the coalition is very impressive. And that coalition made my job a lot easier, and it will make your job even easier in terms of accelerating this progress. No magic solution. Deal with the facts and be relentless. President Biden is the first sitting president to publicly state that cannabis does not belong in Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act and to call for a schedule review. What is the significance of this action and how has it affected your efforts on the legislative side? Well, that helped energize things. As I mentioned, uh, President Biden has been slow to embrace, but he's making up for lost time. And the rescheduling that he called for is extraordinarily significant. Now, I don't want to reschedule, I want to deschedule. And ultimately, we're going to be there. But as an interim state, going from Schedule 1, which is outrageous, I mean, tobacco should be Schedule 1, <laughs> um, to Schedule 3 is an important signal. It helps us with cannabis research. And more important, it takes care of the 280E problem. As you know, state legal cannabis companies pay three times the tax that a normal company would pay. And that leads to tax evasion, to cheating, to selective enforcement. It stifles their efforts to grow. We go to Schedule 3, 280 goes away. They can fully deduct their business expenses, which will be a huge shot in the arm for state legal cannabis business. I think it's going to start um, um, the momentum for further progress. My research bills, the, the first standalone piece of legislation dealing with uh, uh, Schedule 1, opening up the research is going to be critical. You know, we have a problem in this country. We have high school graduates who cannot qualify for six-figure jobs because they fail drug tests or they're afraid of it. So the railroads, the trucking industry, they're all in favor of working to have a reasonable test for impairment. We don't want anybody impaired operating heavy equipment, but if the test that we had was uh, the, the analogous to what we do for cannabis was alcohol, <laughs> there wouldn't be any truck drivers in America if they had a beer in the last month. That's insane. So I think we're starting to see these pieces that are going to break and move forward, and the progress is going to be compounded. Despite public support for legalization being at an all-time high, and again, that's about 57%, and when you get into medical use, it's about 89%. Um, and voters turning out in droves to support state-level ballot initiatives for medical and adult use, cannabis policy reform has, to, has historically been seen as a relatively low-priority issue for voters and lawmakers alike. Yet, that is starting to change. How do you see cannabis impacting the 2024 elections? And conversely, how could the elections impact reform efforts at the federal level? Well, I think the facts are that it's not a low priority for voters. We've seen voters step up, 
make the decision to legalize. And they've seen the benefits of that. I think you're going to see cannabis voters make the difference. I already mentioned two examples in terms of the control of the United States Senate and Arizona's presidential. I think they could be determinative in the U.S. Senate, in the House of Representatives, and in elections up and down the political process. I think it will be transformative. It's going to make a difference in this election, which is going to be very, very close. And as we know, democracy is on the line. Cannabis voters may well be the difference between uh, chaos and preserving our democracy. But I think over the next four years, it's going to compound. And this is going to be our salvation. People are going to vote on it. And the more we can teach elected officials how to talk about it, how to embrace it. And the more we mobilize cannabis voters, the more successful we will be, and the accelerated progress is going to be welcome. One of the most significant developments on the federal level was in 2017 when you announced the establishment of the Congressional Cannabis Caucus, a move that would have been considered far too radical only a few years earlier. What caused you to take this step when you did, and what are your thoughts on how it has developed in the years since? Well, you referenced the fact that we took a cannabis working group where my office organized people who worked on Capitol Hill in this space and had a working group, and it was bipartisan. There were Republican members. The certified smart young people who really run Capitol Hill would meet informally. Well, those of you who follow the congressional process understand that there is a caucus for everything. There's a steel caucus. There's a pollinator caucus. Well, the reason we have these caucuses is because Congress increasingly is non-functional. The committees are very hard to organize and move forward. It's controlled by top leadership in both parties. It's a little too timid, although Nancy Pelosi showed how it, it could really hop. <laughs> Organizing into a caucus gave these people an operation to come to opportunity to come together, stand out, and organize. And frankly, everybody could be a chairman. We have four co-chairs uh, to sort of demonstrate this and give them a role. It's going to be, I think, very significant in the next election. I'm hard at work uh, replacing Barbara Lee and me to make sure that it's seamless and moves forward. But you know something? There are people who are really interested in this leadership position. So we're going to have fun with the caucus. We may have to create a couple extra chairmanships. I think that's great. Have them stand in line, um, because we need that organizational oomph. And we're going to get it. Finally, what advice do you have for lawmakers who are supportive of cannabis policy reform but may be nervous about becoming champions of the issue, or to those who are already committed to following in your footsteps? Well, my point simply is there's no place to hide. The public is largely making up its mind. And they've made up their mind, I think, properly in terms of supporting full legalization. They're supporting the economic impacts. They're supporting cracking down on the cartels who are cheating and polluting. And the key is to make sure that people understand that power. I said earlier, nobody has been punished for supporting legalization. And what we need to do is drive that point home, which we will, and look forward to getting across the finish line uh, this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. We've never had a better friend in elected office than Earl Blumenauer. Thank you.
<laughs> Say go vote, Earl. <laughs> Thanks so much. You bet. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, National Cannabis Policy Summit. It is good to be here with all of you today. I'm just gonna cut to the chase, newsflash. It is not 1954, it is 2024. It is time to legalize marijuana. Right now, cannabis is classified as a Schedule I drug by the federal government alongside drugs like heroin. It makes no sense at all. Scheduling a drug as Schedule One means harsher criminalization, which we've seen happen with cannabis, and along with the failed war on drugs, this criminalization disproportionately targets black and brown communities, and it puts tens of thousands of people in prison for cannabis-related crimes. So, descheduling and legalizing cannabis is an issue of justice. But in order to fight the criminalization of marijuana, we need to deschedule it altogether. Communities, activists, people like you have been fighting to deschedule cannabis for decades. But here's the thing Republicans in Congress are blocking legislation to legalize marijuana. And that is why descheduling is so important. It, think of it this way descheduling is a tool that we can use to get this done without Republican obstruction. Meaning, now we have a real opportunity for progress within the Biden administration. So that's the reason that I sent a letter to the DEA and the Attorney General urging them to deschedule cannabis, to reduce criminal restrictions, and to regulate marijuana with public health, not criminalization in mind. We need to keep up our fight to deschedule and legalize cannabis nationwide. And I'm really glad to have all of you as partners in this fight. Let's get it done. Hello, National Cannabis Policy. This is working now. All right. Last panel of the day. Always tough, but um, I promise it'll be worth it. I'm really excited about this conversation because my goal is to demystify Congress and how Congress works a little bit. And I'm very happy today to be joined by folks that I'm very familiar with um, working in the space. And by way of introduction, my name is Maritza Perez Medina. I'm the Director of Federal Affairs for the Drug Policy Alliance. We're the leading nonprofit in the US working to end the war on drugs and the harms of the war on drugs. And of course, we've been working on marijuana both at the state and federal level. And I've had the pleasure of 
working with various folks on the Hill. And as um, Representative Blumenauer said, you'd be surprised at you know, who is writing these policies, doing the work. It's a lot of young people. As much as people like to, you know, throw millennials under the bus, we're doing some really good work on the Hill. Um, so with that, let's meet some of my colleagues on the Hill. If you all want to introduce yourselves, then we can jump right in. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Sonia Norton. I'm Senior Legislative Assistant for Congressman Blumenauer, handling the Cannabis Caucus and judiciary issues more broadly, um, help facilitate a lot of the Cannabis Caucus events together with Ashley and our um, other co-chairs, but very excited to talk with you all today. Hi, everyone. This is working. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Roberts. I work for Congressman Dave Joyce. Um, I work along Sonia with the Congressional Cannabis Caucus. I handle cannabis issues for my boss as well as health care. Great. So I think um, I'll kick this over to Sonia just to start us off. Can you just share with people what the Cannabis Caucus is? I know your boss explained a little bit of why the caucus was put together, but what do you all do? That's a great question. So the Cannabis Caucus is a group of about 40 members, um, but led by four co-chairs, two Democrats, two Republicans. So my boss, Ashley's boss, Congressman Mast, and Congresswoman Lee. Um, and we host monthly events with the goal of kind of bringing people together for education, um, brainstorming coordination to really have a nonpartisan or at least a bipartisan space for people to ask questions and to think on how we can do better in Congress. The caucus doesn't endorse specific policies, but it's a space to really like do the thinking and bring in groups like so many of you here um, to speak and really think together on next steps from everything from like for my boss bringing together the MORE Act to the incremental steps we've seen, um, like some of the appropriations bills that are uh, efforts that we have, but basically we'll have usually two uh, staff-only briefings off the record from pe with people from across the political spectrum, progressives all the way through Republican members who are a little less comfort uh, comfortable being public about being interested or curious about the issue area and how we can do better. And then once a quarter, we'll bring together staffers and stakeholders for the newest iteration of uh, what the congressman was talking about, the Cannabis Working Group, to really like have a platform for people to talk about the efforts that you want to see more in Congress, that people are leading on the outside, and also for offices throughout Congress, whether they're in the caucus officially or not, um, related to the issue of cannabis, to really, again, give people a platform to raise questions or initiatives and really build that coalition, that support that's so critical um, to the effort. And it's kind of always evolving. We're really excited to see where it heads with two new co-chairs um, next Congress, but very excited that Congressman Joyce and Congressman Mast will um, carry that forward on the Republican side. All right. Thank you. And this is for either of you, but let's say that you're a stakeholder, but you're not involved with an organization or you're not with a Hill office. How can a person be engaged with a cannabis caucus? I think the Cannabis Working Group quarterly meetings that we hold are a great way um, to get involved. It's open to, it's not open to the press, but it's open to everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely reach out to one of us. Um, and there's like a circulation, we send out the invitation. I'm realizing in real time, I owe folks the invitation to the next one. Um, but definitely get in touch with one of the co-chair offices and we can add folks to the distribution list. We want that to be open to anyone who's really interested in engaging meaningfully in the space. Great. And I'd love to hear what kind of bills the caucus works on, and then personally from each of you, what bills are you working on now that you're really excited about that you want to tell the audience about? Um, so a big thing for us in this space is my boss really works on bills that can bring people to the table to have more conversations about this, especially as more Republicans are getting more comfortable and involved in the space. Uh, so we prioritize doing bills where everyone can come, have a seat at the table, work this out. We want, you know, that's the whole point of our caucus. So everyone can put in their opinion and we find bipartisan solutions to move forward. Um, in addition to that, we always focus on legislation that's going to move somewhere. Obviously, that's been a struggle this Congress. So we like to be realistic and do what we can to work together and get things done. 
awesome. And then uh, my boss has a similar approach, but lots of specific bills <laughs> to cite. Of course, for comprehensive reform, we really, like for Congressman Blumenauer, um, the MORE Act is the gold standard. It's something that we want to continue that path to the floor and that momentum for um, when we have a more cannabis-friendly majority in Congress um, to really get that across the finish line. But in the meantime, the Safe Banking Act that our bosses lead together in the House um, is a top priority that's still something we want to see this Congress. The Veterans Equal Access Act, also known as Safe Harbor Equal Access Appropriations Language, to let VA providers give honest recommendations and referrals to their to veterans, um, their patients, is something that we got, again, our bosses working together with the other co-chairs. Um, we got voice voted last year, and we want to get it across the finish line this year. And um, holding the administration accountable, uh, reminding them the merits of descheduling, that that's the appropriate path forward, and in the meantime, rescheduling at the very least to Schedule 3. Yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned the MORAC. We heard a little bit today about the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. I think my mic isn't working anymore, but hopefully people can still hear me. Thank you. Um, I was just sharing that I'm glad that uh, Sonia brought up the MORE Act because we've heard a lot about the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act today, the CAOA. So the MORE Act and the CAOA are very similar bills. Um, they're the leading descheduling bills in Congress that would deschedule marijuana, remove it from the Controlled Substance Act, since Controlled Substances Act, reinvest in communities that have been most damaged by the war on drugs, but also resentence and expunge marijuana convictions, which we know is so important. In addition to um, a lot of other things, but we were really excited about getting that bill, at least through the House, twice. And I, I share your optimism. Hopefully in the next Congress, we're able to get it across the finish line again. Um, I did want to talk about appropriations because anybody who's even half paying attention to what's happening in the news knows that it is incredibly tough to get things through Congress these days. Unfortunately, there is a lot of partisanship. There is growing division, and I've seen that just in my own time on the Hill. It, it seems to get worse with each, with each election. Um, because of that, People sometimes look to appropriations to get things done. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is, but usually these are must-pass bills that have to go through Congress, um, so there has to be bipartisan support for these bills. And sometimes people use that as a vehicle to get other policy through that's related to the bigger budget. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about appropriations because it is relevant to marijuana reform. It's how we've seen a lot of good marijuana reform happen in Congress. Um, so this is for either of you. Can you explain what do I, like, what, what does it mean when one is talking about appropriations? Like, what is that? And specifically when it comes to marijuana, what, what type of work or bills have we been able to pass through the appropriations process? Resident appropriator over here. Yeah, I would love to take this question. Um, my boss is a member of the Appropriations Committee, so uh, Congress has the power of the purse, so every year um, Congress is charged with setting the budget. A lot of what we do, my boss has done lots of things for um, cannabis uh, through appropriations, um, some things he's done. We've done medical marijuana things. That was something our boss has championed together along with our other Cannabis Caucus co-chairs. We. Um, my boss has secured language for um, the JAG grant programs for people to apply, apply at state and local levels for expungements. Um, we've also done state and regulatory state regulatory work, um, so the state and federal level can communicate with each other on just working out regulatory frameworks. Um, gosh, what else have we done? We've done so much. Uh, I think that's all that's coming to mind right now. I mean, what, what else? Yeah, and I think you, yeah. yeah, and you hit on some key points that there's a couple different avenues for getting things accom yeah. Yeah, yeah, accomplished. Medical. Yeah, so the medical, yeah, huge one. <laughs> yeah, so appropriations yeah. is why we have the protection that D the U.S. DOJ can't prosecute people who are in compliance with state Correct. legal medical marijuana, um, like laws and regulations, yeah, and we're working really hard to get that um, expanded to adult use, but definitely an uphill battle, but something that, again, if there's a shameless plug, folks who want to get involved definitely talk to us afterwards. Um, we need all the help we can get, but it's a good coalition. We want to expand it. Um, and it's something that we're circulating right now. So building support with non-appropriators to put pressure on our dear friends in appropriations um, who maybe are not as friendly as Ms. Lee and uh, Mr. Joyce, who are both on committee. But there are, I think, in appropriations, something that was confusing to me when I first came to the Hill. You can have specific funding. So there's the funding levels that comes through appropriations. And then there's also the language or the restrictions on that funding, um, kind of guidance from Congress on how it's intended to be used, and that's something like Maritza was 
talking about as well, where cannabis has had huge victories because of the leadership of Congressman Joyce, because of the leadership of so many um, members, um, and something that my boss really wants to continue to use. We've got 35, 36 weeks left in Congress, so we want to make the most of this appropriation cycle and really get some more of that language in there and keep it across the finish line this year. That's really helpful. And we did talk about some advantages of working through the appropriations process, but are, they, are there any limitations that perhaps makes it more reasonable to fight for a standalone measure versus, you know? Yeah, yeah so I and my boss tend to take very, um, like, everything and. Like, if there's an opportunity, we want to get it across the finish line. Um, one thing that we ran into with the veterans language or the vets cannabis language last year is when you come to the floor, amendments can't be authorizing language. So basically it can't be anything that an agency would have to interpret. It has to be like very specifically like framed and limited so that it's supposed to be kind of in line with what appropriations is intended to do. Um, and that's why if you look at the amendment language we got in by voice vote last Congress, it's all over the place. It's prohibiting funds for a spe specific policy prohibiting certain actions by VA providers versus a standalone, you can do authorizing language so you, it can be much more direct. VA cannot prohibit its um, provider. Like, it doesn't, it's, there's more flexibility, there's more um, just generally like access to kind of do whatever Congress wants outside of appropriations versus kind of this, the guidance um, to keep appropriations to like funding and actually appropriating for existing programs and things like that. Yeah. Uh. Appropriations open doors to everything. Most things that we do through appropriations do have standalone bills behind them. Mm -hmm. So that's just extra support. Normally, mm -hmm. like we like to do both, but that goes with any authorizing bill or anything like that. That's normally, I would say, the strategy for most offices. Actually, that's really helpful, and you're already giving me ideas. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, for, for real. Um, so this room is filled with advocates and obviously people who really care about cannabis policy. As Hill staff, what is most effective and most helpful to you? Like, if there's an issue that somebody deeply cares about, what's the most effective way that they can bring it to you, whether it be an advocacy organization or a member of the public? And that could be completely different responses. I don't know, but why don't you let us know? Yeah. I mean, to preface, we can't like tell people how to lobby, but I think what's most helpful to me is just like when people recognize that we are spread extremely thin. Like there's far fewer staff than most people I think expect in a congressional office, especially and then you break it down into there's people in district, there's people in ledge, there's people in comms. So there's just a few of us who are handling everything that comes in front of Congress. So coming prepared, knowing um, like really having your stats or knowing how to get the information that we ask for because we aren't realistically going to have the time to dig to like dig and find it ourselves if the groups aren't coming to us with it kind of sort of in mind at least mm -hmm. and having specific asks um, especially like I am one million years old and was on the hill before the pandemic and meetings used to be 15 mi minutes you had 15 minutes to say here's kind of what I'm talking about what my group does or what my or like <laughs> issue is and here's my ask and then there's follow-up there's room for emails and things like that but like being very prepared to say like this is what you need to know this is what I want you to come to me on and then also so being willing to, um, I think, hear where someone you don't expect agrees with you, that's something that I've definitely learned through doing the cannabis space and working so closely with the Joyces and Republicans who are open to the space. And I still will get questions from Republican staffers of like, why is this group yelling at me? I'm trying to tell them I agree with them. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> just like being open to hearing when people agree with you, even if it's someone you never thought it would have been worthwhile to have a meeting with. Agreed. I think the conversation's changing around cannabis, and you would be surprised with the people who do agree with you. Um, I'm probably part of the problem with the long <laughs> meetings. I'm a bit of a chatter, so I love a 30-minute meeting. <laughs> um, so you're welcome to come in and tell me that. But I think something that's super helpful, at least on my end, especially with um, being a Republican on the um, caucus, is here, if y'all have meetings and hearing if you get good feedback from somebody or you hear of somebody who's interested, I love a follow-up email. I will follow up with them. You know, it's a little harder sometimes That's on our end. Point. Yeah. We love that. I want to hear your feedback. I keep a spreadsheet just for myself to know, like, who's interested or, like, what's going on. If that staff level, member level, all, all are welcome. 
I love that there was applause for a follow-up email. <laughs> That's awesome. Hello, um, fellow yeah. nerds. <laughs> yeah. All right, so on the flip side of that then, what is not so helpful? Hmm. I think I've definitely gotten the things of like, we don't like this bill that you're doing or this like piece of a bit, like specific language or things like that and not having something like a suggestion to replace it. Yeah. Um, I think the more that people can come to me with like just the whole yeah, reason. Yeah, a fleshed out idea. Yeah, a fleshed yeah, out idea yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, you, it, again, we're spread so thin that it's yeah. hard if you're coming like, I have this great idea I'm so passionate about. It. It's like, okay, but what's the solution to get this done? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that can be difficult. <laughs> like we need to work together to find avenues. Yeah, Is that, yeah. definitely. Yeah, Thank I you. Agree. Yeah, no, I agree. That's a great point, yeah. yeah. So I want to pivot to talking more about bipartisanship. This is one of a few examples that I see in my work, and I'm appreciative of that because it's rarer and rarer these days. I want to hear more about that. Um, it's becoming rarer, as I said, but uh, in a lot of ways, marijuana seems to be the exception to the rule to some extent. Um, for example, with this caucus, why is it important that we work across the aisle? Like, why does that matter when we're talking about passing bills? Um, <laughs> I love that we're bipartisan. I think the more people at the table to have a larger conversation, the better. That's how we find actual solutions to this. And everybody, you know, gets experience from a different side and hears from different groups. Sonia hears from completely different groups sometimes than who I hear from. Mm -hmm. You take a whole different perspective and we, we talk it out and we normally will find solutions to that problem. I mean, I, th I think it's great. Everybody, even our other co-chairs, have different views sometimes mm -hmm. even than, than us on Definitely. the same party, you know? And we all come together and make sure when we work on things that we send together as a caucus, like that everybody's comfortable. And I think we always end up with a great product, so. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say we call it bike partisanship, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, well said. <laughs> That's cute. I love that. Um, so we've all been obviously watching the Biden administration's schedule review order very closely and watching all the activity around that. Um, I want to hear from you all. When that announcement came out, like what was the reaction from your office? And um, I know that you all are close. I, I know what Blumenauer has been doing on it lately. would love to hear more about what Joyce is looking for. But can you tell us a little bit about that and um, whether you all were excited about generally the schedule review order? Yeah, it was huge. It was a definitely just like a very exciting day, the sort of thing that you like prepare for, that it's helpful to spend so much time with and just like be so deep in the issue area. Um, but I mean, it's historic. It was very exciting and just making sure you figure out like what do you, like what is the message? Okay, great, like how do we help this go as well as possible? Obviously like us pushing for descheduling, at least rescheduling to schedule three, but like descheduling is the appropriate path. So like celebrating the win, that this is a huge step forward, that it's necessary, and helping the, our friendly administration get to where we want them to be and where mm -hmm. um, you've heard from my boss we should be. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, it's one of the things where the four co-chairs don't have identical ideas, but I think are on, at least as far as I've engaged with folks, like we've done letters together around like the merits of descheduling, um, what a good path forward looks like, even if we've or they have slightly different, um, I think, agendas or views on what the ultimate like best product would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a great first step. Mm -hmm. I mean, and obviously we saw results. You know, yeah. we got HHS's recommendation. Oh, our, sorry, oh yes, no, I'm sorry. I think I was not talking into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I said that I think it was a great first step. Um, obviously, we saw results from it. You know, HHS came out with their recommendation and now we're waiting on DEA. As Sonia said, our bosses have sent letters together with our fellow co-chairs, um, you know, to ask for these <laughs> results to come out ultimately. I mean, just, I guess on rescheduling, but yeah, calling for descheduling, everything. Yeah, I mean, it's a great first step. Mm -hmm. Who can argue with that? <laughs> yeah. 
And we appreciate the bipartisan letter that uh, followed up on this, but you know, it's been seven months at this point since the HHS recommendation to move marijuana to Schedule 3 came down, and we still haven't heard anything from the DEA. And I know you all are keeping a very close eye on this, as we are as well. Any updates or anything new that you've heard? I mean, I would just raise for folks, like I think we saw uh, the comments at the White House of just like where like this is going to come from DEA. Like it just, I think there's lots of signals from folks that there is an unprecedented attention on the scheduling review and that puts pressure anytime you have an administration that's facing this much like legal engagement and lawsuits on pretty much everything they do. Like. Um, it slows down the process just to make sure that it's done extremely, extremely well. Um, Congress gave them a real tough task when we did the CSA, um, but I think ultimately, like, even though it takes a little bit longer, and we want <laughs> to be clear, we want to see the results like, now as soon as possible. We think that's appropriate. We think they've had plenty of time, and like, I see where the delay could be coming from and why it's important to do it extremely well and have a very tight product. So this rescheduling, or hopefully descheduling, but likely rescheduling holds mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for reminding of that, reminding us of that, because I think people forget the bigger political context that we're working with. Um, all right, so you know we've established that we may or may not hear from the DEA soon, but despite what the DEA does or doesn't do, there is stuff that the president can do now. There are things that the administration can do now to eliminate some of the harms of marijuana criminalization. What are some of those things? Are there specific things that your offices are pushing on as far as administrative action on marijuana? Yes, but I've been talking a lot. Do you want to start? I'm, yeah, I'm happy to take that <laughs> one. Um, my boss's stance on that, you know, we love where the president's coming from. Um, I think we personally would like to see a lot more action at the state and local level, like an overwhelming amount of the crimes, majority of them are happening at the state and local level, but they don't always have the resources to work on expungements of records. So that's something that he's championed. He did that with the, um, what I mentioned earlier, the JAG grant program through appropriations. He has another bill called the HOPE Act, which also would set up a grant to, for state and local governments to be able to access those funds because a lot of them, you know, again, the administrative burdens, the financial burdens of like going through that is, is hard. So I think that's probably somewhere we would like to see more action, but we do appreciate his work that he's done so far. I will say Congressman Blumenauer and Congresswoman Lee for, I think since 2021, but for years, have been pushing administration to finally reissue the coal and Wilkinson memo protections, um, to have that guidance that DOJ shouldn't be prosecuting people who are complying with state laws, whether it's medical marijuana or adult use marijuana. That's a conversation that we've continued with another letter recently, just really keeping that pressure on. That's something that's appropriate, especially as we see confusion about what Schedule 3 would mean in practice. Like that guy is more important than ever. Um, our bosses, together with Congresswoman Lee and, all, and Congressman Blumenauer, has done letters with a, a whole little collection of folks around, again, fixing VA policies, making sure that vets have equal access to folks outside of the VA system for medical marijuana. Um, and, oh, there was a third one, and it's disappeared. Yes, aha, mm -hmm. finally getting us the HHS report from mm -hmm. the Medical Marijuana mm -hmm. and Cannabis Oil Research Expansion Act. Mm -hmm. Like the Congressman said, the first federal standalone cannabis reform to be enacted um, since the CSA was adopted. Part of that was reporting, uh, requiring reporting from HHS in conjunction with a couple other agencies on kind of what are the barriers to research, what can we be doing to alleviate those barriers to research. Uh, it's overdue, we've reminded them it's overdue quite a few times, um, and that's something that would be, uh, you know, a step towards something bigger, but very hopeful that the administration can hopefully get back to the congressman soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we are going to actually wrap it up. Um, unfortunately, we were supposed to be joined by a third panelist who is watching the floor for votes, so um, actually doing his job, so we'll forgive him. <laughs> um, but before we close this up, I really wanted to ask you all to just share some last words with the audience. How can they follow the work that your bosses do, and how can they get involved? We have a lot of people here who are very interested in policy or are advocates themselves. What can they do to engage in this work? 
Yeah, I think for engaging the work, like you're doing the right things. Being here, showing up with these organizations is such a helpful and I think structured way to get involved. Um, also, I always encourage folks to get involved in there's internships and applying to come work with us on the Hill. We need good people um, doing this work and working with members, providing the information, kind of having folks who are open to new ideas is very important. And there's lots of like the lobbying work, the public engagement that brings people to this is something that I think is shared with a lot of uh, staffers, that civic interest in wanting to help the government do better. Um, in terms of following the work that my boss does, I would definitely recommend folks go to bloomenauer.house.gov, sign up for our e-news, the newsletter, on kind of highlights of things he's doing. Um, we're a little less engaged on social media, but definitely follow his, it's uh, Rep Earl Blumenauer. Um, you'll see headshot, bike pin, <laughs> um, and we'll make sure to get thoughts and kind of key updates out there. Yeah, same. You can um, refer to my boss's website to see any updates there on what he's done policy-wise. Um, two, I mean, please reach out to us. We're resources. Again, like, uh, my boss, uh, his goal is to have this be a larger conversation. I mean, over half of America now lives somewhere where cannabis is legal. So we are welcome to ideas, which y'all are hearing again. If you, your representative has thoughts, anything. All thoughts are welcome. Again, we're resources. And you can refer to both of our bosses' websites for updates there. Ashley? Yes. Can you give us just 30 seconds about your upcoming start in Ohio this summer for legal adult use and how that's going to affect the state as well as your district? So I think um, there, honestly, between the House and Senate at the state level in Ohio, there hasn't been much decision made there. Um, obviously, issue two was passed back in November. I think there's been a lot of talk between the House Speaker and the Senate president um, about how they're gonna move forward on that. You know, we've chatted with our governor's office. I think everybody just wants to make sure that we have a strong regulatory framework within the state so it's safely accessed. And this is also a good reminder, my apologies, I was supposed to lead with this, at least for me, I'm here in pr my personal capacity, so can speak to things, but um, com my comments here at least shouldn't be attributed to my boss or the office. All right, well thank you both. Thank you both for the work that you do and thank you to your bosses for the great work that they do on this issue. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to everyone that could join us today for the National Cannabis Policy Summit. Um, if you can stick around at six o'clock, the cannabis regulators, nope. Yes, yes cannabis regulator. I always get the words confused, I'm sorry. Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition is hosting a, there we go, thank you, Luke, um, is hosting a reception um, th that starts at 6, and then at 6.30, we're having a screening of the documentary, Not Your Token. Um, both uh, things are free, open to the public, so you're welcome to stay. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your night.